Kabbalah, Session 1. The word Kabbalah derives from the Egyptian word Kab, meaning body, and the Arabic word Allah, name of God. Thus, combining these terms, Kabbalah means the body of God. The real meaning of this is recommunion of the kingdom and the crown, the bride of God and the Lord God, the body and the mind, etc. Here we see the Kabbalistic Tree of Life diagram as it was modeled by McGregor Mathers and his early 20th century group, the Golden Dawn, who were committed to the study of Kabbalah. We see in their model the modern arrangement of the ten Sephirot spheres and the 22 paths marked as tarot cards. This is the most familiar arrangement known now, but it is only the latest of three versions of this diagram. Prior to the Golden Dawn, the Tree of Life diagram was shaped in this arrangement, designed by Isaac Luria, the blind prophet of the Sephardic era. Some say it was during this era, when the Zohar was first written down, that the Tree of Life model originated. However, before the RE arrangement was ascertained for the diagram from Luria's interpretation of the Zohar, the previous interpretation of the diagram kept related to the oral tradition of the Zohar is this, the Gra arrangement, reportedly designed originally by Rebbe Shimeon Bar Yochai from the same era as the Bahir. As we now see, over time the Sephirot on the middle pillar have slipped further and further down. This process has long been recognized by Kabbalists as the breaking of the vessels, where the term vessels is kelepot, which literally translates as shells. However, the middle way of Kabbalah is the path of recapitulation, and so we wind back the clock to find the original meaning for the slippage of the middle pillar sephirot and the shattering of the shells. The original model of Hakabala was two cubes. One was above, and so the other was below. When viewed at a 45 degree angle from above the joining in the middle of the upper and lower cubes corners, the Tree of Life diagram is seen, with its 10 points as corners and its 22 paths as edges. The descent of the central pillars Sephirot symbolizes the implosion of the twin cubes above and below of HaKabbalah to form a model something like this, a hypercube, or one cube nested inside another. This 2D image depicts a 3D model of a 4D shape. This 4D shape has some special qualities, namely that the inner cube and the outer cube have the same volume as one another. When rotated to a 45 degree angle, the hypercube looks like this, a tesseract, and just as the nested hypercube is a four-space shape, the tesseract, or hypercube at antipode, represents the fourth dimension beyond three-space, the invisible direction of time. Here is where we begin our analysis of how Kabbalah, as it looked prior to the creation by God of this universe. Measured within the impossible octogram in the center of the tesseract, we find this model depicting an overlapping cluster of ten spheres shown in blue, seven in green, and three in red. The ten spheres in blue represent the ten sephirot, originally called ten emanations of nothingness in the Sefer Yetzera. The seven in green represent the seven Olympic dignities, the so-called planetary cameo. The three red spheres represent the upper three worlds of Kabbalah, but more importantly are formed from a twisted orbit seen from the side of the twelve signs of the zodiac. Here we see the ten sephirot in black, the seven planets in green, and the twelve signs in three loops in red. The surrounding squares are derived from the geometry of the interior of the tesseract. 
In this we see only the spheres. Outermost of these are shown in blue, the ten sephirot of nothingness, wherein the Hebrew word for nothingness is ayin. With these ten sephirot are the seven Olympic dignities or planets, shown here in red, and within them are the twelve signs of the zodiac, shown here in black. The seven planets are in the realm of Ein Sof, meaning limitless nothingness, and the twelve signs of the zodiac are in the realm of Ein Sof Or, meaning bright, limitless nothingness. The first of these models we will examine apart from the others will be the ten sephirot of nothingness in the outermost layer called Ayin, or nothingness. Here we see the spheres of the sephirot only, and the paths of the tree of life, the edges of the cube of Kabbalah, are represented here as only dots where these ten spheres intersect. Subtracting Ayin, or nothingness, from the complete model of all the spheres overlapping, we are left with the seven planets, here in red, and the twelve signs of the zodiac, shown here in black and as before, arranged in a circle rather than along a three-looped edge. Because the grouping of traits by these sums is prehistorically ancient, many names for each have been given throughout time. Here we see the labels of these names, color-coded as in the last diagram, arranged by ten aeons of two thousand years each, beginning at the bottom in 18,000 BC and concluding at the top in 4000 AD. Knowing these labels will enable you to understand the meanings of the corresponding names over time. The next layer beyond the Kabbalistic Four Worlds model, which we will discuss in the next session, includes the seven planets of Ein Sof, Limitless Nothingness. To comprehend limitless nothingness, we would need a measuring device that would needfully fall far short of estimating the true depth. To this end, we find the ancients applied the seven classically known planets of antiquity. Subtracting that layer from our model, all we are left with are the twelve signs of the zodiac, occupying the layer of ion soft ore, or bright limitless nothingness, sometimes also called the primary clear light, associated with Yilem, the Buddhist concept of that which preceded the beginning of all being. We see here Aries is labeled at the top, Cancer to the right, Libra most below, and Capricorn to the left. This model can be read around clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on how it is meant to be used as a measure. The Kabbalistic attributes of the twelve signs of the zodiac include the twelve sons of Jacob who became the twelve tribes of Israel, as well as the twelve apostles of Christ the Messiah. However, later, Gnostic attributes were also assigned to the zodiac signs and seven planets. The Gnostic rendition of the twelve zodiac signs of Ayan Sahar was as the twelve archons, or authorities. They understood the seven planets as seven powers of these archons, occurring along bars between the archons when they are arranged as a circle like the zodiac itself. The Gnostic myth of the Archons is that each rules a span of 2,000 years, an aeon, and that they are 12 shards of a single shell that shattered when it fell from heaven. They call this original shell Yaldabaoth, or Samael, meaning the blind. The myth is that Yaldabaoth, the demiurge, created the four worlds of Kabbalah, and was the father with mortal Eve of yad heh and Elohim, the twin gods over good and evil. In the next session we will discuss the four worlds of Kabbalah, and in the third session discuss the Kabbalistic Tree of Life as it appeared to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Kabbalah Session 2 
In this session, we will look at the Four Worlds model of Kabbalah. According to this model, the emanations of nothingness, we covered in session one, comprise three layers of decreasing luminescence away from the th lower three worlds. The uppermost world, Atzaluth, is comprised of these three layers, Ayan Sof R, Ayan Sof, and Ayin. The model we see here for the four worlds depicts their order prior to the fall of spirit into matter, i.e. the creation of our universe by the Gnostic Demiurge. Here, immediately below and within Atzaluth, the world of emanation, is Yetzirah, the world of formation, which contains the cubical model of the Tree of Life discussed initially. Beneath and contained inside the world of Yetzirah formation, is the world of Bariah, representing the creation of our universe, which in turn has represented itself as the innermost sphere, labeled by the seven days, representing the world of Asai, the realm of action. According to the cosmology of Kabbalistical myths, our universe was created when the world of Yetzira and the world of Bariah exchanged places. The tree of life passed downward through the realm of Bariah, causing our creation to take place. At the same time, the realm of Bariah was removed upward away from our own place in the realm of matter and world of Asiah for action. It is described in the Bereshit Beth of the Zohar that the world of Bariah contained the paradise of Eden, and that the tree of life of Yetzira, the formation, was placed into its center. This scroll will depict the four worlds inside Bariah, described in the Zohar, and just as we find that the tree of life descended into the lowest realms of Bariah, of Eden, so too we can see in each of the four inner worlds of Bariah five Sephirot emanations and another one on the border between each. Following Kabbalah as a path of recapitulation or recommunion of the present body with the mind of the past, we will begin in the lowest of the inner worlds of Bariah and work upward approaching the highest Sephiroth on the outermost layer of Bariah, penetrating into the world of Yetzirah above, and called thus the Holy of Holies. The description of the four inner realms of Bariah, or of Paradise, comes from the Zohar, and the numbers below each Sephiroth indicate the verse within the Bereshit Beth volume of Zohar. The Bereshit Beth volume of the Zohar describes the ascent of the dead from the moment the soul leaves its earthly vessel of flesh. Thus, in the lowest of the four worlds of Bariah, the souls of the righteous are grouped according to their worthy deeds. Their deeds are then measured on a column called Zera and Pin, meaning literally, the short face. In the next higher inner realm of the world of Bariah, or Paradise, we find the emanations representing angels, each of which acts as a guide to the group of souls gathered into the places of the same emanations in the inner world below. This level of the inner spheres of Bariah is the same as the lower earth discussed in Genesis, wherein it is written, he made the upper waters apart from the lower waters. The upper waters of Bariah are ruled over by six archangels, Michael, Adriel, 
Gadrahel, Adahinel, Ahinel, and the angel of all converts. He who now guards the way into Eden, locking it to the children of Adam with an eternally spinning fiery sword. In the fourth world of Bariah, that is the sphere of Bariah encompassing the upper and lower worlds of creation, and the realm of paradise on earth, the Garden of Eden, we find the Sephiroth represented as five rays of refracted light from the Holy of Holies on the outermost border above, connecting to Yetzirah through the Moonstone or Sapphire on the border between the realm of Pariah and the upper waters. It is said the throne of God is like Sapphire, that the tablet of the law was engraved on a Sapphire stone, and that it was a Sapphire stone that was given to Adam by Raziel following the exile. The outer two columns of Sephiroth permeating the Zohar's four inner worlds model for Bariah are named Abba, meaning father, for the column on the left, and Ima, meaning mother, for the column on the right. It is thus through the middle pillar, the Yetzirah, as light shining from the Holy of Holies through the sapphire moonstone that separated the upper waters from the lower waters, was brought down to earth and placed within the Garden of Eden in the form of the Tree of Life of Kabbalah. The Gra, or earliest known version of the Tree of Life diagram, represents the ten sephirot as corners and the twenty-two paths as edges on a cube above over a cube below, representing one cube over time, or a 4D hypercube. However, this is only one form of hyperspatial object. Just as there are five regular platonic solids in three dimensions, so too do each of them correspond to a similar shape in four space, one dimension above. The hyperspace cube is the tree of life, and likewise the hyperspace tetrahedron is the tree of knowledge, which later became the tree of death following the expulsion from paradise. When the Gra tree of life diagram is recombined with the tree of death diagram, the result is the recapitulation in a single model of the systems described by both. Thus, what we see here is nothing less than the hyperspatial geometry of the Kabbalistic tree of Yetzirah, bearing upon it the hypertetrahedronal seed fruit of life itself. Although this form may be immortal, our own DNA is not. Just so, the first self-sustaining form of life on planet Earth was the virus, whose DNA is packaged inside a hexagonal isosahedron at its head, and after which our own central nervous system's arrangement is modeled. Kabbalah Session 3 In the first session we discussed the emanations of nothingness in the realm of Atsaluth, in the second session, we discuss the fall of these emanations through the realm of Yetzirah into the realm of Bariah, or Eden, paradise on earth. In this session, we will discuss the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden and its role relative to the fall of man. To begin with, we see in this depiction four diagrams all depicting the forbidden fruit on the tree of knowledge. From left to right we begin with the seed inside the fruit, then the fruit itself, next the fruit without its skin, and finally the fruit split in half. First we will examine the seed inside the fruit, depicted as a two-dimensional square, 
the shadow of a three-dimensional tetrahedron. Here we see a tetrahedron dissected into the now familiar ten sephirot emanations. The three corner points and the node in the middle correspond to the tetrahedron's four points and four sides. The six other points along the lines between these represent the six edges of the tetrahedron. This arrangement of the ten attributes is as a tetractus, to be read chronologically from top to bottom. This tetractus represents the seed of the tree of knowledge, which is foresight, and so in this diagram we see, just as Eve did, the first of the generations to follow Adam and Eve. This diagram, likewise, depicts the fruit of the tree of knowledge itself. Here we see the generations that followed Adam and Eve split into two lineages, the house of Seth and the house of Cain. Cain's line proceeds upward and represents the sons of God who came down and bred with the daughters of men, that is, those who descended from Seth, following the line downward and below. So we see six generations of immortals cohabited with eight generations of mortals. Just as Enos was the son of Seth and Lamech the name of the eighth mortal born, so too was Enoch the son of Cain and Lamech the name given to the sixth generation of immortals. Between these two, the names reverse direction relative to one another in the manner shown. Here we see the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge schematically exploded to show separately its seeds on the left, its stem and skin in the middle, and its volume as a shadow on the right. The seed on the leftmost is Eve, perceives the volume of the shadow cast by the stem and skin. The seed inside the fruit of knowledge Eve swallowed gave her foresight and showed her that the division between her two sons in their first generation would last at least until the life of Lamech, six generations of immortals, or eight mortal generations later. Thus, here we see the fruit of knowledge schematically re-imploded, forming a cross-section or half of the fruit itself. We can see here the manner in which the poison entered the fruit. The three layers of its skin, the realm of Atsaluth, were penetrated by the fang of the serpent, the Sephiroth, to the core of the fruit, the realm of Yetzira, and into the seeds in the innermost world of Barai. From there the poison leaked downward, throughout the rest of the lower realm of the fruit, the world of action, the world called Asaya. When Eve ate from this fruit, she swallowed its poison seed. According to myths, it was in that moment when the serpent of Satan tricked Eve into eating the forbidden fruit of paradise that Samael, the demiurge and creator of the four worlds of Kabbalah, declared himself equal to the immeasurable imperishable realms the Gnostic phrase for the all-seeing Empyrean God, the concept now of all or the Most High. This was the moment of the shattering of the vessels, the fall of Satan, his angels, and mankind, all at the same time. Following Eve eating of the forbidden fruit of Eden, she then fed the fruit to Adam. However, before this they copulated and thus when Adam ate the fruit himself, Eve was already pregnant with Cain. Following Adam eating the fruit, he and Eve came together again and conceived Abel. Thus Cain was born with Eve's immortality, and Abel was born with immortality and foreknowledge. To follow this second generation of offspring to Adam and Eve, we first turn our attention to this model for the Tree of Death by Steve Savedow. Here we are seeing an exploded stalactohedron, or as discussed in session 2, 
a hyper tetrahedron with one square or shadow of a tetrahedron above and another below. The simpler form of the same concept as the Tree of Knowledge diagram of Hakabala represents a tree of death now because for Adam or any of his generations to eat once more of the Tree of Life after the expulsion would cause them to surely die. Thus, this diagram depicts the fruit of the Tree of Life as opposed to the previous diagram for the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge, the forbidden fruit in Eden. Thus, this shape is only a more complex form of the same model as we saw earlier representing the fruit eaten by Eve. However, this fruit is that which can no longer be intellectually apprehended by the generations of mankind. It cannot be grasped, because to understand it is to pluck it and to taste of it, to have gnosis or experiential knowledge of it. It is simply grown on too tall a tree to be reached now. Therefore, ponder this model at your own risk. At the core of this fruit, though, is this model, which represents a method of time travel based on the right understanding of space as moving in one direction and time as moving in an opposite direction to this. This understanding should be considered extremely dangerous because, according to the myths of Kabbalah, the city of Enoch, from whence Noah hailed, was sunk to the bottom of the sea by the flood due to the immoral use by its inhabitants of technology taught to them by their gods. Again, we turn our attention to the model of the ten sephirot as circular emanations and the twenty-two paths on the usual tree of life expressed as the points of intersection between them. Here we see also the tenth sephirot circle encompasses the space of all the others, forming a torus around the seventh central sephirot. This model also reiterates the ten attributes of the tetrahedronal tetractus model of the seeds given earlier. The seeds in the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge are the ten Sephiroth emanations. Next, we review the model of the seven planets, the so-called interior seven attributes below the so-called tables of the eighth and the ninth of Hermes Trismegistus. Just as the ten Sephiroth emanations are the seeds of the Tree of Knowledge, so too are the seven Kamea the seeds of the tree of life. The ten sephirot are yielded by looking at a torus, or a hypersphere, from above its pole. The seven planetary dignities are shown here as along the edge or side of the hypersphere, as viewed from above its equator. Now we see the whole book of Raziel written by Adam in paradise, describing all he saw and knew there lost at the time of the expulsion, and returned to Adam by the angel following Adam's prolonged repentance in the river Gihon. The ten emanations are the central tetractus, including one emanation that is a zodiac of twelve aeons. Above this are the father god and mother goddess, and below are the four inner worlds of Bariah, superimposed above the seven latitudes on the globe of Asai. Thus, just so, did the fall occur. In one and the same instant did Samael the blind declare himself equal to God, did Satan enter unto the serpent, and the serpent did tempt Eve. It was the tears of Eve in Eden that brought about the flood, so here we see the third level or dimension of the fall, following Eve's temptation of Adam, when God spoke unto Samael and said, You err. After God had spoken thus to Satan, God entered into Eden to cast out original sin. He entered into Eden through the tree of knowledge, whose seeds are the ten sephirot. Here is the Tree of Knowledge diagram which depicts the hypercube of time we call Kabbalah. It is written Adam and Eve, having recognized their nakedness, concealed themselves with fig leaves, 
and thus disguise themselves as trees. So when God came down to Eden on earth, he came down in the form of the tree of knowledge. He then cursed the sinners involved in original sin. This is the sevenfold curse, known as the Mark of Cain, which is the taking back of seven blessings. The blessings are seen here to be the unfolded left and right columns on either side of the foreshortened central column of the Tree of Knowledge. The central column is the compression into one of the four Sephirot Malkuth, Yesod, Tifereth, and Kether. The Sephirot here are labeled according to the four prime trigrams of the I Ching. Yin, positive, is leftmost, signifying Bina, while Yang, negative, is rightmost, signifying Chakma. In the middle is Tao, signifying the middle way, or the Buddhist eightfold path. The manner God cursed the sinners was to remove, one by one, each of these seven blessings. First he retracted the gift of communication given to the serpent, and made its shape like the Tao, the path itself, to mimic its circumspection of speaking with a forked tongue. Next he cursed the offspring of the egg-laying serpent and the birthing and nursing Eve. He cursed Eve to feel pain in bearing her children by Adam, and he cursed Adam to eat only of the tree of knowledge, and to sweat to harvest the grain of the herbs of the field, and render it into bread to feed his family with Eve. Finally, we are cursed with the curse of death, the curse of dust to dust and of ashes to ashes. Here we see the sevenfold curse penetrating the three loops of an Ouroboros, a serpent eating its own tail. Here we see the uncoiled serpent eating its own tail, the zodiac of twelve aeons, interpenetrated as in the last model by the sevenfold mark of Cain. As before, the twelve aeons are believed by Gnostic Kabbalists to each be ruled over by one archon, and that between these archons exist the seven cameo as powers. Here we see the four worlds of Hakabala after the fall. We see Yetzirah now separating Bariah, Paradise, from Messiah, and the seven acts of creation. Yetzirah is the tree of knowledge, and we, the cursed children of Adam, must ascend this model to re-enter Paradise. It is said now the path to Paradise is guarded by an angel with a flaming sword. Thus, the tree of life is now alike a flaming sword. Here we see the Sephirot striking like lightning down from the cloud of Bariah. We see Adam, fallen downward through Isaiah, must reascend the tree of knowledge to reacquire the tree of life's forbidden fruit. This is the Kabbalistic process called recapitulation or recommunion the reuniting of King God with the crown of your own mind. At last we find the world or dimension of things now, following the fall. The tree of knowledge bearing the fruit of life is full grown, the seven cameo are fully aligned, the meaning of the fruit of life can now be known, the Gnostic aeons are turning, and the time of Kabbalah is approaching us all. First, we turn our attention to the Tree of Knowledge, recombined with the Tree of Life. Here, at last, we see the meaning of the Seven, as the chakras on the central pillar, and the meaning of the Ten, as the eight double trigrams of I Ching, as well as Yin and Yang. Twenty-two paths connect the ten, and twelve connect the seven. 
There are a total of 72 unique traits on this diagram. 10 plus 22 of the Tree of Knowledge equals 32, and 7 plus 12 of the Tree of Life, which combine to form his 50 names besides Marduk. Thus, these 50 combined with the 22 tarot trumps, or Hebrew letters, total 72. This is the model of the seven Kamiya assembled. The seven Kamiya, considered equivalent to the sevenfold curse of Cain, the seven powers of the Archons, the seven Olympic planetary dignities, and the seven chakras, were originally seven talismans made of magic number squares. These squares, the Kamiya, can then be folded up around a Pythagorean theorem triangle to form this flower-like shape. Here we see the Tree of Life's fruit schematically exploded as we had seen before with the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge eaten by Eve. The larger green circle signifies the standard zodiac, while the smaller blue torus signifies the three-looped version of the zodiac seen from the side. The red triangles represent the sevenfold Olympic cameo as trajectories. This is a depiction of the usual form of a zodiac, containing the usual expression of the planets, not as bars across the circle, but as a star of seven points within a circle of twelve. This image shows us in a single simple model the entirety of all that has thus far been described. Its real meaning, however, is understood only by a few who are the true Gnostics. Lastly, we see this depiction of the alignment of the seven planets on May 5th, 2000 AD and the alignment of the Earth, Moon, Sun, and Galactic Core on December 21, 2012 AD. We can now, if we should so like to, and also should we choose to do so, see the similarities of this model to the four worlds of Kabbalah. Kabbalah Session 4 Albert Einstein disagreed with Niels Bohr by saying that God does not roll dice, and yet space has three dimensions. Each dimension has two directions, such that there are, in fact, six possible directions in all space. This is equivalent to the six sides of a cubic dice. Thus, when Einstein disagreed with Bohr on the nature and construction of the universe, he may have been implying that space, because it has a fourth single direction of time, is not shaped exactly like a six-sided dice. The ancients were familiar with the six-sided cube, and they invented the dice based on those principles. While many moderns believe that the original invention of dice was to further a game of chance, luck, in truth, dice were a divinatory mechanism. That is, a device for rendering predictions. By the same grand design that formed and created, made and shaped the universe in three dimensions with six possible directions, these manifested as the 
six fundamental questions of logical reasoning. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? Since their origin, the exact order of these in order to produce a deduction or induction of logical reasoning, i.e. an answer, has been lost. However, the questions known now are the same as those known to the ancients can be graphed, plotted into the six sides of the three-dimensional cube. This configuration is called a logic cube, and it represents space, the static three dimensions, frozen in the exact moment. However, what is sacred is sacred, and what is profane is profane. Therefore, the single cube representing space frozen in the moment of now and time excludes the arrow of entropy that passes through all things, causing change and energy to be formed as matter breaks down. Thus, while this moment, the single cube, is a sacred moment, event, and shape. It is not the single cube, which is known to the profane. It is the dice. Dice like these poker dice, which are labeled with the upper trump royal suits of a regular deck of cards. Thus Nine, ten, jack, queen, king, and ace. Just as the six fundamental questions of reasoning represent the single moment of now, and in the same way that only poker dice and not regular pipped dice can represent the dual nature of a single cube over time, representing the change, the flux, the rolling of the dice as it breaks its matter down into energy and becomes something new. Thus, when we take two poker dice and label them with these esoteric and astrological, planetary and elemental symbols. Shown here are the twelve signs of the zodiac and seven planets of antiquity. Thus representing time depicted on the pair of cubes. We arrive at this model. Here you can see that each edge of the dual cube has a symbol from astrology attached to it, but that each face or side of this dual cube remains labeled with one aspect of the dual nature of the poker dice. It is possible to depict in a model in three dimensions. The combination of the logic cube and the dual nature of the poker dice expressed as the double cube of the Kabbalah. When 
these two traits, the logic dice and the dual nature of the poker dice Kabbalah, are combined. They give us the actual shape of the Tree of Life. The arrangement of the Tree of Life is such that there are ten faces showing on the double cube, symbolizing the ten Sephiroth emanations of Kabbalah. The twenty-two paths are contained in three horizontal planes. The seven planets are labeled vertically, while the twelve astrological signs of the zodiac are labeled horizontally around the double cube. And here we see that because the double cube is superimposed with the logic cube's attributes, when represents Kether, as well as the lower half of the Abyss Death, while Y represents Malkuth and the upper half of the Abyss Death. And so when and Y appear only once each, while the rest appear twice. And here we see the two cubes of Kabbalah represented in three separate forms. On the right, we see the proper Tree of Life model of Hakabala. In the middle, we see the combination of the attributes of the zodiac and the planets with the poker dice sides. And on the left, we see the regular poker dice arranged in the same placement as the other two models. Thus, these three double cubes all represent the tree of life. A cube over time. Kabbalah, Session 5. In this final session, let us begin by looking at Hakabalah, not as in Session 1, as an eight-sided tesseract or cube over time, but as a two-dimensional shadow of the same shape on a Euclidean-Cartesian plane space. We see the universe of space now as a series of rippling arcs, and the multiversal force of time we see as the square of that circle, that is, having the same area, but exceeding its circumference in exactly four corners. The four concentric rings symbolize the Kabbalistic four worlds, or the elemental traits and qualities that apply to each of the cosmological forces of our universe in the order in which they formed one Planck time following the Big Bang. Immediately we see that the Tree of Life of Kabbalah takes a form of a spiral shape to connect the dots of where these circles and squares overlap. This spiral revolves around one way above, called phi, i.e. a Fibonacci spiral, and the opposite way below, called pi, i.e. a spiral mirabilis. The ten Sephiroth attributes are given titles derived from Timothy Leary's interpretation of the three bardo total of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Here we find that Kether and Chakma symbolize the primary and secondary clear light respectively, but that the seven Sephiroth below these twin supernals, from Bana down to Yasod, are the realms between the Eightfold Path and the Six Lokas, and thus belong collectively to the second realm of the Buddhist afterlife, the Chonyid Bardo. Lastly, Malkuth Shekinah is symbolized by the four elements surrounding a human figure, itself representing the fifth element of spirit. This Leary corresponded to the Sidpa Bardo. Next, to study the attributes of the squared circle, flat plane model of Hagabala, 
We examine each corner and then rotate the entire shape around its central circle. Once we have rotated the Tree of Life spiral shadow of the Phi to Pi ratio around full circle, we come to the Tree of Death, upside down from the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life's ten Sephiroth emanations are represented on the Tree of Death as the taking back of ten blessings that shattered the Cliffhoth shells. Here these sins are listed as the Ten Commandments. Then, returning the model to the upright position, we find that it is the stirring of this spiral permeating upward into, then downward through, the space-time continuum represented as the square circle that causes the differentiation of the four Kabbalistical elemental worlds. Such is the penetrating gaze of the all-seeing eye of the Creator, Maker, Shaper, and Former of all so minute that it can search down all the way from around the outskirts of time itself and look long into our soul. Before we leave this geometrical model, though, let us pause briefly to consider some of the other symbols on it. Between the Egyptian hieroglyph for the Ka, representing the body on the far left, and Malkuth in the center, along the eighth spoke on the horizon, measures exponential distances from Earth in light years. Between the Egyptian hieroglyphic for the Ka, aura or energy double on the far right, and Malkuth in the center measure four states of consciousness expressed by the Vedic Hindu Buddhist terms for various levels of trance meditative mind state. Finally, let us only briefly consider the shape this squared circle form of Hakbala would take in three space, and following this the shape again extended into four space over three space, the sacred version of the golden dawn tree of life known to the profane. Kabbalah, Session 6 In the beginning there was no tree of life, and the ten emanations were thought of as concentric ripples, all originating from the same central source. Each ripple represented a breath of God, inhaled and exhaled by the divine creator deity, called modernly the Holy One, blessed be he. It is written that as God inhaled, there was a function called zimzum, or contraction, that was coupled with an expansion, or emanation, as God exhaled each of these first ten sephirot as breaths. Now, if the Sefer Yetzirah did originate in its most rudimentary elements with the patriarch Abraham, its system of alpha numerology may date back to an even more primeval epoch, when the first concept of the ten Sephirot as ten traits of God may have formed due to or contemporary with the origin for the gesture of supplication, mudra, or hand posture, which today we associate with the act of prayer, in which the two palms are placed together with the prints of the four fingertips and one thumb pad of each hand touching their mere reflected partners, such that five are opposite five. So, at some point very early on in human history, it was reckoned that the ten fingers could be thought of as alike ten traits or aspects describing the divine creator deity. However, initially, these ten traits existed only in a given sequence as a list, either ascending or descending in order, and were still, even by then, not yet associated with the thirty-two mystical paths of wisdom described ostensibly by Abraham, in Sefer Yetzirah. At this point, we are given Malkuth, the Hebrew word for kingdom, as a term for the lowest, core-most concept, and Kether, the crown, as the most high-affiliated concept. This ideation of a crown over a kingdom may have been borrowed from the earliest Hammurabian and Sargonite era legal codices, establishing the Sumero-Akkadian and ultimately Babylonian empires 
around 4,000 years ago, in about 2000 BC, as unions of city-states answering to a single leader. It is known that, in the era of the supposed lifetime of the patriarch Abraham, the Babylonian solar savior deity figure was supplanting all the lesser local god forms, and this usurpation of the elder Anunnaki gods by the upstart rebel god Marduk may have contributed to the reasoning of Abraham for leaving Ur. By the era of the supposed lifetime of the Christian solar savior deity figure, Yeshua HaMashiach. There were two distinct schools on Hebrew mysticism that was already by then called Hokabalah, meaning directly received or whispered teachings. These two were the school preserving the Yosher, or upright, Etzachayim, or Tree of Life tradition, described by Sefer Yetzirah, and the school preserving the Merkava, or throne chariot tradition, describing additional aspects of Kabbalah that would later form a pleroma of independent schools surrounding that tree's central trunk, confer the earlier Hekelot literature, and the later Sefer Habahir, Sefer HaZohar, Mishnah, Midrash commentaries, and ultimately feudal era grimoires on ritual magic as well. The throne chariot tradition may be thought of as looking head-on at the same axis as the tree of life tradition may be thought of as looking at from along a linear edge. So, entering the current era, we see in the first century AD this division between the throne chariot and the tree of life based schools on Hakabalistic tradition had already manifested itself as two competing classes or secret societies of scribes, the Essenes and the Nazarenes, who preserved two distinct cultures, each based on their half of what we would call the Old Testament scriptures of today. The Essenes kept the Tree of Life Kabbalah, and their scriptures were all those referring to God in them as Yadhevadhe, confer the Book of J or the Yavist, while the Nazarenes kept the throne chariot Kabbalah, and their scriptures were all those referring to God in them as Elohim, confer the modern Q Gospel. This split continues today between Christendom under Jesus, Son of Jehovah, and the faith of Islam, meaning surrender in Arabic taught by Muhammad, peace be upon him, the last holy prophet of Allah. Yitzhak Luria, 1534-1572 A.D., called Ha'ari, meaning the lion, had been a student of Moshe ben Jacob Cordovero Haramak, 1522-1572 to 1570, who was founder of the Spanish Safed school, attempting to reunify these twin traditions. Luria collated from variant manuscripts and published the first complete collected edition of Sefer Yetzera. Because the Tree of Life model of Hakabalah's ten Sephirot emanations is described simply and presumably originally, in this short version of Sefer Yetzer, the diagram we associate with the Tree of Life of HaKabalah cannot, in all truth, be dated prior to this time. Moreover, it would not be until the lifetime of Elijah Vilna Gaon, called Hagra, 1720-1797 to 1797 A.D., that the simplest, now considered most likely to be the original, version for this diagram was worked out, as we shall examine later, toward the end of this session. Luria's design for the Tree of Life diagram accentuated the distinction between the upper three 
or supernal sephirot, from the lower seven subtended sephirot. The reasoning for this was mathematical and psychological, associating the lower seven sephiroth with the more physical worlds of Asaya and Bariah, and the three supernal sephiroth with the more spiritual worlds of Yetzira and Etzeluth, thus being closer to the void of Ain, Ein Sof, and Ein Sof Or that supersedes and surrounds the cosmos of the emanations as a shroud of limitless, empty nothingness. To accentuate this distinction, Luria's model for the Tree of Life, ostensibly the first depiction of its kind, featured a sunken metal column with the lowest sephirot, Malkuth, submerged independently from all the rest. The offset this created formed a division between the seventh and eighth sephirot as attribute traits, such that Kether, Crown, Chakma, Wisdom, and Bina, Understanding, were all encircled as Daath, Knowledge, a separate realm of inner psychological essence, apart from the realms containing the subtended lower seven sephiroth, defined by a more external, physical existence. The parallel tradition of the throne chariot, Merkava mysticism school of the Kabbalah, had also progressed contemporary to its twin school studying the tree of life. Rabbi Akiva ben Yosef, 50 to 135 AD, or possibly his student, Rashbai Shimon bar Yochai, whom was said to have hid from Roman occupation in a cave, studying Torah for 13 years before being inspired by the prophet Elijah to return to the world and author the work, originally initiated the spoken liturgy that would come to constitute the main body of Sefer HaZohar, first published by Moish ben Shem Tov, called Moses de Leon, 1240-1305. The word Zohar, meaning splendor or radiant light, appears first in HaTorah, in Ezekiel 8.2, thus placing it in the Merkava throne chariot tradition. But the detailed descriptions in the Zohar's texts, cosmological content, book Bereshit or beginning, part Beth, Hebrew for B, deal with the same essential concept that the Tree of Life diagram attempts to depict, a ladder-like lattice connecting a transcendental heaven above to our mundane earth below. Luria's proposed model for the Tree of Life diagram thus accentuated the Zohar's predilection for the use of a base seven numerical system. The cosmology of the Zohar attributes six Sephirot-like traits to each of the four worlds, such that, per each of the four Kabbalistic worlds, ascending from most dense to least, Asaya, Bariah, Yetzirah, Atzaluth, there are six traits surrounding a central seventh, but such that the first, bottom, and last, top, traits in every level's arrangement bordered on the last or the next in the series of worlds, and thus were only one-half traits apiece. The end result maps a soul's passage in its immediate afterlife past a total of 25 traits or attributes before attaining to the Holy of Holies, wherein God is, according to this text, said to dwell. The goal of this complex methodology is, in the Zohar, clearly stated as being to recapitulate or to reunite the divine creator deity with his bride, called Shekinah, meaning his presence, by describing individual souls as like sparks of light rising upward to be absorbed into the clear light of Kether, in the Most High Presence, 
of the Holy of Holies in Atsaluth, the divine conceptual realm. Again, by displaying Malkuth in an additionally subtended position, Luria's model for the Tree of Life diagram arrangement of the ten Sephirot traits was attempting to accentuate the fallen nature of mankind's soul and to symbolize the intervening six Sephiroth between the kingdom and the inner or psychological worlds of the three supernals as a ladder-like lattice structure. The immediate results of Luria's attempts to manipulate the simpler model, proposed later by Hagra, were the creation of an unorthodox eleventh Sephiroth, Dath, Hebrew for knowledge, and the mythology-fueled subsequent school of study about this slippage of the middle pillar, relating it to the shattering of the shells or vessels event described in its own school of literature as dating back to the earliest Sephiroth and Zimzum expansion-contraction phase of proto-creation. Thus, by his concessions toward the Zoharic school of Kabbalah, Luria's modeling of the Yetziric school Tree of Life diagram ultimately may have done the work's subject more harm than help although it definitely did accomplish his original goal in designing it as such, to obscure the true model from contemporary Catholic Christians who considered all such study of Kabbalah blasphemy. Because of these concessions with the Zohar, made solely for the reason of obfuscating their meaning from contemporary Christians, there quickly arose manifold differing models to arrange the traits of the 22 foundation letters around the 10 luminous emanations. These constitute the earliest models of the Tree of Life diagram. The longer term result of Luria's model was the birth of a school of latter-day Protestant Christian Kabbalists. Appealing to hermetic alchemists and to Neoplatonists alike during the Renaissance and early Enlightenment eras, the study of Kabbalah became en vogue among the anti-papist intelligentsia. Athanasius Kircher, 1602 to 1680 AD, a Jesuit scholar at the Roman Gregorian College, has been called the last Renaissance man and was a student in many fields, including the study of a Kabbalah. Kircher's works, translated into English, may have been the first serious infusion of Kabbalah studies into the Anglo-Saxon sphere during our modern era. Kircher's Kabbalistic models portray a knowledge of both Sefer Yetzirah's 32 mystical paths of wisdom and the centralmost accoutrements from the Zohar's base 7 cosmological descriptions as well. So, just as Hedluria opened up that Pandora's box of Christian Kabbalah, so too did Kircher's works introduce this trend to the modern English-speaking world. In Kircher's diagram, we see the primary difference between the later Christian Kabbalistical model and the earlier truly Hebrew model is that in the Christian and subsequently inspired versions, the paths connecting Yesod, foundation, to Gevorah, severity, and Chesed, mercy, in the original Hebrew models have, in the later Christian models, apparently slipped down to now connect Hod, glory, and Netzach, victory, to Malkuth, kingdom instead. This final slippage of the middle pillar constitutes the last step in the Lurianic anti-Christian obscuration of the true Gra model of the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah. The final pre-modern era diagram for the Tree of Life of Hakabalah to consider is called by Aleister Crowley in his work 777, The Naples Arrangement. 
This model of a Kabbalah as a simple lattice with ten vertices connected by twenty-two paths only becomes complex if one attempts to envision these ten vertices as actual corners and the twenty-two paths as actually being edges on a materially solid, real-shaped, three-dimensional object. The result of meditations on this model have led to much confusion among the confusable, but also to much inspiration to learn more among some, relatively more reasonable by comparison. It is by now generally accepted by Hebrew students of Kabbalah and scholars on the subject from other secular sectors and religious creeds that the shape depicted in the two-dimensional Tree of Life model of Kabbalah is, most likely, a polytope from a higher dimensionality continuum than our own physical reality of three-dimensional space propelled in the singular direction of time. In other words, this form is thought to be a hyperspace shape authentically attributable to ancient inspiration. In our modern era, the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah has come to symbolize the 32 mystical paths of wisdom described originally in the Sefer Yetzer, but also a litany of other cross-cultural and syncretic symbols as well. Aside from being merely traits or attributes assignable to God, now the ten Sephirot are also seen as symbols of the sun, moon, and five other classical planets of antiquity, along with the sphere of the movable heavens being affiliated to Chakma, wisdom, the sphere of the fixed heavens to Kether, crown, and the sphere of the four elements of earth to Malkuth, kingdom. Likewise, aside from being merely associated to the 22 foundation letters, now the paths on the Tree of Life diagram's shape are each given as an additional visual attribute, a so-called Atu, or trump card, from the alleged Book of Thoth, or Liberty deck of Tarot cards. The most recognizable set of these 22 trump card images was, during the first half of the 20th century, undeniably the Rider Waite deck, designed by members of an occult secret society, ritual magic practice and study group called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. It was Aleister Crowley whom sought, after leaving this group, to publish their secret inner order rituals, and that, by doing so, began the present tacit repeal of the post-Safid, Hasidic-era ban and prohibition against the open public study of esoteric Kabbalah. A Kabbalah has since become, as Crowley intended it, more or less a blank canvas onto which one may paint whatever religiously syncretic meanings one wishes, from any tradition in the world and from any era of history. So, in our own post-Crowleyan New Age, the study of ancient Jewish mysticism is not kept solely for the initiated and passed down among them only orally any longer. Thus, this hermetic order of the Golden Dawn was responsible for unleashing onto the unsuspecting and unprepared global theater audience, then undergoing intermittent worldwide wars and population explosions in the early 20th century AD, the entirety of what is now politely dubbed simply the Western esoteric mystery school tradition, and insofar as the members of this group were unsuspecting of and unprepared for this outcome themselves, the result of what they released contained many incomplete subsystems, many shorthand notations, and many rushed replications of past errors. In this regard, their contribution to history of an initiatory order degree system or hierarchy for intracult promotion that is based, however crudely, on the ten Sephiroth model of Kabbalah's Tree of Life diagram, cannot be rightly and necessarily included amongst such otherwise rare but malformed rubbish 
as for example their spherical projection model of the tree of life having been based in part on antiquarian cipher manuscripts and in part on the Society Rosicrucianae in Anglia, the British Rosicrucian branch affiliate to UGLE Freemasonry. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn's basic initiatory format, including seven outer order and three inner order degrees with rituals, titles, and official duties, etc., was later reapplied by Aleister Crowley in his reformation of the German Order of Oriental Templars, or simply the OTO. Although Crowley proclaimed himself the first to achieve the utmost pinnacle, Ipsissimus, rank in this already by then worldwide invisible college, following his death, the OTO he reformed suffered some interior schisms and splits, but remains using basically the same base 10 degree system now that, in theory, was designed by the founders of the Hermetic Golden Dawn, and which was, at the least, inspired by the SRIA. However, Crowley's personal fascinations led him toward the study of the dark arts as well, and thus he found and cultivated the Tree of Death diagram, or model of a Kabbalah. This diagram of my own shows Crowley's attributions to the reversed and adverse Cliffoth, the hidden or concealed cortices behind the visible Sephirot emanations of ten demon kings over seven hells, and is shown parallel to descriptions of the denizens of hell given by Crowley from chapter First Resh in Liber Ararita. Crowley describes the king demon over all the rest, called Satan Moloch in this arrangement as the twin heads that ever battle against one another, so that all their thought is confusion. The shattering of the vessels event is described in its own small school of Kabbalistic literature, associating it with the Zimzum contraction as God breathes in, with the separation between the four worlds of a Kabbalah, and with the Cliffoth, Hebrew for shells, vessels that contained the ten Sephirot emanations prior to the event of their shattering. Supposedly, according to this tradition, the shards of these shattered shells were sewn downward and becoming increasingly more solid, dense, and material as they descended, sank from the spiritual realm to comprise the fundamental substance of all matter. Hence, the difference between a golem and a man, such as, say, Adam, whom, we are told, in scripture, was, like a golem may be, made out of clay, is that a golem is like an empty shell, and man, or Adam in this case, is imbued with the breath of God, igniting an innate, even if dormant, divine spark of inspiration. Thus, it is also speculated, the shattering of the shells occurred to provide mankind a solid, base nature in which to ensnare and entrap such a divine spark of light or luminescence, which Hebrews call ruach, and which Christians call a soul. So what finally is Hakabalah, and what is the meaning of its Tree of Life diagram? If we can confidently assert, as we may, that Isaac Luria's contribution of the original Tree of Life diagram to our current era was initially intended as subterfuge and as a means of sabotaging future scholastic researchers from ascertaining the concealed, correct interpretation or mystical truth behind it, then we may add to this assertion that his depiction of the Tree of Life is thus not only arbitrary and alterable, but actually outright wrong on purpose. Although technically satisfying the requirements for the Tree of Life model described in the text of the Sefer Yetzirah, that it have ten corners or emanations, and twenty-two edges or paths connecting them, Luria's diagram is, 
ultimately an impossible shape to model in three dimensions and should be considered a fallen and imperfect example of this model to start with. As mentioned before, a later version offered by Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, whom was called the Vilna Gaon, or simply Hagra, proposes a simpler structural lattice framework supporting the same amount of 32 mystical paths of wisdom as described in the text of Sefer Yetzirah and is, in all likelihood, more authentic and in keeping with the original shape intended to be inferred via its verbal descriptions therein. The primary difference between the Tree of Life diagram as modeled by Ha'ari and that suggested by Hagra is that, while the RE diagram depicts an impossible shape that cannot be modeled in three-dimensional space, the Gra version of the same model depicts a shape that can easily be modeled as existent in three-dimensional space. In this case, the original shape of Kabbalah's Tree of Life diagram is revealed as being a cube over a cube, or one cube squared. Thus, if a cube has six sides or faces, eight corners or vertices, and twelve legs or edges, and a tesseract, or cube cubed, has 12 sides, 16 corners, and 24 edges. The original model for the Tree of Life of Hakabalah can be said to have had 10 exposed sides, 12 corners, and 20 edges. When looked at from a 45 degree angle, a double cube, or a single cube raised by one exponent, to symbolize the motion of the object over time, comprises a model with five exposed faces, ten exposed corners, and twenty legs, twelve horizontal, eight vertical. Although this naked symbol, the double cubit hypercube at antipode of Hakabalah, may be thought of at this point as a like a more or less blank slate or empty canvas, onto which we will next be arbitrarily assigning any sets of symbols we may like. This should not preclude the idea that a certain right order for any set of symbols must exist, even if at first it may be lost among an ocean of wrong and arbitrary assignations. So, with that caveat, what I will present next from here to the close of this session will be my own attributions of sets of symbols to this lattice framework shape, and these should be seen as the work of a turn of the 21st century researcher of Hakabalah, attempting to recreate the most probable original format for the Tree of Life diagram model. In short, these may each, and or all, be wrong even if only in some very slight way, and none of them should be thought of as necessarily standing as a conclusion for this line of inquiry. So here we may see the twin upper and lower cubes unfolded into their Calvary cross tiling pattern, with the inferior cube on the right presented as the inverse cross, and the superior cube on the left depicted as the upright cross. Beyond this, the twelve horizontal legs are given as the twelve signs or houses of the zodiac round, while the eight verticals are as the seven classical planets of antiquity, with Mercury alone appearing twice, once on each cube. Although in this depiction the twelve sides or faces of the twin cubes are given as the six fundamental questions of logical reasoning, who, what, where, when, why, and how. These assignations are my own and arbitrary and may just as well be left blank entirely. If one removes the six fundamental questions of reasoning from the twelve sides of the two cubes, the result appears as a pair of cubes comprised of solid legs or edges 
but with entirely missing faces and both hollow in their centers. In this depiction of such a model, where the twin cubes' legs are solid, but the faces and volumes of both are left empty, we see the upper cube separated from the lower cube, but we may also see from this vantage point that the upper cube's lowest legs and the lower cube's topmost legs share the same symbols. This is to signify that these legs, or horizontal edges, are shared jointly by both cubes, fusing and connecting them into a new, single shape, where the six faces, eight corners, and twelve edges of a single cube, when doubled into the twelve faces, sixteen corners, and twenty-four edges of a pair of cubes, may be joined together to form a shape with ten faces, twelve corners, and twenty edges, the so-called Tree of Life of Hakabalah, visualized as a solid model in three-dimensional space. Therefore, if we can assert, as we may, that the Grah arrangement of the ten Sephiroth traits onto the Tree of Life diagram lattice framework is authentically very ancient in origin, and may have even been known to our earliest Homo sapien ancestors, we may desire to inquire as to the six logical questions in reasoning out the who, what, where, when, why, and how of its origins, thus, who first invented or discovered a Kabbalah, what was their intention for it to be, where and when was this innovation originally achieved, why was the Tree of Life diagram of a Kabbalah designed as it is, and finally, how is its design best modeled? The earliest model relating a symbol set of 22 to any kind of lattice framework structure was probably developed during the later part of the Paleolithic and early part of the Neolithic eras when mankind had spread out globally as a coastal, seafaring civilization but had just begun to spread inland and develop stone hunting tools for pursuing wild herds of mega mammals during the last North Hemisphere Ice Age. This places its likely date of origin some 12,500 years before now, or around 10,500 BC, and its likely location of origin probably in Oceania, the islands of the southwestern Pacific. At that time there, a game, now called Cat's Cradle, was invented involving looping a string around one's fingers a certain number of times following a certain pattern of gestural mudras to arrive at a widely varied array of differently appearing results. One of these such string figure outcomes involves a single loop that has been curled up around itself a total of 22 times, to display an array that is similar in appearance to the Gra version of the Tree of Life diagram of Hakabalah. The relation of Hakabalah to this admittedly extremely ancient game form remains, however, speculative at best, and, again, contemplations in this regard should not be seen as either definite or conclusive. However, since this relationship may be seen as being purely speculative, let me close this session by examining something about this model that cannot be said to be merely coincidental. If we can, as we may, depict the Grah arrangement of the Tree of Life diagram of Hukbalah as a lattice framework onto which we may then assign the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, these being the ten Sephiroth traits and the twenty-two foundation letters, then we may, as we may also see here, assign to this same Gra-based arrangement the English transliterations and translations of these ten Sephiroth traits derived from their original Hebrew, and the substitution cipher of replacing the twenty-two foundation letters on their paths between these with the 12 signs or houses of the zodiac round, 
Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, the seven classical planets of antiquity, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the three alchemical states or phases, salt, sulfur, and quicksilver. Given these symbols' decryption from a purely symbolic set back into their original Hebrew alphabetic format, we find the reminder that each Hebrew letter was also equal to a number sum in the context of alphanumeric gematria encoding. Here we see that, just as each symbolic sign attributed to the 22 paths or formation letters could be peeled back to be replaced with a Hebrew letter, so too can these same Hebrew letters be substituted for by numeral sums, and these, when added together, as in the case of the Hebrew words assigned as the ten sephirot traits combined to form larger number sums. Thus, just as each of the 22 symbolic signs has its own corresponding Hebrew foundation letter on its same fixed path on the Gra Tree of Life diagram, and so each Hebrew letter has its own alphanumeric number sum, so too does each of the ten Sephirot traits have a corresponding gematria number sum, and each of these has, in turn, its lowest common denominator and greatest common factor components. For example, the factor of 2 to the 4th equals 8 occurs twice on the graphic as a denominator within the gematria for Malkuth, kingdom, and Yasad, foundation. And, likewise, the factor of 5 occurs in three cases, inside of Yesod, foundation, Hod, splendor, and Kether, crown, and so on and so forth. In the final diagram to be considered for this session, let us pause to examine this depiction of my own design, revealing what amount to entirely inherent relationships between these anciently given traits. Here we see the two is color-coded purple, three indigo, five blue, the exponent four yellow, the exponent three orange, and the exponent two red, while all other numbers reduced to primes are given in green. We can also see the paths connecting these color-coded number sums are color-coded according to the same key such that a blue arrow connects each occurrence of the number 5 to every other, a green arrow every odd prime sum to every other, etc. And the result of this is that, although none of the connections between these number sums would require violating the Gras arrangement shape, five of the legs serve as at least double connections between relevant sums, and six of the possible paths on the Gras tree remain unused left blank. Further conclusions we can find from this arrangement include that the Kamatria sums of both Bina, understanding, and Chakma, wisdom, are automatically prime numbers, and that with Tifereth, beauty, they comprise a supernal quaternion that is connected to the six other subtended traits only by the single path joining Kether to Yesod connecting their base 5 prime number sums. Kabbalah, Session 7 So what then is the meaning of the Tree of Life diagram of Kabbalah? Our modern, latter-day Kabbalistical Tree of Life diagram supposedly refers to the shape of a tree that had, formerly, been found only at the very center of the Pardens Orchard of Paradise, which had been called during the times when Adam and Eve lived there, 
the Esekayim, tree of knowledge, instead. When Adam and Eve inhabited paradise, we are told by the eldest legends, there were two types of sacred mystical tree, compared by some scholars to the fig, palm, and date, not types of trees, and from thence to seasonal, blossoming, and evergreen, conifer trees, and by other scholars on such, to apples and oranges. The more common type of foliage yielded an edible fruit so healthy to ingest, it provided indefinitely prolonged unto immortal life. And Adam and Eve were, we are told, given freely to eat of this type of fruit as long as they lived in Eden. However, upon the couple's mutual commission with the serpent of original sin, Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden and a sevenfold curse was placed on their heads and on the heads of all future generations of their offspring. One notable aspect of God's sevenfold curse of retribution against his own creation comes in the form of God forbidding mankind from ever again partaking of the fruit of immortality, from the tree of life, indigenous only to paradise, which he now placed off limits behind an angel with a flaming sword, commanding we instead be forever condemned to partake in only the fruit of death from the tree of knowledge over good and evil, for eating which in Eden we were exiled from thence to begin with. So to say that the tree of life diagram studied by scholars of Kabbalah today is, in fact, a depiction of a literal sort of tree, vine, or even weed that grew once upon a time in mankind's eldest known land of milk and honey, is to say at the least that the study of this lattice framework structure is ancient in the extreme. The shape of what we now call the tree of life was once the tree of knowledge when we dwelt in Eden's garden, and this lattice framework structure be it called whatever it may be, was simply an expression of one cube over another, or of one cube over time. It was, according to the myth, for simply becoming aware of this temporal dualism applying to ethical right and wrong. That is, by ingesting the fruit of death from the tree of knowledge over good and evil, found once only in the center of the pardons of paradise, Garden of Eden, that humanity was forever banished from our earliest home. So we are told, the better plant that once grew bountifully in nature became, gradually or suddenly, supplanted by the worse plant that seems to have seeded itself more easily and finally choked the better plant out into extinction. This event, whatever the myth was based on, was so traumatic for our species that we have wandered in the opposite direction, away from our home in a garden paradise. Ever since, until now we have not only forgotten its original location, but have inarguably altered our capacity to recreate its conditions on this planet. So what then does the sevenfold curse of God's divine wrath on our kind tell us about the nature of good and evil? if not about life itself. The sevenfold structure has been employed since the pre-Babylonian era in Chaldea in the form of the seven classical planets of antiquity and the Vedic era in India in the form of the seven chakras or nerve centers along the human spine and within one's brain. The addition to these of seven metals seems to be a later alchemical tradition the earliest biblical reference to a base seven system is this sevenfold curse from Genesis 3, 14 to 24, which ostensibly removes these base seven blessings and replaces them with a base seven set of curses instead. It is telling that the probable order for the application of these curses as they occur in the biblical text is exactly opposite the ascending order of the blessings being removed. 
such that the first of God's curses is against the serpent. Genesis 3.14 Corresponding to the Svatasthana Chakra and his last is for humanity to painfully labor, harvesting wheat to bake bread, that they may live and die as dust to dust until the end of our kind's days. Paraphrasing Genesis 3.19 And this corresponds to the Muladhara Chakra as usual with all my own diagrams, this order of assignations may be unique, but it also may be inaccurate in one or more details, or even else even possibly in its entirety. What can be said is that, following this point in the mythical history of our species, we have been continually perplexed by such base 7 and by other base 12 systems as well. Consider, for example, the seven vertex corners shared between a pair of tetrahedra at antipode, where one tetrahedron and another share only one such corner vertex point. Each tetrahedron has four such vertex points on its own, but when they join together they share one of these, and the result leaves seven in total. The reason we would consider the dual tetrahedron a suitable model for a tree of immortality from Eden, as opposed to the tree of knowledge we call the tree of life nowadays, is that it symbolizes a smaller, simpler subset in the same larger overall set to which the modern tree of life diagram of Kabbalah already belongs as well. That being to a set of polytopes that expands mathematically and geometrically in a naturally occurring format along a golden spiral concourse. Two nested or conjoined tetrahedra in a stellated octahedron shape are, given scale correspondence, able to fit perfectly into a single cube of equal dimensions. From thence one cube may double to two, as in the modern Tree of Life or Ancient Tree of Knowledge diagram, and continue expanding so on and so forth through the four-dimensional tesseract, or hypercube at 45 degrees, and on into the fifth-dimensional polytope correspondent to the square in 2D plane space, and so on and so forth, through at least the next five now plotted out dimensions. But let us return to the original tree of immortal life diagram that can now only rightly be attributed to traits as given here for a tree of death considering it is off limits to us now and barred from our ever again repossessing it by an angel with the flaming sword genesis 3:24 so here we see the seven vertex corners assigned the attributes of the seven hells and the twelve edges or paths between them left, as shown here, unlabeled. So we see the base seven system's original occurrence may be ancient in the extreme, even dating back to the earliest origins of the Homo sapiens species, and long passages have been composed as odes to this base seven system, ranging from the elder, confer Sepharaziel Valhamalek, to the newer, Confer Aleister Crowley 777. The base 7 system is older, in this context for the tree of immortality being a modern tree of death, than even the sevenfold vengeance of God smote down upon Adam and Eve at the exile. Hence, why God may have employed a base 7 curse in order to counter this 7 base blessing. So in comparing the dual tetrahedra, or stelloctahedral hypertetrahedron shape of the tree of immortal life, now a tree of death, structure to the dual cubic or conjoined hypercube shape of the tree of knowledge, now a tree of life, structure, what we find will prove to be the next step in evolution for these tree lattices into a hybrid species combining both into one. In short, the original tree of life, now called a tree of death, 
may be easily mounted onto the front and melded into the framework of the original tree of knowledge, now called a tree of life. The result combines the seven vertex cliffhoth of the tree of death and the ten sephirot emanations on the tree of life, as well as adds the amount of paths or edges connecting these points to one another together with each other, such that the twelve legs of the tree of death are added to the twenty-two paths on the tree of life. The result is a format that has capacity in the spaces on it for labeling no fewer than fifty traits or attributes. In short, it appears that the next evolutionary leap in comparing and contrasting the trees of life and death may be to combine them. Now if that is to be the case, let us proceed with the utmost caution, considering that the intervening millennia of human history, dividing us from Atlantis, contain ample examples of admonishment against allowing such divine knowledge to become corrupted and used for solely the gain of personal power. Here we can see how the tree of death in red may be combined with the tree of life in blue by adding the tree of death's four outer parallel vertex attributes to those of the tree of life's six. We bring the sum in the outer parallel columns to ten and by adding the tree of death's central three aspects to the four of the tree of life's middle pillar we arrive at a total of seven. Hence, instead of ten sephirot being divisible into three supernal over seven subtended emanations, we have the base ten sephirot added to the base seven planetary chakra system centrally. So we immediately see drastic changes becoming possible, and increasingly likely, in the assignation of traits and attributes to these lattice framework shapes. However, in essence, the structures themselves remain unchanged relative to one another and are simply here being combined to form a single, new, third form from both made into one. And here we can see how the dual tetrahedra of the Tree of Death are here shown as dual red outline squares with blue diagonals in the upper left corner. Let's arbitrarily assign their component pieces lengths of red, one unit, and blue, the square root of two, for the sake of compressing the tetrahedral depth into a flattened two-dimensional plane space. Here we next see the Tree of Life diagram constructed similarly, but from green outline squares also each of unit length 1, and blue diagonals of unit length square root of 2. In the lower right corner of this schematic model, we can see how combining these two models only requires performing a feat impossible given them both being solid objects in three-dimensional space, and that is, for them to overlap and be able to pass through one another, a feat that remains in flat two-dimensional conceptual plane space relatively easy. Simply insert the red squares of the tree of death between the green squares of the tree of life as shown. However, doing this using three-dimensional models would be quite a different endeavor. As we can begin to see, the angle at which we are perceiving this object also determines, to a very limited extent, a degree of optically illusory foreshortening, at least along the middle pillar of the tree of life, nevertheless. Here we see, on the right, a standard stick figure or linear array type diagram of this new form of a Kabbalah, formed as a hybrid synthesis between the tree of life and the tree of death, showing numerals for the ten sephirot and twenty-two paths on the tree of life, and for the seven hells and twelve paths on the tree of death. On the left, we see an expanded linear or bar array type diagram of the same, 
and in this model we can see the ten Sephirot and seven Hells, each named. The twenty-two paths on the Tree of Life, each symbolically signified as three alchemical phases, seven planets, and twelve signs of the zodiac, and the twelve paths on the Tree of Death, each numbered. Such was the basis of my research into this field around 2005 AD, as I began to formulate the initial array of this model, which I have since called the Jacob's Ladder Arrangement. Such is the basic model shown here. For the initial attributes I placed upon this lattice array and titled it thus Jacob's Ladder. The lowermost Sephiroth on the Tree of Life diagram, formerly attributable solely to Malkuth Kingdom, is now associated with the Muladhara Basal Chakra, lowest of the central seven. The uppermost Sephiroth on the Tree of Life diagram, formerly attributable solely to Kether Crown, is now associated with the Svadhisthana crown chakra, highest of the central seven. The remaining middle pillar Sephiroth and Cliffoth being both thus also occupied with the remaining five more chakras of Vedic Yoga. And lastly to the ten surrounding the central seven with five on each side are attributed the traits of the eight I Ching double hexagrams, plus a single Tao rod, broken, symbolic of Yang, where formerly Bina, understanding, was on the tree of life, and unbroken, symbolic of Yin, where formerly had been Chakma, wisdom, while the paths on both tree diagrams remain labeled by symbolic signs and by number. So we may see now, on this Jacob's Ladder arrangement, that although the same basic shapes may underlie the structural harmony, the placement relative to one another of traits assigned to these structures may be changed, in some cases radically. Again, in this array, as with all my works, I have tried to present as far advanced along a product as possible for me at the time that I make it, but in some cases minor, or even major, revisions are in order. Such was the case with this diagram, depicting a totally new age model of a Kabbalah by combining the tree of life and the tree of death into one model, and then throwing traits and attributes at it until I saw what stuck. The original version of this diagram was somewhat less clear in its color scheme and so, several years after my original design of it, in around 2006, I rehashed this diagram to include a more discernible color coding. Between the original and this re-envisioning, I changed none of the attributed traits besides giving it an updated paint job. The base seven traits on either side of, but outside of, the framework of the lattice structure relate to the seven chakras shown as arising along the central column or pillar. These relate the seven chakras to the base seven spectral color-coded relationships that can form inside of a closed psychic network or social setting. The symbols correspondent to each pair in these seven psychosocial states are a planet and sign or pair of signs from the zodiac round, and each color-coded level is also labeled with one of the Kabbalion seven hermetic axioms along the left column, and one of Dr. Tim Leary's seven-dimensional game model all along the right. And, with the powers of ten expanding upward from electrons on the left and planets on the right, to a brain on the left and the universe on the right, Inside the lattice diagram, the Tree of Death and Tree of Life are both assigned I Ching doubled hexagrams, or one of seven metals per cliffoth, and Sephiroth accordingly. The twelve paths on the Tree of Death being labeled by the eight Bagua I Ching trigrams, or one of five Vedic Tattvas, and the twenty-two paths on the Tree of Life 
being labeled with the twelve signs of the zodiac round assigned to the twelve diagonals, the seven planets to the eight verticals, and the horizontal bars being assigned to the remaining tattvas. In addition to these signs, all the traits and attributes on this entire and complete Jacob's Ladder array of Hakabalah are doubled with one of the fifty letters of the Vedic Sanskrit alphabet. Finally, the color coding of the paths is meant to underline the fact that there are now, in this combined model, thirty-six paths. So let us now dispense with the traits and attributes assigned to a Kabbalistical model of Jacob's Ladder and simply look at its basic, fundamental shape and form. Let us pause at this point to consider if we should go on, and if so, why, because beyond this point await only the dark arts. But, in truth, can even these sully the system of this base 17 point base 36 pathway model in itself? After all, one cannot blame the frame for the picture displayed in it any more than one could judge a book by its cover. Bearing this in mind, however, let it be said that I propose the following methodology of hoclephotic demonology solely in order to preempt anyone else less reserved from doing so first. Such a system as I am presenting and about to present here has direct relationship also to the fifty dead names of Marduk listed in the modern Simon Necronomicon, but derived therein from the same list given in the Babylonian Enuma Elish, as well as to the seventy-two Goetic demons of the lesser key of King Solomon, Shemham Farash-based grimoire. Because the fifty letters of Sanskrit may be mapped onto this chart, therefore so may be the fifty names of Marduk, and just so, because seventy-two is merely fifty, plus a doubling of the twenty-two foundation letter or tarot trump paths on the tree of life, so may be the seventy-two Goetia. Now, instead of all that is good and beneficial, useful and helpful in the world, let us look at the flip side of this model and see behind its veil of shadow to reveal that lattice's framework supporting instead all that is evil and harmful, futile, and wretched in this world. On this arrangement we see the tree of death hung upon the tree of life as in a usual Jacob's ladder array. However, in this model we see addended to the topmost Cliffoth cortex, that reverse to obverse Kether, on the tree of life aspect of the model, a triangle of summoning, and below the model, subtended beneath Nehema, cognate in this model to reverse Malkuth, is an inverse pentagram star. This is the so-called blind dragon arrangement, conjoining both the torturous serpent, Samael, the blind demiurge, and the slant serpent, Lilith the elder, or Lilith the black, Samael's bride, which is merely to say, combining both the Tree of Life and Tree of Death models into one. Here we may see that uncertainty, void, and chaos are the listed traits within the uppermost or peak triangle of summoning above the twin-headed or false gods Cliffoth on the reverse side of the Sephiroth Kether crown. Here we may also see that the ten reverse or adverse cortices, usually displaying the ten sephirot on the tree of life, instead here in the blind dragon array, display ten orders or types of demons, and the covenants laid forth for obeying God, given in the ten commandments. The twenty-two paths on the tree of life have all been replaced by Crowley's diagnoses of various minor bodily ailments, illnesses, and diseases in 777, as they corresponded to his Cliphotix genii sui generis, and then these have been arranged according to the order of the alphabetic substitution cipher indicated in that work 
to the various paths. The seven Clifoth Hells remain listed on the Tree of Death aspect of the Blind Dragon, but here and there also coupled to the seven venal sins, considered less mortal than breaking the Ten Commandments. The twelve paths on the Tree of Death are labeled according to twelve orders or types of demons, again according to Crowley's work 777. Subtended to the diagram is an inverse pentagram star, surrounded in a circle by the names of the five Edomite kingdom peoples who occupied Canaan prior to Israel. Such is the full extent of learning necessary about the blind dragon array to apply it to ritual magic systems theory. However, for deeper insights into this magical theoretic practice, here is also provided the Hebrew for the names of the ten demon kings over the reverse Sephiroth and the twenty-two genia of the Cliffoth sui generis of Aleister Crowley over the reverse paths. Also, the seven hells and twelve orders or types of demons are given in Hebrew on this arrangement. The entire result of this Hebrew script labeled Model of the Blind Dragon is called, rightly, the Saint Simon Array, named after Simon Magus, a notorious Hebrew magician of the first century A.D. Notably, the crime of simony within the Catholic Church relates to dealing in masses, or selling rank and official appointments in exchange for additional tithed donations. But what makes this model so averse or evil in this St. Simon arrangement form? In my work, The Tree of Death and the Cliffoth, I discuss at great length how the historical origins for the modern ten demon kings and ten subservient orders of demons beneath them relate each demonic ruler to either a fallen angel, a disfavored elder deity, an unpopular historical figure, etc., but all being later redactions of earlier empowerments conferred upon these same, now demonized characters. In short, these kings of hell are the fallen elder gods, called the rebel angels, the Sumerian pantheon, of the Anunnaki. Wielding the magical authority that knowing these blasphemous names commands is a responsibility for which most are yet unready. Consider again the potential for linking this tradition of pure evil to the parallel powers of the Goetic Shem Hamfarash, and one may be able to begin to comprehend why this power is likely too great for anyone to handle. Consider finally Crowley's own admonitions against insanity in his Initiated Interpretation of Ritual Magic, Introduction to the Goetia, where he compares evoking demons using sigil magic to using a telephone to dial up an otherwise dormant part of one's own brain. Take care and beware not to disturb the angry, demonic ghosts of those once living gods what they may awaken within you, you might not wish to know. Here, for example, we find the ten demon kings, arranged as a tetractus of one, the king, Satan, Moloch, above two, the queens, Nehemiah and Lilith, above three, jacks or demon princes, above four, the ace card per each elemental suit. Below these are the remaining attributes from the Blind Dragon or St. Simon arrangement, listed here as ten rows of traits per each of four columns, one per element. Hence a subtotal of fifty may be arrived at hereby. Taking these usual fifty traits on the Blind Dragon array as ten royal demon kings, etc., over forty subservient demonic servitors, and ending it here but to arrive at a sum of seventy-two traits being applied, all to one and the same model, being thus also correspondent to the Goetic Shemham Farash, all that remains for one to do so would be to add the names of Crowley's twenty-two Cliffoth Sui Generis 
as correspondent to his list of 22 diseases onto the 22 paths in this arrangement. So, in this final model we will be looking at in this session, we see the traits given as 22 trumps, 10 numbered cards of water, 10 of air, 10 of fire, and 10 of earth, plus 10 demon kings, for a grand total of 72 traits. Note bene, however, that to achieve the harmonious placement of all 72 traits onto this lattice framework's structure, five traits are attributed to a pentagram star subtended to the model, and six to the triangle of summoning that appears atop the blind dragon and St. Simon arrangements. Lastly, it should be noted also, these are only some possible permutations of combinations of traits attributed as correspondent to the vertex corners and edge pathways of the lattice framework's structure. Other arrangements of these same traits have been tried, but could always be retried, and even then tried again. There is no short supply of possible permutations for these given traits on this lattice structure. Other sketches in my collection, not included here, depict, of course, the fifty dead names of Marduk by their sigils in the Necronomicon, and the placement concurrent to these of, obviously, the seventy-two Goetic Shimham Farash, displayed according to their sigils given in the lesser key of King Solomon Grimoire as well. These documents may be forthcoming in a future work or not, but until then I feel this is more than a sufficient amount of esoteric speculation about a possible demonic magic system to pique the interest of any amateur, would-be, or starving occultists in this work's audience and to start them should they so wish it, off on the right foot in the right direction toward obtaining from these diagrams alone a system of practical ritual magic. The dangers of such a system, I should mention again, remain untold, yet potentially profound. Kabbalah, Session 8 what is the great secret of Kabbalah? As I have attempted to demonstrate thus far in this series, Kabbalah is robed in a manifold lattice of mysteries. There is disagreement over everything about it, from the number of ten or eleven emanations, to the arrangement of the twenty-two paths, and the structure of the tree of life itself. To this extent, a Kabbalah raises more questions than it answers, and seems to pose more problems than it solves. However, because the number of relative attribute traits is finite, and thus the myriad of shapes they may be presented upon is finite also, there must be a single, right combination of them all regardless of whether or not anyone ever agrees upon it being considered such. Thus, the great secret of Hakabalah is which arrangement of attribute traits onto which shape is the right and correct one out of all those possible. As for my own contributions, I have long favored the gras shape for the tree of life, and have studied various arrangements of the standard 32 mystical paths of wisdom upon this. It has long been understood there are 231 possible combinations of 22 total attribute traits. As such, this amount is called, in Sefer Yetzirah, the 231 Gates of Binah, the sum, 231, is arrived at by taking the integer 22 and squaring it for a total of 484, this being the total of all possible arrangements if all 22 variables could repeat. Next, one arrives at the Gauss sum for 22. 
adding 22 plus 21 plus 20 plus 19, etc., all the way down to 2 plus 1, which equals 253, this being the sum of all possible combinations if none of the variables repeat. Finally, we subtract 253 from 484 to arrive at 231, the final sum of all possible combinations subtracting all combinations without any repeating variables. The equation expressing this formula is n squared minus parenthesis n over 2 times 1 plus n close parenthesis. This means that out of 231 possibilities, only one possibility is absolutely right, and regardless of anyone ever finding it, there is no proper way to tell which one is definitely correct. This is the reason there are different orders for the alphabet. The best manner of expressing the attributes the letters count is shuffling them like cards. Randomized thus, there is clearly no single absolutely right linear order. Therefore, I propose this model for the 22 paths on the Gra model for the Tree of Life, labeled by the 22 trumps of a tarot card deck. If it is the single absolutely right and definitely correct model or not, may be impossible to ever ultimately determine. However, if it is inaccurate, it is only one of the 230 wrong options possible, and thus means little to nothing as such. I should also add, the basis for this arrangement is not mystical. It does not stem solely from the attributes of the tarot trumps, nor blossom forth roseate hues and tones of color correspondences based on the artistic expressions of these. It derives from using the same methodology of applying labels to lines that has been used to construct a Kabbalah since time immemorial. Just as each line or path of the tree of life of a Kabbalah corresponds thus to a tarot trump, each one of the 22 tarot trumps can be corresponded to one of 22 names and thus the same place on the Gra diagram may be occupied by a tarot trump title and or a name. As we can see here, the names of the twelve Anunnaki, the titans or rebel angels who judge from the underworld, and the seven Egigi, the terrestrial born Olympian demigods or Nephilim, may be placed onto this diagram as the twelve diagonal and seven vertical lines or paths. However, arriving at this arrangement out of the 231 possible is no simple straight line between a blank canvas and the placement of each trait where it is on the diagram. After all, there is a good reason that the moon, tarot trump cards, placement and the location of the Anunnaki moon deity, Kingyu, are not the same. It is for the same reason the moon tarot trump does not, in most modern tarot card decks, correspond to the Hebrew letter Beth, which in turn corresponds in classical Kabbalah to the moon among the seven Olympian dignities, or planets of antiquity. Each new order for the 22 attribute traits marks a new age in which the same traits are given new names and placed, literally, in a different order. Thus, what were the Sumero-Babylonian pantheon became the Hebrew demons of hell, and so the trumps of the Torah were designed many millennia later to symbolize the 
same archetypal attribute traits as the Sumerians had called their gods. Comparing one to the other is, as I have already endeavored to accentuate, relatively arbitrary and any validity impossible to determine. However, what must also be remembered is that the first and simplest attribute traits are the 22 letters, and all the rest of the possible attribute traits fall secondarily and so forth after the placement of these. The 22 letters are the Phoenician alphabet, translated into their equivalents in modern Hebrew letters. Thus, each of the 22 Hebrew letters corresponds to a number, given here is the Roman numeral of the tarot trump, to mark its place in order on a list, as well as to an attribute trait from ancient astrology these being the twelve houses or constellations of the ecliptic zodiac, the seven planets of antiquity, and the three alchemical phases of matter expressed as salt, mercury, and sulfur. So the placement of the tarot trumps is secondary behind the placement of the earlier Sumerian deities, which is based in turn on the placement of the correspondent Hebrew letters, and each of these is given a gematria number and astrophysical sign as well. Each of the 22 original Hebrew letters was also said to have a magical image, and these are listed as correspondent to the letters along with the number where they occur in a list and each one's relative astrophysical sign. When cross-referenced with the 36-letter alphabet of Egyptian hieroglyphic monoliterals, or single-sound letter symbols, it may be found these 22 magical images each corresponds to a certain one of the Egyptian hieroglyphic images as well. Thus, even though the phonetic sound expressed by the Egyptian hieroglyphic and the phonetic sound expressed by the Phoenician Hebrew letter may not be the same sound. There is a correspondence between the letter given from Hebrew and the hieroglyphic given from Egyptian. Thus, all these attribute traits may be summed up as relating to one another in a variety of different ways. And, then, these arrangements of relationships between them all may be depicted as lines or paths along the Tree of Life diagram as a metaphor. At this point, we may find the traditional manner of depicting these attribute traits upon this visual form less logically satisfactory than simply making a single list of them all in the order they should be seen to occur. Just as there is a single correct and right placement for each attribute trait on the Tree of Life diagram, there must be one such list. In a list, the placement of the attribute traits relative to one another on the tree of life shape is less obvious. However, it is also possible, in this format, to provide a much larger sum of possible attribute traits to be assigned. Here we may see a chart that lists, thus, the 22 lines or paths on Hakabalah's Tree of Life as 22 rows and expresses the various different names and titles associated with these that have arisen in different places and eras across the globe as a series of 16 columns of different possible lists for these correspondent attribute traits. The 16 columns may be seen as divided into eight simple columns on the left and eight complex columns on the right. The eight columns on the left are labeled thus from left to right along the top. The first is R hashtag or royal number associated to the next column's titles being those from the Tarot Trumps. 
Following this, the third column is labeled APZ, or Alchemy, Planet, Zodiac, Signs. The fourth column gives the so-called magical image, or symbol, associated with the earliest Phoenician letters, and the fifth column gives the Egyptian hieroglyphic correspondent to these. The sixth column gives the gematria sum of each correspondent Hebrew letter from the order they occur in the usual modern Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew letters corresponding to these gematria sums, etc., appear next in the seventh column, and finally in the eighth column on the left side appear the Greek letters as seven vowels and twelve consonant pairs. Again, take note that the phonetic sounds associated with these Greek letters do not equate necessarily to those made by the correspondent Hebrew letters, nor to those made by the Egyptian hieroglyphics. These represent different phases of development of these same basic systems that took place in different geographical regions at different ages of historical time. The symbol and hieroglyphics being the oldest from around 8,000 years ago, followed by the Hebrew letters and their gematria sums from around 6,000 years ago, followed by the Greek from around 4,000 years ago, by the tarot trumps and their royal count from some 2,000 years ago, and finally to the shorthand notation of symbols we use to express the astrophysical signs today. In the columns to the right, we find a more complex grouping of attribute traits. These begin on the right with the twelve Zibalba gods and seven houses of the Mayan Popol Vu, and, proceeding leftward, we progress backwards across the aeons of recorded historical time next to the twelve apostles and seven churches of early Christianity. In the third column in from the right, we find listed seven Sethites, over twelve tribes, and these are the seven pre-deluge patriarchs from Seth, son of Adam, to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah, and the twelve tribes of Israel, named for the twelve sons of Jacob. To the left of these we find the fourth column, labeled seven Nephilim over twelve generations, these being the seven generations born to the lineage of Cain prior to the deluge that supposedly destroyed them all, and the twelve generations being those from Noah to Abram, whom changed his name to Abraham on behest of his Elohim, the Lord God. To the left of this list, in the fifth column back, we find twelve archons over seven powers, listed in the Gnostic era hypostasis as having ruled before mankind became a species of our own, and including Cain and Abel the firstborn sons of Adam and Eve. Next, we find the twelve Sumerian Anunnaki and their seven Igigi demigod counterparts in the sixth column. The twenty-one fallen angels, listed in the apocryphal Book of Enoch in the seventh, and in the eighth and final column we find the seven archangels of the days of the week and the seven camia. Now, the seven camia appear listed such that each planet they symbolize is represented twice, except for the sun and moon. Thus, five camia appear twice, and those of the sun and moon appear only once each. The entire chart if each of the complex columns is measured as an aeon of 2,000 years apiece, can extend from the year 2000 A.D. back to 18,000 years ago. 
Of course, the expression of the greatest sum of attribute traits can best be accomplished only using the format of cards. Each card acts like a door or gateway leading to a path or line on the Tree of Life map of Hakabalah. The 22 trump cards of Tarot thus may be used as a platform onto which may be assigned a border of attribute traits around a central attribute trait to total an odd number of attribute traits per each card. In this arrangement, we see ten of the Tarot trumps above, five cards over five, and twelve below, six over six. Each depicts centrally an Egyptian hieroglyphic, and each has a border around its edge assigning eight attribute traits to it. From below each central hieroglyphic, around this bordering edge counterclockwise, we begin with the symbol, or magical image, depicted by each hieroglyph, and proceed next to the signs from astrology or alchemy that we find in the lower right corner of each card. From there we move upward along the right side edge, to come to the Mayan deities and house names given from the Popol Vuh. In the upper right corner, we find the Hebrew letter associated with each attribute trait. The topmost center label gives us the title of the Toro Trump associated with each. In the upper left corner, we find the Gematria sum associated with the Hebrew letter from the modern order of the Hebrew alphabet. Along the left edge we have the names of the Sumerian deities, the twelve Anunnaki, associated by the Sumerians with planets, and subsequently with the twelve houses of the astrological zodiac round, and the seven Igigi, or Enlilites, associated by the Sumerians with terrestrial half-breed gods and subsequently with the Olympians attributed to the then-known planets of classical antiquity. In the lower left corner is given the Greek vowel or consonant pair that is affiliated thus. It should be noted here that there are three cards without correspondent deities from the Mayan or Sumerian pantheons and these appear on the top row on the left and rightmost ends and in the middle. These cards correspond to the Hebrew mother letters Aleph, Mem, and Shin. In my own Jacob's Ladder arrangement, it is possible to map not only the 32 mystical paths of wisdom, given on the standard Tree of Life diagram, but also the Seven Hells and Twelve Curses on the Tree of Death diagram as well. When the dual tetrahedron of the Tree of Death and the dual cube of the Tree of Life are combined into the Jacob's Ladder arrangement, as we see here, a total of 72 traits may be obtained by doubling the traits assigned to the ten emanations, subtending a pentagram of five traits, and crowning the model with the triangle, labeled by six traits more. The labels of these traits seen here, however, are not the same as those on the usual Jacob's Ladder arrangement. Instead, each attribute trait is labeled by a pair of either a letter and a number, or a number and a symbol, one for each of the four terrestrial elements, fire, earth, air, and water. The letter T, in this context, stands for Tarot Trump Card, and the letter Q for Queen, A for Ace, J for Jack, and K for King. Such is the Tree of Life component of this model 
of the Jacob's Ladder diagram explained. Now the Tree of Death, the Subtended Pentagram, and the Supernal Triangle are all labeled according to a chart that lists the four elements as columns and ten attribute traits apiece as rows. Thus, in total, 40 attribute traits are given as number symbol pairs and 32 as letter number pairs. Just as with attribute traits assigned to the Tree of Life, the assignation of these attribute traits to the Jacob's Ladder arrangement here is likewise ultimately arbitrary but finite and therefore there is at least one though perpetually ineffable yet correct pattern for these traits on this array nevertheless there are in turn 72 attribute traits placed on 50 linear paths and vertex emanations and thus no short supply of possible solutions to this puzzle. This arrangement of these traits I offer here is only one possible out of a great many and should not necessarily be seen as anything above and beyond being arbitrary at best. I present it and the accompanying chart to decoding its labeling here only as a means of convenience in corresponding all attribute traits on these Jacob's Ladder model depictions. Lastly, before we examine the chart for deriving the encryption seen here for each attribute trait, let us pause to consider that the lattice shape of the Jacob's Ladder array provides a total of 51 possible locations for labels, including all native paths and emanations. In this model, we see 50 of these are used at least once, but that 11 of them are used twice, and there are also added to this sum the pentagram of 5 more and triangle of 6 more, bringing the total of all up to 72 possible placements for attribute traits on the model. Now, as we shall be seeing next in these models, it is possible however unwieldy, to present not only 72 attribute traits on this shape when the pentagram and triangle are included, but double that sum, 144 traits in total. Now let us look at the chart that determines the code used in the Jacob's Ladder model. Here we can see, on the left above, a tetractus depicting the ten emanations that served as doubled attribute traits on the Tree of Life portion of the Jacob's Ladder. At the top is the One King, below this the Two Queens, below which we find the Three Jacks, and lastly four Aces. Beneath each Ace is labeled one of the four terrestrial elements in the order left to right, water, air, fire, earth. Again, the exact order of these elements is malleable and insignificant and serves here only as a convenient placeholder for the four columns as the four suits in a standard deck of cards. As mentioned previously, we find a list of ten sums on the left and these label ten rows that cross across the four columns to form a matrix of forty attribute traits. So on the left we have the forty plus ten equals fifty attributes and on the right we have the list of twenty-two traits and so altogether we have a list of seventy-two total attribute traits. Instead of each trait being labeled with a number letter or number symbol pair, here each attribute trait is labeled by a pair of number sums, the one to the left followed by a dot, 
and the one to the right by a parenthesis. These numbers relate to traits I shall be referencing in another lecture in much greater detail, but suffice it to say for here and now that they are coordinate pairs needed to bring the total sum of all attribute traits up from 72 to 144. At this point it should also be noted that 72 times 2 equals 144, that 72 times 3 equals 216, and that 72 times 5 equals 360. These sums are all integral in the separation of a unit circle into the standard degree system of 360 degree divisions. The list of 22 attribute traits along the right side of this chart is labeled not with a pair of number sums, but with a number sum and a letter. These 22 number letter pairs will comprise the 22 paths or lines on the tree of life. Then the 10 emanations thereof will be doubled to include the labels of the tetractus. In this manner, all 144 individual number sums or letters will be used once, although at least two will be used in each area, path, or emanation, and most will have four individual number sum labels. So here we see the Jacob's Ladder diagram, modeled with the 144 individual number sums and letters. The pentagram at the base has 10 labels, and the triangle at the top has 12, subtotaling 22 labels. 10 emanations have 4 labels each, subtotaling 40. 22 paths are labeled each with a letter number pair, subtotaling 44. And the rest of the 38 traits are labeled as 19 pairs of number sums in each remaining area, with only one trait repeating as a label on two paths. The purpose of presenting this model in such a complexly encrypted code is to prevent it from being pursued too deeply by idiots who would wish to abuse its potential for confusing the minds of other people to make themselves feel unduly superior. As such, this complex code is absolutely necessary to be able to refer to the material I am about to lay out in an encrypted format. One would absolutely not want to cast pearls before swine by sharing this material openly and in an unencrypted format, because it would lead to an unpleasant and invasive line of questioning from anyone who might happen to see it. For now, at least, let us pause to consider this model of the Jacob's Ladder, loaded up with 144 letters and number sums, as being the ultimate expression of complexity, now known for the usual Tree of Life model of Kabbalah. The Tree of Life is more, after all, than merely its shape and thus it defies comparison to other models, such as the flower of life or other fractal extrapolations, based on shape alone. The tree of life is also a set of labels, these corresponding to each part on the overall geometry of the model, and thus it provides description for a deck's worth of different variables. The standard array of the Jacob's Ladder provides areas for at least 72 and at most around 144 labels. This makes its usefulness in relating large sums of variables to one another into a meaningful relationship transparently clear and apparent. The soul is only the accumulation of karma of an individual free spirit manifest in its aura. It was this that was believed by the ancient Egyptians to have been weighed against a feather of mat 
at the time of an individual's death. Now, there have been studies on the metaphysics of ethics since the beginning of recorded history. The idea of karma originates from the Indus River Valley and the idea of ethical legislation derives from the peoples of the Tigris and Euphrates River Valleys who brought the Nubians out of cannibalism according to Egyptian texts. In the East the school of karma arose to develop its own ideas of right and wrong behaviors based on trial and error with natural consequences. In the West, the school of ethical legislation adopted as its scales the Manichaean dualism of good and evil. The occult school on the underworld, or the afterlife, is based on viewing archetypes as like business establishments known by their names and all things including their own souls and other people as mere collages of karma so much property to be occupied by advertisements for information according to this Gnostic belief the soul decays much like the body will eventually decay such that the physical body itself is equivalent to the microbacterial organisms maggots and worms that digest the divested corporeal remains the longer we live the more damage it does to our souls however these are merely vessels meant to carry us so far before we move on into another form. Kabbalah extends upward and outward above and beyond the regular surface of time space that conforms to whatever geometry open, flat, or closed that governs the universe causing the observed expansion of space-time. These are the histories of the gravitational singularities that, from distortion toward them of multidimensional wormholes through hyperspace, project out as vast spirals beyond the speed of all photons. They expand through dimension as the torus of time-space gradually involutes all its continuous substance through itself leaving it behind and measuring first a vast cone inside another torus which can be measured as a hypertetrahedron. From this can be extrapolated the next level of geometry occupied exclusively by the fourth temporal dimension and this complexity of structure can be represented as a hypercube metaform. These continue on through the rest of the platonic solids as hypershapes and measure a ubiquitous phi over pi gnomonic spiral throughout them all that continues even beyond them into yet unknown geometries. Thus, it is not only this itself that we are, for here is recorded the history of the time-space from which our immortal souls come, but through this that we must pass once again when we leave the vestments of incarnation within this universe behind. Our spirit is like a free-floating temporal singularity that passes perpendicular into the multiverse or through a gravitational singularity outside into Yalem. From here we seek our own origins by applying our understanding of the geometric rules of dimension just as we do our inherent physical understanding of the rules of physics in the local universe. This is the path trodden by Yadevade, for in that these things might be, they may be of and for him, for they are truly the rule of Kabbalah 
and this has long been thought the rule of Yadhe Vadhe. The official story of the origin of the Kabbalah is that it was the message engraved on the first tablet of testimony brought down by Moses from Mount Sinai and smashed upon his finding his people worshipping a brazen idol. According to the story, Moses went back up to the top of Mount Sinai and came back down again later with two different stone tablets, these containing the Ten Commandments, the first of which guarded against the keeping by the people of any brazen idols. As with many sites in the Middle East, which has adhered as much as possible to the economic status and social structures of biblical times, a site for Mount Sinai has been selected by archaeologists, geographers, and historians, both internal to the sovereign nation wherein is the chosen mountain, as well as international experts. This was done by Muslim sultans and Catholic Templars to increase tourism. However, it occurred well before the scientific method was adopted to keep record of the reasons for such things. Similarly, Mount Ararat in modern Turkey is supposed to house the last of the wooden planks and rusted iron nails of the real Noah's Ark, covering a vast, flat plain on one side of the mountain's otherwise sheer drops and craggy faces. Most of the archaeology done in the Middle East is as much based on superstition as the prophecies written by those ancient scribes that used to gaze at the fires of Megiddo. Other than this, no archaeological evidence whatsoever exists to substantiate this biblical story. According to the Jews of Ethiopia, they are in possession of the Stone of Testimony, and it is a flat rock which they parade around annually under a sheet. Any collection of evidence to substantiate this, however, is barred by the seemingly perpetual governmental insanities of East African politics. When considering the history of Kabbalah, it is important to consider several separate things as related to one another. This means following the history not only of the stones upon which Kabbalah is said to have been engraved, but also the keepers and the meaning of the oral tradition of its heritage. These can be thought to include the scribes and rabbis who have written on this subject. However, the details of their lives are meant to be sorted out as much as possible, when possible, since it is the belief that when a person is studying the Kabbalah, it is really God studying God. Trance channelers, remote viewers, astral travelers, psychics, precognitives, and prophets have difficulty seeing ahead in time, beyond a date in the near future, thought to begin after December 21, 2012 on the Gregorian calendar, as if there were some giant wall of ice or gravity well reflecting only what they project from their present upon the future. There is a similar difficulty in examining the past, since history is always changing, and each generation knows more about the world than the previous generation. In truth, we are each given the same infinite potential understanding, and it is only in what we reflect back on our realities that makes our mark on this dustbin that is history. However, the soul is only free of stupidity in the same way that the mindless body is free of intelligence, and so we see that, while all minds might well think alike the greatest, it remains actually only a few people that can contribute themselves in this regard to history as having freely known beside infinite nothing. 
Therefore, at the time of the writing of the rabbinic scholars of Muslim Spain regarding the origins of the Kabbalah in the biblical story of Moses and the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai, it is not thought to have been known that Cro-Magnon man in the Lascaux caves in nearby France had hundreds of millions of years ago used various ground minerals herbs and berries applied to the walls of the cave to depict the same figure of a bull and that concurrently in america cro-magnon man had left carvings of pie spirals on rocks similar to those thought to have been made by australopithecine hominids in the australian savannah even if the rabbinic scholars were being allegorical it is still correct to address the actual evidence of ancient learning rather than subscribe to those beliefs that comprised it the history of humanity is recorded in stones from the date of the earliest hieroglyphic tags on small stones representing the oldest known writing the linear A and B, cuneiform alphabets of the Sumerians impressed with river reeds on clay tablets, to even earlier in the building of Stonehenge, and the ancient depictions of game animals and shamanic hunters on the walls of the earliest human cave communities. The history humanity has kept to describe itself to communicate its beliefs to itself, to preserve its metaphysics, has always been recorded for all time. There is much human life that floats by in the intervening millennia, like so much water under the bridge, whose works for the survival of and contributions to the communal societies goes mostly forgotten by their own descendants and it is true that even the date of such monumentally important inventions as the wheel cannot be known for this reason what little is known of this ancient civilization remains only in its ruins here we find not only carved stones such as those from ica in peru depicting knowledge not only of the skeletal structure but also the visceral physiognomy of a pterodactyl, and cave paintings such as those at Lascaux depicting early human animism, but also the vast megalithic pyramids of China and Marabeca, South America, which have largely worn away to only very large burial mounds, as well as the vast ancient canals of South America, and the number of sunken cities off the coasts of modern shorelines. This period in history is marked by such great edifices as the Bimini Road, as much as by the flint-chipped arrowhead or the Atlatl. It is by the presence of the ancient petroglyphs, those edifices that remain in stone, such as America's Stonehenge, recently called Mystery Hill, the Stonehenge of England, and the ancient temple mounds of China, Europe, and Oceania, as well as chipped arrow and spear points, carved stone pipes, and the carved stones of Australia and America, as well as that of the ancient geoglyphs, such as the Nazca Lines, the giant hunter and serpent mounds of England, and the South American canals, that we can identify the presence of global Stone Age civilization. Thus, here is where we must look for the origins of Kabbalah. For, if Kabbalah is a truth to be known beyond mankind, then it would have existed already before it could have been earliest discovered, like a flower awaiting cross-pollination. It is true that all of these features of ancient history are only now so much dust blowing in the whirlwind of time. However, this whirlwind itself is phi over pi. The meaning of the symbols and relationships we can observe represented in ancient petroglyphs and geoglyphs 
may have been as mysterious to the people who crafted them as it is to the majority of people today. However, we can see that there was clearly an astronomical predilection, as many of the megaliths are either maps of the heavens according to animist or anthropomorphic constellations, or markers to measure the place relative to the horizon at different times of year of different heavenly bodies and there are pi and phi spirals depicted the world over. Of the first type, we can conclusively include the Nazca lines as representing the Peruvian constellations attributed to the stars in their southern hemisphere, as well as the Great Hunter and Serpent Mounds of England, Stonehenge in England, Karnak in France, and Mystery Hill in America, as well as literally millions of other Neolithic sites, represent alignments of stones to measure the place in the heavenly hemisphere of various celestial bodies, and to mark the time of certain seasonal events. The later Great Pyramid of Giza also contains numerous such alignments in its architecture, However, it is unknown if other more ancient pyramids, such as those in China and Marubeka, which have deteriorated into mounds, served the purpose of making similar such celestial measurements. Pi and Phi spirals can be found carved into and painted on rocks and caves in Australia, Asia, Europe, Africa and the Americas. Then there are some that may only be cultural, such as the megalithic heads of Easter Island. It is thought that, because some of this civilization was lost when the coastline changed at the end of the last ice age, many of its original records were destroyed. Most civilizations, from the level of the most superstitious tribes people of Africa, to the most refined religiosity of Europeans, share a common myth about a flood and a savior who bore the seeds of the new civilization aloft the waves on a boat. Thor Heyerdahl has proven that even the modern Peruvians, who live much the same way their most ancient ancestors did, can construct a seafaring ship of reeds and therefore could have crossed either the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. Another modern theory derives from recent translations of the lost books of Inky, and describes how the Earth has been nurtured by extraterrestrial entities in spaceships. In either event, the moral of the story is best expressed by Pontius Pilate washing his hands of moral responsibility for Jesus. While most of the world's myths of the Flood and the Great Civilizer remain insubstantiable, the history of events described in the Lost Books of Enki, as well as other ancient Sumerian clay tablets, do survive to describe the history of a particular stone called the Ram, or what would become the Table of Testimony, upon which they set down a record of the history of all of civilization. This was described as being two stone pillars secreted away in an underground chamber accessed by a river through cavernous tunnels in the labyrinth beneath the Giza Plateau by the Greek scribe Solon, who was told that they were from Atlantis. It is thought that it was this same stone or stones held by the hands of the historical Moses. All modern religions started with the early practice of savage petro rites. This consisted largely, as testified to by Moses, of the worshipping of graven idols and the making of blood sacrifices to them. These stone deities were largely thought to represent the weather, the chief, or some other desired person or object. Human sacrifices were gradually replaced in the cultures of oldest ethical legislation, 
However, the practice of voodoo, animal, and even human blood and murder rituals perpetuates to this day. These times, now steeped in mystery due to the subsequent repression of dogma by the Judeo-Christian descendants of the earliest ethical legislators, have been called by modern occultists the age of the mother or the moon because of the insanity associated with the moon and because of the blood of monthly menstruation. The records of history of most of these types of civilization have been lost and must be pieced together again by their sheepish conquerors in order to decipher their original meanings to the original ancient practitioners. Perhaps the best way to understand the impact that Stone Age civilization had on ancient humanity is expressed in the I Ching, where we see even the simple act of counting yarrow rods transcended by a complex hierarchical referential system based on number sequences that include the 384 and a fourth night lunar calendar. Understanding Kabbalah is only understanding the ancient hominid who conceptualized counting using externalized material manifest memory referentials. One equals one, two equals two, three equals three, four equals four, and thus are there ten. Even this simple counting game can be used to explain the exponential expansion of vertices in regular shapes per dimension, such that the more intersecting planes come together at the point or corner of a regular three-dimensional shape, such as the five platonic solids, the more faces they will have, and the more edges these faces will have. This axiom continues through all dimensions geometrically, though in the fourth spatial dimension, for example, it is possible for four plane faces to intersect at each corner point, rather than only three, as with the three-dimensional platonic solids, and so on in direct relationship. Here we see that, as with the caveman, a line drawn between the fourth dimensional connection of four sides, the third dimensional connection of three sides, the second dimensional connection of two sides, and the first dimensional connection of all the sides in a singular point, represented by the line itself, measures a ten-sided shape. Some of the earliest records of history describe the sacred stone of the ram being used as an energy source and a clay jar containing an iron rod in a citrus alkaline suspension has been found in Sumeria, possibly dating back 4,000 years, that is still capable of generating a one-volt electrical charge. The mythology is unclear and incomprehensive. However, a liberal summation of events might be to say that, at some time before the building of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Stone of Ram was brought out of Sumeria and the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley area, and into Egypt and the Nile River Valley area. It has been theorized that such a stone as this was used in a way now unknown inside the chambers of the pyramid to power a massive hydroelectric pump built into the design of the pyramid. Curlian photographs of stones from the Giza pyramids show a strong aura, with even more bolts of charged energy being emitted invisibly from them than the average human hand. There are high amounts of radioactivity deposited around the Dead Sea area northeast of Egypt that trace back, according to radiocarbon dating, 
to at least 4,000 years ago as well. Also, it has long been known to English dowsers that some of the ancient petroglyphs are charged with leyline energy fields that overlap underground rivers, and the Irish still kiss the Blarney Stone for good luck and love. The legends of the ram, being used as a power source, also describe the shamir, or stone that cuts stone. While many modern theorists can provide possible explanation using Brown's gas for high temperature heating, or possibly water pressure to account for high-speed drilling, none of these can fit the account of the Shamir, which was described as being capable of cutting through the toughest of stones, even the hardest of diamonds, without friction, heat, or noise. According to legend, the Shamir could not be stored in any iron vessel or metal container because it would burst through such an enclosure. This sounds similar also to the effects described by Moses as being possessed by the Ark of the Tabernacle housing the Stone of the Ten Commandments, that it could stop armies, or to the power imbued to the trumpets of the army of Joshua when they brought down the Jericho city wall. It is true that the stone bricks of the Giza pyramids are not only measured to within one millionth of an inch, they are cut this exactly as well, and show not even a hair's breadth deviation from their alignments. Considering that many of them weigh as much as ten tons, and considering that there are more than a few thousand stones used in the construction of the pyramids, one must wonder at the precision tools that must have been used that could have made such infinitesimal intricacies of ideality that even modern laser and diamond drills cannot match. At Machu Picchu in South America, there are also stones quarried to this precision fit so that there is not even a micron of space between them. And here we see that the stones are irregular shapes, beveled down to fit together, and that some of them weigh even more than ten tons. One can imagine the masses of workers that constructed the Great Pyramid at Giza, and who are buried in the smaller neighborhood of pyramids in its shadow, willing to have built the great monument, if only for want to be able to meditate upon their own grave. Imagine Imhotep, seated in lotus position, on the flat stone lid of the sarcophagus in the king's chamber, solemnly fixed on contemplation of himself being lowered into the pit, and his third eye being freed into the heavens. Such confirmation as this is given by Hermes to his son over the tables of the eighth and the ninth, and this would progress mithril worshipping, bull jumping, into Zarathustrian prodigal son, Baptist, Coptic, and Gnostic sects. The dilemma is general to live, though dead, to be beyond, and yet still be around, to be remembered well, and to forget the self. Yet none of us is born in control of these traits of our fate. The bending of our circumstances into accord with our will is called the work of karma, and it is this that amounts to an individual's control over their destiny. In the East, where this model comes from, it has long been believed that the best type of behavior for clearing one's mind of the consciousness of karma is meditative trance. There they believed that karma carried over from one life to the next, and that meditation prepared us for the moment of our death. The Egyptians believed that karma was weighed at the time of death to determine if a spirit was free of having to reincarnate again. Later, the Christians believed that knowledge of, and faith in, their Lord alone would forgive all their sins and gain them entry into heaven. 
the free and associated masons use as symbols the craft tools and implements of stone masonry to represent the moral work that transforms the karma of one's soul. While not all of these derive from the stone of Ram, all have become associated with the mystical study of Kabbalah. Kabbalah has become identified with karma itself, as well as the tools with which to work upon it, and the desired goal thereof. Kabbalah is the object of concentration for much trance meditation, and has been equated by occultists as the Western version of the Eastern Tao of Qi, or Way of All Energy. Because of this, Kabbalah has even become associated with meditation upon one's own mortality. All of this is described in the first three initiatory degrees of masonry. It is true to say that the financial token exchange reward-based trade economy is as old as civilization itself. In Sumeria, many of the oldest written records describe financial transactions for goods or services, such as bills and receipts, inventories, and prices of merchandise for sale, and financial holdings accounts, usually for the purpose of kingly taxation on the properties of the people in exchange for their protection by the guards of the city and armies of the sovereign lands. At the same time, the ethical legislations levied out by the king or the court began to be recorded also, making them a truly open society in terms of exposing corruption. Their laws, mostly revolving around protection of and accumulation of material properties, even including wives and slaves, were extremely stringent, and it is from one of the most ancient books of ethical proceedings that derives the saying, an eye for an eye. Perhaps the longest lasting of these harsh people are less important than property sort of laws was the practice of cutting off the hand of a thief, and this practice is made mention of in Masonic dogma. It is not true to say, however, that all of civilization has been based on the token exchange economy. Concurrent to ancient Sumeria's rise in the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys, the Hindu caste system arose as the social code of civilization in the Indus River Valley. This system was based on classes, much like those described by Plato in his Ideal Republic. There was a slave class, a merchant class, a soldier class, a priest class, and a ruling class. Each of these classes served the next class up, and within each there was a social hierarchy or chain of command as well. Both of these only represent the earliest modalities of ethical legislation, and, as I have made mention before, both began as patro rites, sacrificial cultures. As surely as Christ said, Let you who is without sin cast the first stone, so has ethical legislation progressed much since ancient times. The subject of the law was meditated upon by Confucius, Moses, and Aristotle, each who began different philosophical schools on the ethical, social legislation of karma. Just as Moses contributed the Kabbalah, so did Confucius the yin and yang of the I Ching, and Aristotle recapitulate the idea of the five regular ideal solids. In so far as all of these meta objects integrate as models describing the right proper ethic of karma, so too has this been grasped and understood by all those who have worked with and studied it.
Anyone who has perceived Yelem as the Tao of Chi, opened the third eye of the Ajna, or extrapolated karma and integrated Kabbalah, understands that this forever flows, ineffable to the apprehension. As Thales said, you cannot even step in the same river once. To anyone who has studied karma as information collage, this is the saturation effect of samsara, or sorrow, the symptom of wisdom. Since we have defined Kabbalah as the meditation of ethics upon one's own death, we can see now why it can come at first only in small and fleeting doses, as the concerns of surviving take precedence instead, and why it can only come through meditation that brings these concerns over the ongoing flow of one's karma to an end. Kabbalah, similar to the Buddhist Samadhi, or Hindu nirvana is death to karma. As much as concerns over karma are one's ethics of life, Kabbalah is the trance of ego death that opens one to awareness of the higher ethics of the free spirit. Just as karma is perpetually attracted to the static field of our electromagnetic auras, so is the true self above and beyond this function of incarnate existence and flies from it just as karma flows. This has manifested itself in the history of the actual stone of Ram repeatedly and again the first three initiatory degrees of Freemasonry describe the event archetypally. According to the oldest traditions, the Stone of Ram contained a written account of history that dated back to the times of civilization before the last Ice Age. It might have contained the descriptions given in the lost books of Enki, which describe events in the heavens that would also be mirrored by the events described by Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Whether either of these is factually accurate, representationally allegorical, or fictional contrivance has been lost to history. These were given by Inki to the recording scribe to carry out of Ur. We are told that the name given to Abraham means he who has Ram, or the Stone of Ram, also known as the Tablet of Testimony. The Bible accounts how he left Ur in ancient Mesopotamia, where he had lived after meditating upon an upright sacrificial stone in the wilderness, where he tended his herds and experiencing transcendence in the presence of the Lord he called El, whom he made his Elohim, or chosen God. Around this same time in Egypt, the vizier, court magician, and grand architect for the first pharaonic dynasty was a man named Imhotep. We are told about him that he designed both the earliest step pyramids of Djoser and the Great Pyramid of Giza for two different kings, and that his successor, the man who designed and oversaw the building of the second, lesser pyramid at Giza, was named Ptahhotep. Since the style of pyramid building he used combined architectural styles both of Nubian burial pyramids, as we can see corrected in the so-called Bent Pyramid, and of Sumerian palace ziggurats 
as we can see with the above ground interior rooms of the larger later pyramids. It is speculated that Imhotep had traveled to both these lands. According to Plato, writing as Socrates, he had heard by word of mouth from an old scribe named Solon, who had been initiated into the ancient Egyptian mystery cult in his youth. There were two pillars carved of orichalque on a small island in an underground grotto, connected by tunnels of rivers in a labyrinth under the Giza Plateau that contained, written on them in a language he could not understand, a history of the world and of civilization. The Egyptian who accompanied him told him that they were from Atlantis. We are told that the name given to Moses means saved from water, and that it was by parting the Red Sea that he led the Hebrews out of Egypt. This event probably describes the Hyksos Rebellion under Akhenaten, following that pharaoh's attempt to institute solar monotheism when he and his people were forced out of Egypt by the priests and viziers of the mystery cult. The Bible recounts that Moses received the Tablet of Testimony on Mount Sinai, brought down the original Kabbalah, and smashed it when he found his followers worshipping a golden bull. The story does not end there, however. According to legend, the stones of the Ten Commandments were carried around in the Ark of the Tabernacle until the Hebrews entered Canaan and slaughtered the native peoples. After establishing a royal bloodline as king, the Hebrews began work on the first temple to be dedicated and consecrated to the Elohim of Abraham. The Ark of the Covenant was kept in the Holy of Holies at the center of the temple, and various other Hebrew treasures were placed in the hollow columns called Jachin and Boaz that marked the entry. At the time of the Babylonian captivity, the first temple was destroyed down to its foundations, and most of the contents of Jachin and Boaz, though eventually returned, were looted by the rulers of Assyria. At this time, according to the Kebra Nagas, a holy book of Ethiopia believed to be a genuine apocrypha of the Old Testament, Menelik, the mulatto son of Solomon with the queen of Sheba, took the holy stones from their enclosure in the Holy of Holies before the destruction of the temple and returned with them to his home of Ethiopia. The Jews of Ethiopia claim that the stones reside there to this day, although they were recently moved from a lone monastery on the Aswan Lake at the source of the Nile into a larger city. There is no question that, just as the stone of record was revered by ancient civilizations, so were the stone megaliths revered by ancient peoples as long ago as the last Ice Age, when modern Homo sapiens lived side by side with communities of Cro-Magnons in Europe, the Middle East, and America. It is even possible that construction on the carving of the stone that would become the head of the Egyptian Sphinx was begun much earlier by a different species of human beings altogether, and that the explanation for its forward-sloping lower jaw is not meant to represent either a bearded man nor the face of a cat or any other kind of animal, but the long, sloping face of the Australopithecine and Neanderthal peoples who lived millions of years before modern humans. There can be no doubt that whoever were their Neolithic builders such sites as Stonehenge have long remained sacred to the indigenous peoples and were used as ancient sites for worship and prayer, as I have described was true for Abraham 
as well as for communal meetings such as the formation of social circles where people congregated from distant regions to share news and trade goods with one another. Thus the message of the law encoded on the ram, as well as the astral alignments of such sites as Stonehenge, may have been largely unknown to ancient peoples, and still have been used as the basis for their civilization and trade centers. In this way the stones gradually became less holy than the minds of those meeting at them, until finally the meaning of the stones could again be understood by many. A particularly good example of the difference between the mentality of ancient people around the time of the end of the last ice age, as opposed to that of people in the following generations up to today, comes from Ica, near Nazca, in Peru, western South America. Here we find a collection of engraved stones depicting all manner of knowledge and technology of many advanced modern civilizations dating back, it is thought, some 10,000 years. The original carvers of these stones are unknown. However, it is believed that they belonged to the same culture from which three elongated skulls have been discovered. These skulls had been lengthened since birth by wearing tightly coiled bands, similar to the neck-stretching rings of Nairobi, Africa, or the lip and ear hoops of the Denenge culture of Uganda, Africa. Nothing at all is known about these people. However, it is clear from the evidence that they must have possessed an incredibly high degree of culture. They may also have been responsible for creating the Nazca Lines, enormous pictographic geoglyphs that can only be seen in their full size and scope from in the air high above the dry plains. In the ancient Eastern mysteries, they taught of seven chakra points inside the body and of the Kundalini serpent force that rises upward through them, calling this model of the human form the Atman, or the self-aware self. In the Middle East, the myth of the first man, Adam Homo, began from the same lands where the oldest fossils of Homo sapiens have been found. Kabbalists call the biblical Adam the second, or lesser Adam, and the son of Set and call the archetypal Adam Cadman the holy guardian angel, or the soul of man. It was Adam Cadman, according to the ancient Hebrew legends, whose wife was Lilith, who became the demoness of the desert, an evil spirit associated with infant mortality, and warded off by magical charms. According to the Kabbalists, the biblical story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden is only an allegory for the expulsion of Lucifer, the morning star thought to be the thief of first light from heaven, despite the fact that the existence of an actual place called Eden is confirmed by independent contemporary Sumerian records. According to some modern Kabbalist scholars, the entire Old Testament is an allegory for the same passage of a single soul through the underworld described by the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This code, called the Nefesh, may have been discovered by the historical Jesus and account for his gnosis of himself as the Son of God. The belief in a Messiah began much earlier, though, at least at the time of Moses, who recorded all the requisite prophecies describing the coming Savior into the Torah. Nor is the belief in a Messiah as archetypal Savior of humanity unique to Judaism. The Inca and Aztecs greeted the Spanish conquistadors with open arms, 
thinking them their returning civilizer, Quetzalcoatl, who they remembered as being fair-skinned. The Buddhists, too, continue the practice of seeking out Dalai Lamas as reincarnations of the original Buddha and await the coming time of Maitreya, the last terrestrial incarnation of the Buddha. More recently, the belief has become popular that we can all better ourselves and thus become more enlightened by individual karmic work on the soul, even simply by creating a list of goals for our own self-interest and then meeting them, and in this way, become greater self-actualized. One popular modern social movement states that we cannot love another until we love ourselves, and that we cannot know another any better than we know ourselves. This may be true, but the can of worms it opens up is the existential identity crisis of faith that has shaped mankind since birth. To know the self is impossible, for it is the self that is knowing. Instead, we say that all the self knows is itself, and this accounts for great amounts of people's personal karmic baggage, as it tends to attract reaction from the ether. In truth, the self can know many things, and in many ways. The self best knows itself as through the body, though we know that loss of the sense organ that is the body would not necessarily diminish the self any more than loss of any of its five senses. Some say that there is a sixth intuitive sense as well. However, there is not any reason to believe that loss of the sense organ of the body even necessarily means the loss of the senses either. To describe the self as archetypal, therefore, is impossible, since it is impossible for the self to comprehend that part of itself which is comprehending. However, since the self cannot be divided against the self without its knowing that it is being so, neither can calling the self an archetype harm, damage, or change the self in any way. It can only augment the definition of the self, which also has a long list of names throughout history, including the soul, the spirit, the ego, superego, and id, the conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious, the aura, the atman, koran zone, not to mention its notorious reputation for being ultimately reductible to only a set of memories and behaviors, brain tissue, or even only DNA. By living better lives, people throughout history have hoped to greater actualize the archetype of their self. According to the highest doctrines of most modern religions, in the deepest sense and on the highest level, we are all the same self, and this human, mammal, animal, terrestrial, elemental, universal self is only buried beneath the surface of our individual personalities, which we have only adopted for the convenience of satisfying our own lifelong survival agendas. Thus, the archetype of the self is, in truth, so transcendent that it is, in the end, right to think that all the self is, is consciousness knowing consciousness, self knowing its self. This archetype seems more ideal than to say that God is an asymptote and human population growth created in his image. History has many different descriptions of the early civilizers. 
in most cultures the world over, they were revered as gods. The Sumerian culture describes them as the Nephilim, who descended to earth in flying ships. The Egyptians called them the Netaru, who were all thought to be aspects of the sun god Ra. The Bible describes them as a generation of half-breed children of angels with the wives of men and as leaders and men of renown. Buddhism describes them as the ascended masters or bodhisattvas. In the Mayan Popol Vuh, they are named Jaguar Kite, Jaguar Knight, Not Right Now, and Dark Jaguar. And the Aztecs were called Quetzalcoatl as a bearded, pale-skinned traveler from across the eastern ocean. With most of their cultural centers, the archetypal civilizers established a class hierarchy, free trade, and profession specialization. They are usually credited for bringing either writing or math to the indigenous people, or both. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, amongst the negative declarations of the soul made before Ma'at at the Last Judgment, which also include the Ten Commandments, there is a reference to cannibalism, indicating that there had been some problem with that in the Nile Valley before the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, when the Book of the Dead was composed. This was likely accomplished by Sargon the Great, called the Scorpion King of Sumeria, and he was one of only a few pre-dynastic rulers of Egypt. He is credited with the first writing, having drawn a pictogram of a scorpion representing his signature beside a battle plan carved on a rock near the battlefield where, it is now thought, the decisive victory unifying Upper and Lower Egypt was fought and won. This pictogram was also later found on a set of small, flat, stone tags containing engravings of small hieroglyphic figures that represented the names of different ancient cities, some in Egypt, some in Mesopotamia. These are believed to be the oldest writing in existence. The similarities between Sargon and Imhotep are something like the similarities between the assassinations of Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. Imhotep was probably the person whom Sumerian religion would record as Enki. Egyptian religion would record as Thoth, and Hebrew religion as yod heh vod -He. In addition to these titles, he may have also been known as Sargon, Abraham, Pharaoh's Djoser, Khufu, Kephren, and Akhenaten, Moses, Utnapishtim, or Enoch, Ahura Mazda, Mithra, Zarathustra, Lao Tzu, Lao Tse, David, Solomon, Confucius, Siddhartha, Yeshua ben Padia, Jacques de Molay, John D., Comte de Saint Germain, Rasputin, S. L. McGregor Mathers, Aleister Crowley, etc. Since what we are dealing with is a body jumping, reincarnating, holonomonic archetype. The story of Osiris may be read as a prophecy fulfilled by Khufu. Similarly, each of these people have only lived their lives fulfilling the prophecies described by their predecessors, because each of them was only another 
to hold the same titles and position in the mystery cult held by Imhotep. There ought to be little doubt that all we know about the Kabbalah comes to us originally from Imhotep. However, the mythology makes it quite clear that this can only be dated back even at the time it was first recorded as far as the last Ice Age. Most of the mythologies, religions, and philosophies of these individuals shared one thing in common. Each of them displaced a lunar, feminine cult with a solar, masculine cult. Worship of Inki predominated over worship of his brother and Leo. Worship of Thoth, a lunar deity, was replaced by worship first of Osiris, representing resurrection, then of Horus, the solar hawk, then of Ra, the sun itself. Worship of Yadhevadhe, Ahura Mazda, Mithra, and Zoroaster drew people away from the worship of Inanna, Ishtar, or Ashtarte. In India, petrocult worship of Kali was replaced first by cults of Shiva, then of Vishnu and Ganesha. Zen Buddhism displaced Shinto across the face of much of the Orient. Later, Catholicism would burn witches as pagans, just as early Christians had been made to fight gladiators and lions to the death in imperial Roman amphitheaters, and Spanish Catholic conquistadors would lay waste to the animist Aztec and Incan cultures of South America. There is a very racist Mormon joke about Quetzalcoatl that goes, as Jesus said to the Mexicans, don't do anything until I get back. This seems especially indecent in observance of the fact that the peoples of pre-Columbian Mexico City, a monumental architectural feat being built up over a marshy lake and housing more people per capita than any other city on the planet at that time, as well as up to the 20th century, have always been known as the people of the sun. This is typical of the senseless macho contempt these solar cultures have developed for one another as their campaigns of bloodshed and violence against one another continue. They appear to be in a sort of competition with each other to breed a messiah or a master race and thereby come to rule the entire world as well as collecting tithes. Perhaps the ancient followers of Baal, or the Mayan Baal court players, had the best expression for this kind of competition over the sun's fear. The Enochian system also reveals it as like a rating system of karmic points that collects over different geographical areas, people, or peoples. When it is centered upon an area, it is called a karmic center, about a person, Christ consciousness, or Koran zone, the Holy Ghost. For a group of people, mass hallucination, or game reality. The crown of Kether is passed around the round table of the globe. Despite humanity's chase of it being called civilization, like Louis the Sixteenth in his palace. The sun rolls over our heads every day, from dawn to dusk, disappearing only to reappear again. It can only have been the pounding heat of the sun that would drive the workers into the frenzy that must have been needed to have built the Great Pyramid in as short a period of time as most historians of the time accredit. Less than one generation and it can be seen that the Nubian culture of southern Upper Egypt 
began to dominate more and more heavily over the Hyksos culture of northern Lower Egypt in the art of the three kingdoms of dynastic Egypt, as the characters are depicted as more and more African in appearance. Similarly, in ancient Ethiopia, where they were said to cut shanks from live cattle, eat the flesh raw, and patch the animal's wound with mud. At these early stages, beside doctrine, the solar cults and the lunar cults displayed little difference in their low level of rational humanism. By the time of Jesus, who represented the sun amongst the twelve zodiacal houses of his disciples, the message had become one of peace, love, and understanding. And by the time of Jacques de Molay, a Christian crucified by the Christian church, one of liberty, fraternity, and equality. One must wonder at what such gushing openness on behalf of the sun fails to reveal about its true nature, since, besides the Mayan Tzolkin, a very complex calendar based on many different cyclical variables observed in the movements of the planets, and the works of the Ottoman astronomers, none of these have even hinted at any scientific understanding of the nuclear fusion gas cloud of our solar system's sun, preferring instead to mask whatever actual data they had collected in anthropomorphic allegory and conceal this in a hierarchical system of social order. The central paradigm of social order is the death complex, and so I will use the words occult and order of death or death interchangeably. Here we see that the human species has attempted to cope with its apparently unique perception of the end of life by idealizing death and making it holy by enshrouding it in mysterious rituals, magical legislative dogmas, and often hallucinatory beliefs. The oldest known conception of what became of the essence of an individual after the physical body had died is the jinn, or nature spirits, the origins of which can probably be traced back as far as tribal animism. Around the time of the building of the pyramids, however, the Middle Easterners invented the process of brewing grain barley with fermented hops and formulated the recipe for beer, and at this time the shamanic trances that had only been practiced by the tribal medicine men far out in the wilderness began to become popular amongst the common citizens in the early agrarian city-state civilizations. Around this time there were several attempts made to formalize or categorize the jinn. These attempts can be traced along with the history of the ram stone. Supposedly the oldest formalized conceptions of the jinn is given in the Sumerian Necronomicon and describes the jinn as having once been the Anunnaki, lessers of the Nephilim and as able to control various certain natural processes, such as the gathering together of great numbers of people, the working and refinement of natural ores and minerals to produce metals, and control of the weather of the firmament of the atmosphere. Though only 50 names are listed, there were supposedly more and though only their usefulness to making war is described, they supposedly possessed as much personality as people. According to the history of the Sumerian people, these fifty were actual people who had lived and died during a war in the heavens, and, according to the Necronomicon, they had then become ghosts who could be summoned using ancient magical sigils. Next, 
the Egyptians described the Anunnaki as the deacons, giving them a place in their Sumerian 12-sign zodiac-based calendar, though not attributing constellations to them. The Egyptians divided their calendar first according to the twelve Sumerian constellations, then assigned three deacons to each sign, calling each one the watcher over a week of ten days, such that there were thirty days in each Egyptian month. Since this did not correspond correctly, to the actual 365 and one-fourth day long solar year measured by the Earth's orbit. At some point in Egyptian history, perhaps when Akhenaten attempted to establish solar monotheism, the calendar also began to include five intercalary days at the end of each year, and these were called the holidays of the 37th deacon. According to the occult throughout history, the Shemhamfarash, or the spell that Moses used to part the Red Sea when the Hebrews fled Egypt, is a 72 long letter code triply encoded into the verse describing his doing so. Many modern Jewish researchers today have proven that, along with such gnomons as phi over pi, there are many different types of number or sequence coded geometric lattices used in the writing of the Old Testament. The number 72 is important because it is the doubling of the 36 standard Egyptian deacons and because it is also the number that is the measurement of years over which the gravitational pole of the earth precesses one degree or one three hundred and sixtieth. Buddha who describes Samadhi as the transcendence of samsara, or the cycle of reincarnation, is said to have slain all of his inner demons of doubt in one night while meditating beneath a bow or bodhi tree. And it is from this that the bodhisattvas take their name. Buddhism teaches that by following the path of right thought right speech, and right action, we can attain higher states of conscious enlightenment. In this way, Buddhism defines the afterlife as the attempt to escape from the yugas, or cyclical ages of growth, destruction, and renewal, described by the Hindi, which may be thought to represent the annual seasons as well as the 41,000 year ice age cycle. The Shemham Farash was also used by Solomon, according to rabbinic scholars and Kabbalists, to construct the first temple. Supposedly also the author of the Angel Scroll, a list of angels associated with the Old Testament apocryphal prophet Enoch, the Essene Yeshua ben Padia also knew of the Shemham Farash. Muhammad also describes the wars in heaven and gives the names of some of the key players. The Enochian system describing the Anunnaki was later elaborated on by the scrying of John D. and Edward Kelly, who expanded upon the day and night duality of the Shemham Farash's expansion on the Egyptian deacons by factoring in the planetary astrological alignments and associated elements, and who gave a fuller, more complete set of archangel names as tessellated lattices. Most recently involved in the definition of the hierarchical initiatory levels of the death experience are the Freemasons who trace their origin as far back as to the building of the Temple of Solomon, but who may date even further back to the Sumerian workers who immigrated from Sumeria to Egypt, bringing with them beer, writing, and civilization, before the building of the Great Pyramid. The Freemasons, 
like the Gnostic Essenes and the Buddhists, attempt to demonstrate to people that death and reincarnation are perpetual parts of life itself and can be ended in one's death. Perhaps the irony of the occult leaders teaching people freedom from reincarnation, coming back to haunt the leaders by being accused of reincarnation themselves, is best expressed in the passion of Jesus Christ, although the same trend is carried on to this day by the seeking out of reincarnated Dalai Lamas and Lamas by Buddhists, the election of popes, cardinals, and bishops by Catholicism, the initiatory rituals of free and associated masonry, and the Jewish belief in the generational prophets and the coming Messiah. As I have said, this only leads to competition among the sovereign cultures over the essence of Koran Zone, the archetypal ghost, along with the twelve signs of the zodiac given by early Sumerian astrologer astronomers. The ancients also defined an entire host of other constellations each culture recognizing the same stars and symbolizing them in different ways. For example, the Egyptians and Greeks identified Osiris, or Orion, as a human hunter, while the Peruvians and Mayans identified the same constellation as a spider. The Egyptians identified the North Pole star constellation as an ape and a plow the Russians as a great bear, and Europeans as the Big Dipper. One constellation for which most ancient and modern cultures share in their description of, however, is Draco, the dragon, that circles around the pole star through all twelve longitudes of the heavenly hemisphere, divided along the ecliptic by the twelve signs of the zodiac. Draco was significant to many ancient cultures, and is depicted in the Snake Mound of England, the Nazca Lines, and the alignment of the Temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. It was associated with Kundalini in India, Quetzalcoatl in South America, Set in Egypt, and Poimandres by Hermes. In so far as the North Polar Star was in Draco during the time of the last Ice Age, as well as much longer ago during the time of the dinosaurs, it has been speculated that it might represent not only the ancients' knowledge of precession, as demonstrated in the Shemhamphorash, but also their knowledge of dinosaurs, as depicted on the Ica Stones of Peru. It should also be considered significant that the majority of constellations described by the ancients are depicted as animals, much like the majority of cave paintings by Stone Age Homo sapiens and Cro-Magnons. Perhaps the best representations for this irony, which did not go unrecognized by subsequent Greek Golden Age temple astronomers or later Ottoman Muslim astronomers is in the depiction of the zodiacal sign of Capricorn, half goat and half fish, marking the middle of a northern hemisphere ice age, or Sagittarius, the centaur, half man and half horse, marking the middle of a southern hemisphere ice age. The result of the conflict between the solar cults and the lunar cults over the procession of poimandries has led to the mass delusion of the populace. The ones who win feel obligated to lose. All that is gained is ultimately sacrificed. Nothing remains sacred. All victories are pyrrhic. All desires fleeting and thank you is never said without I'm sorry. The ego is associated with the archetype of suffering, and this is raised unto the Most High. Still, God is moving, 
across the face of the deep. Zen Buddhism, Taoism, and Kabbalah offer ways through the garden of forking paths that is the neural net of decision-making for the pursuit of karma. It is thought that by identifying and transcending our goals, we can become at greater peace and harmony with our inner self and with the rest of the universe as well. Most of the rest of the world religions are transfixed by the passion of Christ, such that so much of the world's population are Christians that it gets in the way of the anti-Semitic teachings of Muhammad and the Marxist Zionism of Reform Judaism. While the New Testament has changed the entire philosophy of the people of the Holy Land, it has left them in financial ruin and economic poverty. At the same time, it has done the exact opposite for the Western corporate world, making industrial developed nations rich beyond their wildest dreams and leaving their minds stuck in biblical times, reenacting the Last Supper. Thus, we are either given mendicant roles cobbled from the Hindu caste system, or made to identify ourselves with a martyr. Neither of these seems sufficient to meeting the goals of simple survival, and it is obvious the way in which both of these schools of philosophy evolved from originally ascetic patro rites. In the case of the East, these were elderly Vedic wanderers who had given up all but a cloth, a pair of sandals, a walking stick, and a bowl. It was their place in the Hindu caste system, having lived long, socially productive lives, to be exiled into the wilderness in order to contemplate what meaning this had had, if any, before dying. It was to these old men that young Siddhartha came, though they would eventually learn from him. In the case of the West, there were the Baptist Essenes, a group of Jews who had been exiled from all the surrounding communities for being even more religious than the anti-Roman, terroristic zealots. They were called the Nazarenes, or the poor, for being the Nosre Habrith, the keepers of the covenant, of the commune of Qumran. It was to these well worshippers of Damascus that Yeshua ben Padia would come, though his time there is best described by Jesus' final visit to the temple. It is possible that these teachers of wisdom only briefly encountered the existing occult, and it was by the establishment's cursing of them upon their leaving from its folds that the subsequent religions were born as their mere image. For Buddhism, this consists in the slaying of all one's inner demons, doubts, turmoils, etc. For Christianity, this consists in the pleasant gaze of Jesus hanging on the cross. Perhaps one could be thought to represent the external visage of the divine countenance and the other the internal mental state of serenity at the conclusion of all cognitive dissonance. As I have said, all this leaves little left over for the common man who does not necessarily care for the mendicant lifestyle or the archetype of the martyr as much as for his own salvation and for bread and water. It requires understanding on another level of reasoning, and as with the formal system of metaphysics, this implies the depth of dimension of had and not, and the potential dualism of fact and fiction. The ornate rituals of religion and the grotesque spectacles of the media do not change the economy, 
the politics, or any of the rest of the natural functions of the real world. They only reflect, represent, and attempt to elaborate upon them. It is clear that the youngest of the great religious teachers have all been more in rebellion to the existing philosophies than those of their elder counterparts, such that, whenever one seeks initiation into the mysteries, one will react to the gnosis, or the knowledge of God, in a way congruent with one's age. We see that the young, slender Siddhartha would become the jolly, round ho tea, that Sargon, Hammurabi, would become Imhotep, Abraham, would become Thoth, Enoch, would become Yadhevadhe, Moses. We see that Jesus was missing during most of his youth, and known only during the three years of his preachings before being crucified, just as Imhotep and Tuahotep were also Khufu and Kephrin, so were they also Osiris and Horus, as Shiva of Sheba was Isis of Meru Becca, and Akhenaten was Siddhartha, was Yeshua, were all reincarnations of Kephrin, the Ra of the free spirit, soaring through the set souls. Recently, the British occultist Aleister Crowley described the situation this way. The cabs is in the coup, and the coup is in the cabs, meaning that the greater is within the lesser, and the lesser within the greater, or the above is as the below, and the below is as the above. Another way of thinking of it is, given by Lewis Carroll in Through the Looking Glass, where the White Queen describes memory as being potentially backwards and forwards, but never in the moment, as the law of jam tomorrow, jam yesterday, but never, ever jam today. Unfortunately, that story ended with Alice awakening from a dream, and the truth is that such axioms as she perceived in archetypal forms throughout the plotline persist more in waking life. One of the types of litmus test for agelessness that can be applied to the teaching of any ancient sage is its translatability into modern terminology, although this will as much reflect the age of the translator as the original did the age of the writer. Another is based on the use of chemical substances to encourage, induce, or enhance enlightenment, such as Soma for the Buddhists, Peyote for the Cherokee, Blood for the Black Mass, and sacramental wine for the Christians. Perhaps the best is through the use of systems and their degree of complexity, for such as can be used to measure in terms of wisdom rather than in terms of age. The ultimate extent of systems, however, is arbitrary, since it is an ideal equivalent in essence to a dream object something that can exist only in the mind, and which transcends the mundane reality of such character traits as identity. The modern information systems theory hinges on inversion, and this is for astrological reasons, as the Montauk Sedona time tunnel opened in the sign of Libra, which is really Virgo according to the social concealment of procession. This is thought to represent the same event as predicted astrologically by the encrypted prophecies of the New Testament in the parable of Jesus overturning the scales in the temple. 
Such time tunnels occur in accordance with the equivalent in Earth's ozone layer and ionosphere of the coil crossing, band jumping prominences, and flares of sunspots in the sun's electromagnetic field. These cause karmic centers to occur below, and such interaction may also be stimulated by the direct solar radiation that stimulates the movement of atmospheric pressure centers. At night, the air molecules move more slowly and drift further apart, as the solar ultraviolet radiation is not disturbing them, and everything assumes a more regular form as the flatline histories of tachyons penetrate through the ground and trail out into the plasma sheet in Earth's shadow cone like a solar windsock. The slight distortion of them in the atmosphere makes the stars sparkle and the planets twinkle. They form spiral vectors on the rods and cones inside our eyes. People who have driven long distances know this effect. Children are exposed to it by watching too much TV. It is the air in which we communicate. During the day there is only more of it, as tachyons are being emitted by photons, and here we see that the regular matrix that these particles assume overnight becomes a chaotic field of static. People who have been soldiers in a war know this effect. It is from the accustomed perception to this that the Muslim religion gradually derived its geometric tessellation art over the many ages to represent the face of Allah. It is also this which is associated with Kether and with the primary clear light of Yalem, although it should be specified that there is still clear light even beyond the tachyonic multiverse comprising the border of the universe bound by the speed of photons, zim zum, even as ein sof or limitless light, in the ein sof limitlessness, in which the I am is the ayin, limitless nothingness. This has led the media into the millennial wild goose chase for an explanation for their existence. What should have just been a good Picasso painting now has to represent Taurus. What should have been a family photo is now a crucifix. The beginning and ending of self-aware existence is sacrifice. In the beginning, we sacrifice the womb life, comfortable and warm, in a state of miraculous, suspended animation, only to become people and cover the face of the planet. In the end, we sacrifice all we have gained from this life and give up all advantages. This is the way it has always worked, and this is the way it always shall. There is very little choice on the part of a star, for example, as to whether it wants to have begun from random quantum fluctuation, nor can it hope to change its fate if it is not destined to become a black hole. Therefore, the law that every man and woman is a star is wrong, because humans have free will and can change their own fates and destinies. This is because the spirit is free, though even the soul ultimately is not. The soul, in so far as it is electromagnetic, can only exist within the natural universe, below the speed of photons. Only the free spirit, in essence, tachyons, could travel into the gates of heaven, outside of the universe. Stars may be like us. But we are not much like stars. We give up the solace of the womb for the control of our own destinies. 
Outside our parent organisms is a reciprocal interchange system that has been artificially created and must be supervised and maintained that supports and gratifies our desires and we understand this force however we choose. It may be seen to represent God the Father, karma, memory, money, civilization, other people, the identity. It is what gets us home safe at night. The replica, or pop culture simulacrum, hovering in the Enochian system, is the ghost of our self-control. The social consciousness, or Koron zone, that we are perpetually letting go. The rest remains the memory of the involved individuals, like a toy for them to take home. We give up the control over our destinies, whenever it's our time. Since long ago it has been this that has been the substance of sacrifice, while we have kept hold of material goods only slightly longer than they have had value as referentials or representative meaning. Since the sensory stimuli increases in velocity, its meaning is asymptotically forgotten and gradually redistributed to other referentials. When the sensory stimuli has achieved a certain point on this vector graph, it simply ceases to exist. Here is the death of sense perception. Here is ego death. And here is the death of the body. I am not that which I am. I am not the substance of my sacrifice though it may be for me my most exalted replication of karma. I have detached myself from its umbilical cord and let it go beyond. Such is the devotion and dedication necessary of a mendicant. On the island of Japan, Buddhist monks discovered a way to mummify themselves they ate tree bark from indigenous pine trees for one year, taking daily rigorous constitutionals across the mountain terrain. Then they would drink ink containing lead and water from a local well containing arsenic. One of them buried himself in a small cubicle hole beneath the ground with only a string leading out to a bell in the outside world and a cup of the lead-based tea. He rang the bell for three days, and on the fourth day he was dead. The remains of his corpse are still preserved to this day, however, almost a thousand years later. The tree bark toughened and thinned his skin and muscle tissue. The lead and arsenic killed the microbacterial organisms in his intestines that in life had helped him to digest his food and that in death would digest him from the inside out. There are three such mummies in a Buddhist monastery in Japan. This represents the height of the mendicant monk's lifestyle and the culmination of reward for it in the form of preservation of the body after death, on par with the Egyptian pharaohs. So, forever may it be seen that both the greatest of kings and the simplest of monks may be equivalent before the ages. It is possible to extract extremely accurate genetic samples from any once living artifact, so long as it has not become completely petrified. On the other hand, it remains possible to extrapolate the genetic patterns even of petrified particles using holographic resonance imaging to map the projected material into a computer program. Asceticism is as useful to the common man as a bicycle to a fish. You can sell a fish a bicycle or you can teach one how to ride. You can lead a horse to drink tequila 
but you can't make one swallow the worm. Why should we all beat ourselves up all the time inside over the fact that we will all one day die? Good times are always passing by. Consciousness researchers believe that our first impression of death comes from the birth experience. However, that our beliefs about the nature of life after death derive primarily from our self-transcendent experiences or what I have called elsewhere our personal transcendental experiences. Various researchers have shown that these are related in various ways to various events in our lives such that the most archetypal levels tend to filter down statistically into the manifest realm of event. Some experience these from orgasm, and it is likely that this is the most primal form. Some experience these from use of chemical substances. However, this often creates a clinging to pre-dissociative reality as a central point. Some experience these as profound religious experiences, and these come in too many different forms to list. Some may leave you with good memories of them. Others might vex, trouble, or worry you. Some may make you see yourself differently. Others might even change who you think you are. Researchers have tried to categorize these according to various different systems, such as the Anunnaki and Nephilim, the Essenes and Nazarenes, and the Enochian heirs. This is where we see the similarities and differences between the lifestyle of the monk and the welfare of the king, and their relationship to the common man. Since everyone has personal, self-transcendental experiences, then it becomes necessary for the group to have shared personal transcendental experiences, and this is where the social simulacrum comes into play. It has long been a superstition that the more people involved in an event, the more energy there is in it, and that it is both healthy and well that this energy should be guided towards the implied desired ends. Passive energy, such as the Holy Mass given by the Pope, requires fewer leaders to orchestrate. Active energy, such as an American football game, requires other than strategically mindless players and hundreds of screaming, mostly drunken fans. People share personal self-transcendental experiences almost everywhere they go and in every situation they are in, to either greater or lesser extents and degrees. Similarly, if only one person tells another their thought, and that thought seems worth it and catchy enough, it will eventually travel mimetically throughout the entire community unconsciously. This effect has been observed with moths living in 19th and early 20th century industrial Europe, where the moths that lived inside the heavily polluted cities were turned black by coal soot, and the moths of the same species that lived out in the surrounding countryside also naturally changed their color to black as well. This also occurred to the tree bark of the indigenous trees. In the same way do people adopt personalities from the ether, and one that is particularly camouflaged is the martyr complex. This is based on the Greek Oedipal or Electra complex, which, according to the original story, goes recognized too late and Oedipus puts out his eyes. While before this time, the practice of animal sacrifice was standard operating procedure at the temples. Not until Greek drama had human self-martyrdom been portrayed on stage. Thus it was as much, if not in fact, to the Roman sense of irony much more, this theatrical flair that was behind the practice of crucifixion, 
than it was intended to be as it was held by the first Jewish Christians, equivalent to the Passover sacrifice. At the pinnacle of self-sacrifice is the inversion of self. This means not only the sacrifice of what is known of the self, but the self that is known as well as the self that is knowing. This seems like a lot of inversions, but according to people since the time of Christ, it can all be done in one, if, of course, you believe in Christ. Perhaps you might wonder how, since the inversion between all of those inversions and only one inversion only seems to be another inversion. Only imagine there is no you. Then all will become clear. It is this that is at the crux of the argument among many of those who consider themselves the most high, since on this level, or from this perspective, however you want to look at it, there is no difference between life and death, according to all the recorded legislation on the heaven of mankind that is the free and accepted multiverse. Once we have begun to see in this way, which is called the trance of Samad High by Buddhists, and the Tao of Qi in China, as well as Christ consciousness or being in the presence of the Holy Ghost in the West, then one can begin to freely and truly question whether they even exist at all. It appears possible that we might simply divest ourselves of karma and dissipate whenever we wish. Doing so, however, creates inversions of karma. An expansion in one dimension creates a contraction in the next, and another expansion in the one after that, and so on, on all scales. This even includes the projection of our thoughts in mental projective space and this affects reality when it involves referentials. We create attachments between things that remain within our memories and act associatively upon referentials, creating geometric lattices. These are enneagrams in the mind that overlap three-dimensional reality in a mental projective map. Even fish do this. It is thought this is what makes the grass grow. What does it mean for karma to be inverted? Only that it is a digital part of a hollow mnemonic referential infrastructure that is at once expanding and contracting, at once extrapolating and integrating, at once an influx and output. This means the karma is coming and going and if one will remember that it is, on the most fundamental level, all tachyons, it is doing so simultaneously, backwards and forwards in time. And this seems to create the fourth dimensional temporal cycling of the three dimensional heavenly bodies. Karma can be inverted in as many ways as it can be seen to be relative to any other object, material substance, or essence of force in the entire universe, since these all comprise the actual geometric relativities that comprise the a-causal connecting principle. None of this has any more need for meaning to you than in that it can be useful and, moreover, no more meaning than what you give unto it. The ancients know of this by the name Shekinah, and it was only after the same ideas became associated with Koran's own that the Christian trinity of God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus the Son of God could come to replace the maternal occult dialectic of the aeons of the Father, the Mother, and the crowned and conquering child. In the inversion system, the old greatest common factor becomes the new lowest common denominator. 
Nihilism is the belief that nothing exists. Nothing is real. Nothing is true. And all that we perceive with the senses, the mind, the ego, et al., is a false illusion called Maya by the ancient Indians and Mana by the Mayans and Olmec. There is no need in nihilism for religion because it allows for atheism as well as agnosticism and anthropomorphism so long as the applicant realizes that these are all essentially false and illusory and can only contribute to a further delusion of the senses resulting in greater clinging to the ego. The goal of nihilism could be called clarity, but nihilism is iconoclastic and therefore would only smash such a symbol. There is no moral purpose for nihilism, yet it is the grounded philosophy of countless people on some level worldwide. There are many moments where the self is transcended purely out of frustration, and since this amounts only to distraction, it cannot accomplish anything, and is therefore considered ultimately irrelevant. Nonetheless, this is embraced by the rebelliousness of youth culture as the finale of the haunted house ride that is reality. As well as the existing American media, the immediatist collage philosophers of tomorrow seem anxious to rush headlong through their roles in manifestation of social adjustment karma and assert their thalami on the karmic cut-up machine, claiming to be the inheritors of Burroughs and Nietzsche. Nihilism began conceptually as the inversion of Tao, the concept of the anti-Yalem. It is described as the Ayin, that is above and outside of the universe, where even the tachyons of the multiverse do not reach. It is thought, therefore, to be the philosophy of the darkness, and associated with yang inside yin, as opposed to yin inside yang, associated with yalem. It is therefore very deeply rooted in socialized, acculturated philosophies, as well as to the psychology of the self-cognizant bicameral mind. It is not known what purpose it serves. It motivates the id, which actuates the superego. It differentiates between consciousness, subconsciousness, and unconsciousness. It is the everywhere and nowhereness of the self. Yet, it is inverted from all of these things, and is therefore none of them in itself. You cannot put your finger on nihilism without it hiding inside of you. Whenever you go looking to find the source of all your nihilism, you will not find it. It will not be there, because there is no such thing. Nihilism perpetuates itself invisibly, like a computer virus, decomposing the moral fiber of all of history's grandeur. This splendor is a mirage, say the nihilists, and, like Satan's temptations of Jesus in the desert, must be let go. Perhaps this was best described in the children's book, The Never-Ending Story, where there is a great nothingness that threatens to consume a magical kingdom. If you feel threatened by this description, as well you should, for it is the Jabberwocky, then you will remember that all that I am describing is what would make you ever forget all that I have been describing. That is what nihilism is. Forget forgetting. Our bodies are made of material that has already been on this planet for millions of years. Our genetic sequences gradually evolving, 
our bodies reproducing themselves cellularly, the materials the same since the first bacteria. This is one source of memory. Our souls are electromagnetic energy that has traveled throughout the known universe, and this is another type of memory. These are the neurogenetic and neuroatomic circuits described by Leary and represent Bina and Chakma, where the eight circuits are arranged on the tree of life excluding Malkuth and Kether, and where Malkuth represents the peripheral nervous system, and Kether represents the source of memory of the free spirit comprised of tachyons, whose home is as a gravitational singularity in the heavenly multiverse. Because there are many forms that appear to catch the light of Yelem, there are many different systems and models that have been cobbled over time, and therefore many different mystery schools have arisen throughout the land. However, remember, it is as I have said of Kether, that it is passed around, for the Rosicrucians described the true inner order as the traveling lodge. The most ancient peoples used to have ceremonial fires. This was probably the beginning of the craft. The philosophies of these schools have always reflected the philosophies of the Most High, it is a rather difficult operation to identify the Most High, unless it is you. It is genuinely unfortunate that more people do not do so, because then there would be even more, and therefore perhaps better philosophy and metaphysics. Some of these philosophies actually say exactly the opposite of some of the other philosophies that supposedly originate from the same school. This is usually because even the Most High do not always agree with one another. This can result for any of the various reasons I described in an earlier section as the different causes of personal self-transcendental experiences as well as the different sources of memory. When such things as these are different, as Nietzsche claimed they were for men and women due to frequency, then disagreements in the recorded doctrines may occur. Usually, these will either have been corrected and replaced, or corrected by a third, separate factor, and remain in the doctrine alongside their resolution. In the cases where this has not occurred, due to the natural process of information resorting over the countless ages for which the order of death has existed, it may be considered a doctrinal mutation equivalent in essence to a genetic mutation which occur usually due to gene hopping transposons that replicate genetic coding out of sequence. Thus the error is not really in the doctrine itself but in the time at which it is being legislated such that the doctrine at no point disagrees with itself from different perspectives of timing. This occurs because the doctrine itself is a holonomon. It is only spin being put on it that causes it to appear ever-changing. In truth, it is only the mantra, OM, reverberating throughout the continuum. Think of the lotus blossom that floats upon the surface of water without the water droplets clinging to the underside of the broad, thick, smooth petals and leaves. See how the water bends under where it collects and pools on the flower, and how it cannot run off nor be absorbed. The lotus blossom is like the doctrine of the Kabbalah, and the pools of water upon its surface are like the schools of the Dharmas. It floats in the infinite continuum that is not what is, and it does not sink into it, and it does not drink from it. 
See the lotus blossom in the daylight as the soul warms to see it. See the lotus blossom by the cool light of the morning soul by moonlight. See the lotus blossom in the rains and sleet and snows and the temperate breezes and warm glow of the seasons and see how these same ravagers and destroyers of the apocalypse renew, regenerate, and restore the lotus blossom. See the million-petaled lotus blossom with the wonder with which it would look upon you. See your way through the lotus blossom, and you will see it through and through. Such is the mind of God, and beyond this, ineffable even to the mystery schools. The highest state of enlightenment, according to Western mystics, is Gnosis, or the secret and revealed knowledge of the nature of the universe. According to Kabbalah, the ancient oral tradition of the wandering Hebrews that is written down in such scrolls as found at Qumran and at Nag Hammadi. These are usually considered apocryphal literature, since most of them were editorially excluded from the canonized Latin Vulgate, as well, mostly, from the subsequent Lutheran Gutenberg translations and comprise the doctrines only of the Eastern Orthodox branch of the Church that included the Greek and Russian churches, as well as held sway over the Holy Roman Empire of Prussia. The oldest Gnostic documents have been discovered alongside Coptic documents, some of which predate Christianity. The religion of the Coptics was similar to the religion of the Gnostics, which differed little from that of the Jews. The Jews believed that there was a coming Messiah, and believed he would be born among the Hebrews because of their covenant with God. The Gnostics believed this as well. However, they also believed that the common man could learn to become a Messiah. The Coptics were a very late dynastic Egyptian cult, similar to the medieval alchemists who used Egyptian symbolism to promote Gnostic messianism. In their own time, all these sects were very unpopular with the surrounding townships because they were associated with the poor and homeless mendicants, or beggars, as well as with wandering lepers. The Coptics were viewed by Egyptians and Hebrews alike somewhat similarly to the way a modern Southern Baptist might view their cousin who attends a snake-handling church. They were thought to worship Set, or Satan, and shunned for the devil. The Gnostics fared little better, being associated with eschatologists and proselytizers, and were shunned by zealots as well as Pharisees. Similarly, the Hebrew people were, at the time, an enslaved people of Rome, which was a pantheist culture that saw little value in an intangible, all-knowing God. The early Gnostic and Coptic Apocrypha share much with Egyptian and Buddhist ideas of the soul and the spirit. They identify the Ruach, or breath of the soul, with the seven Ba of Re, and the Neshima, or Holy Spirit, with the Ak of Light. Above this, and animating it, are Chia and Jakaida, or the Will and the Way. While much of the late Egyptian metaphysics remains untranslated, the apocryphal Hebrew texts are usually the same allegorical style as the rest of the Bible some including names of bloodlines, some recording calendars, some apocalyptic visions, some simple parables of Hebrew law and Jewish daily life. One, by an Essene named Yeshua ben Padia, gives a list of angel names similar to the Book of Enoch, and thought to be an elaboration thereon. 
Some of the works found at Qumran and at Nag Hammadi are copies of works that were included in the canonized Bible. However, there are many more that were not. The first council of the Roman Catholic Church that met to establish the contents of the book of the Bible chose for the Old Testament from the Torah the Talmudic works, including many Psalms, and the other contents of the Tanakh, and for the New Testament from the Essene Gospels, the works of the few selected disciples, apostles, and a few epistles written by Paul of Tsarsis who had established himself as the voice of the pre-Constantine Christian Church. This excluded a vast amount of additional books in the Old Testament, and, much later, the wealth of rabbinic commentary on the message and the law that had been produced by the Jews since the Babylonian captivity. It also excluded a wealth of works written by other disciples of Jesus, as well as epistles, supposedly written by him to Pontius Pilate. There are a wealth of revelations from Adam and Seth, the son of Cain, Abraham and Moses, to Mary and Joseph, John and James. Although these were all excluded from the Latin Vulgate, the various sects and orders of the Church who had possession of the few then known copies of some of these such works kept them stored along with dozens of other scrolls, many dating back into the same ages of antiquity from various other cultures around the world. When the Roman Catholic Universal Christian Church was invaded by Muslim Turks, the order was divided into two branches. One was comprised of the people of Southwest Asia and Eastern Europe, living around the Urals and the Caucasian mountains and as far east as the Black Sea. This was called the Orthodox Church. The other was only the refuge of the Roman Catholic Church. However, when the papal seat moved back to Rome, the Prussian Holy Roman Empire remained ordained. When the Pope was returned to the Vatican, the seat of the Orthodox Church was moved from Constantinople to Prussia, modern Germany after the end of the Crusades. This brought a swarm of Visigoths and Ostrogoths from the Cossacks simultaneously to the Mongol hordes invading the Muslim Ottoman Empire. The Goths brought with them ideas of trade masonry and architecture that were new to medieval Europe and which contributed to the Renaissance and to the Age of Reason. I will continue the history with the Age of Enlightenment momentarily However, first let me describe Gnosticism. The highest Gnosis is that there is no self. This is based on the Gnostic documents which contradict the official biblical version of the history of Christ's life. According to some, he was administered a tranquilizing barbiturate, such as opium, in a soaked rag on the cross, in order to go into a death-like sleep and thereby stage his resurrection. According to these documents, the actual historical Jesus lived a very long life, married Mary Magdalene, and moved with her to France, where further Gnostic documents exist, describing their life together at the Abbey of Rennes-le-Chateau. According to some, documents were discovered under the abbey's altar tracing the Dead Sea Scrolls back to Qumran before they were found. This all contradicts the official heresy of Paul, whom the Essenes described as the wicked priest, and who may well have only been another name for Pliny or Peso, two Roman families that may have actually written the New Testament Gospels fragments of copies of which were found at Qumran. The reasoning behind the Gnosis is this. Jesus was a fictional character, representing a real person. The Catholic Trinity of Jesus as the Son of Man, born the Son of God, is juxtaposed by the Orthodox belief in the Ascended Man, who achieved the highest Gnosis and transcended mundane reality. I am not that which I am.
At the time of the Renaissance, great painters, sculptors, and architects, such as Filippo Brunelleschi, Donatello, Masaccio, Fra Filippo Lippi, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo Bonarotti, and Raphael Sanzio filled the lands of Europe. This was largely due to the Muslim occupation of Spain and the introduction of older cultures along the eastern trade route traveled by Marco Polo, reaching as far as the Silk Road in China. Europe imported silk from the Orient, spices from India, rugs from Persia, and along with this came a wave of Eastern philosophical schools, such as Chinese and Muslim astronomy, Greek idealism and Gnosticism, and Hindu concepts of cyclical time. These were all dutifully anthropomorphized by the Christians. However, the study of the natural sciences would ultimately break away from the universal church and establish its own sets of rules and parameters by which to define the universe. The early scientists, such as Leonardo da Vinci, who understood geometry and applied physics, would eventually lead to the later scientists, such as Isaac Newton, who applied geometry to physics and understood classical gravity. Little more than what the men and women of this day brought to light would be equaled by physicists until the 20th century. The rest of the intervening years were spent trying to mature medieval alchemy into chemistry and medicine. Here we see more being accomplished intellectually in a shorter span of time than any other pattern of growth throughout human history other than monumental works projects such as the Pyramids of Giza or the Great Wall of China, or the asymptotic exponential growth of the human population over recorded time. The Enlightenment occurred entirely as a natural social process due to various concurrent international factors. However, it was seen as a time of rapid change by the people of the day, some of whom lost and some of whom gained. Those who were older or stood to gain more from the existing cultural trends began to see the natural progress of the times as rebellious against established institutions, and this culminated in the conflict that progenated Protestantism. With the invention of the movable type printing press towards the end of the Enlightenment, Martin Luther, a Jesuit priest of Bavaria, nailed a list of demands of changes in Catholic dogma and doctrine to the wooden doors of the Church of Prague. One of these was that the Bible be printed on the Gutenberg movable typeface printing press in translations into European national vernaculars from the Latin Vulgate. These demands were roundly rejected by the papal seat and Martin Luther turned around and created his own church, beginning a wave of similar churches called Protestant, some of whom adopted his same views, called Lutheran. The scandal over the selling of indulgences, Luther's primary issue with the church, so badly hurt the Catholic Church's reputation that, when it became inconvenient under Catholic doctrine for the King of England to be annulled from his wife, he simply turned around and created his own Protestant church, known as the Anglican Church. Of course, the Catholic reaction to all this was the Inquisition, where roving bands of religiously mandated executioners roamed the lands holding impromptu witch trials in a pogrom against Jews, Gnostics, Goths, and pagan Protestants. This period of history cast the church in such a bad light that its fundamental authority was almost eradicated altogether. This led to doubt and depression across Europe as all the once proud members, now victims of the church, suffered a crisis of faith. 
If the church that told them God was real was lying about its own practices, as well as other of its own dogmatic doctrines, then perhaps even the idea of God was to be doubted. Philosophically, this led to the radical humanism of Descartes, Hume, Kant, Hobbes, and Locke. Descartes, though a professed, devout Christian, began his philosophy by working backwards, deductively rather than inductively, and assumed that nothing was real and all perceptions are false. Hume proposed the dialectical method of Greek rhetoric be applied to ontology, and Kant did so in an attempt to create a humanistic ethic. Hobbes elaborated upon this humanist utopia naturalistically, defining all the mental life of precognitive man as being savage, and Locke proposed the exact opposite, that mankind's natural state was more in equilibrium with St. Augustine's city on a hill, representing the ideal kingdom of God, which itself was little more than a warmed-over, Christianized version of Plato's Republic. Locke applied the liberty, equality, and fraternity of the Knights Templar to the class hierarchy problems of the Republic to compensate for the absence of God. The result was Illuminism. The Knights Templar had probably been the first Westerners to encounter Illuminism, a fatalist form of Gnosticism, in the Saracen occult of the Hashishans. This Ishmaeli sect of Mohammedism were extremists who believed their leader, Hassan e Sabah, to be a direct descendant of Ishmael, son of Hagar, who they claimed was the real son of Abraham that he was prepared to sacrifice before God, rather than Isaac, son of Sarah, as in the Jewish biblical version of the story. The members of this sect were given opium and hashish in the mountain fortress that earned their leader the name Old Man of the Mountain. They were trained in murder and sent to infiltrate administrative positions in the governments and religions of the neighboring nations, and were willing to kill or even die themselves at the word of Sabah. Their philosophy was when nothing is true, everything is permitted. These people should not be looked down upon for their trance-like state of belief, which no more robs them of their independence and individuality than any other form of religion robs its respective members. They were almost never used in their capacity as assassins and actually accomplished a bloodless cultural coup instituting many popular humanist social reforms. This politic of Illuminism, a cultural coup d'etat, humanist social reforms, and enslaved soldiers from mind-controlled secret agents, seemed to, to ring especially true to the ears of the Knights Templar, and upon their return to Europe, they instituted an international banking and commerce system and were accused by the Pope and the French aristocracy of worshipping Baphomet, now believed by modern scholars to be a derivation of the name of Mohammed, peace be upon him, the Prophet of Allah, SWT. Illuminism derives its name from the illuminated manuscripts of the Ottoman Turks and the scholastics of Enlightenment-era Europe. Many fine reproductions of the Bible, the Koran, and various religious and mythological texts from both religions exist dating from this time, and the nouveau bourgeois of the mercantile class of Masonic trade guild unions burgeoning after the Crusades was awash with them, as well as the spices silks, and Persian rugs of trade. The tripartite hat 
marked Jacobin and Jacobite social clubs that predominated under the wig-wearing aristocracies of late Enlightenment-era Europe, and which were often funded by the elder scotch Rite Masonic lodges, which the Knights Templar had become, and which were even more Zionist, anti-papacy, and Gnostic enemies of the Catholic dogma than the Lutherans, Protestants, or Anglicans. The tea-sipping commoners took eagerly to the tactics of political upheaval represented by Illuminism. The most prominent of these was the former Jesuit monk Adam Weishaupt. He began an order called the Illuminati in Bavaria and had some unscrupulous ties to the Scottish and then young York rites of Freemasonry through some various shared colleagues and lodge members in Western Europe. This he had done in an attempt to protect him from the Jesuit order to which he had belonged, and from whom, it has been speculated, some of his gnosis was stolen. The Illuminati became infamous throughout Europe many years later, after Weishaupt's death, when the also new media of the printed newspapers uncovered and circulated copies of documents supposed to have originated from Weishaupt's sect, plotting a plan for the worldwide overthrow of all existing governments and religions. There is actually less evidence linking these documents to the Illuminati or any Masonic organization than there is that Adam Weishaupt faked his own death and moved to America where he became known as George Washington. Ironically, around the time that the Illuminati manifestos surfaced in the free press, the issue of the First National Bank, now known as the Federal Reserve, from which America loans money to third world countries as well as, still, to European nations just as under the Marshall Plan, and against which we charge them interest that causes our interest rates to rise the value of the dollar to decrease relative to the consumer cost basis, measured usually by the scale of minimum wage over inflation, and the international exchange rate to become imbalanced, was being argued between James Madison and Thomas Jefferson in the Federalist Papers in America, and introducing the press to the yellow journalism and the control of the issues covered by the news media by interested, independent, rich capitalist parties. It was also around the time of the illuminated manuscripts that fed the imagination of young Jesuits and Jacobins that the religious philosophy of Christ as the grand architect and the universe as essentially mechanical and beneath the removed deity became popular. This stemmed from the fresco depictions of Christ seated with a globe, an open book, and a compass on his lap that were common and popular in Eastern Orthodox Christian churches, and it became known as deism. Imagine the pole of the world held in the hand of its mass, like the parallel bar of an acrobat and see that it is not really the pole that moves, but the mass of the world around it, spinning like a circus gymnast. But the bar of this pole, too, is held in the grip of the gravity of the sun, and spun circularly around it in its orbit, so that the fixed directions of the cylindrical pole do not move relative to the fixed background. So, too, however, is the body of the sun twirling up around the bar of its poles, and this bar held in sway within the discus of the galaxy, spiraling around the core. So are all the galaxies of the universe engaged in a vast cosmic ballet, and our own Milky Way will one day collide with the galaxy called Andromeda. All of this pre-existed life, though since much of it only exists now as recorded information and rays of photons, 
It is more like the essence than is mundane human existence. With the heliocentric model of the solar system proposed by Galileo Galilei, which occurred around the same time as the beginning of Lutheranism and immediately followed the Spanish resurgence of Kabbalah, more and more people began to believe in the universe as being like an enormous clockwork machine created by God and maintained by God and or the angels of the spheres of the heavens. This began with representations of the spheres of the solar system that functioned gyroscopically. However, the idea would go on to flourish into an age of industrialized machines culminating in modern space-age computers. According to deism, the only universal laws are the laws of physics, and God may have created the universe. However, there is no evidence that can be gained using the laws of physics to deduce his continued presence or absence. In this way, Deism was an attempt to reconcile the Catholic concept of the Holy Ghost with the Gnostic concept of Christ as the Ascended Man. This is similar to the Shemhamfarash of Solomon, which demideified the workers on the first temple, or to the Necronomicon of the Sumerians, which demideified the workers on the Great Pyramid. Just like Gnosticism, Deism can be traced back to the times of ancient Egypt, where arose the practice of the anthropomorphic representation of cosmological processes that continues within the traveling lodge of Rosicrucianism to this day. This is also when representing the universe on earth by the leader of the occult began, that continued on through the Buddha and was passed to Jesus Christ. Here is where the Christian argument over the universal generalizability of the ghost king Koron's own from Kabbalistic mythology became associated with the concept of the last sacrifice by God of his living son, Jesus the anointed Christ. This was an argument between early scientists and the institutions of the Christian church only because, after the time of Christ, the occult became subject to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and exoterically became the Christian Church, which had a duly elected representative head, the Pope, and made no claims to divine right by bloodline, as had the kings of Israel, and as was attributed by the writers of the New Testament Gospels to Jesus known as the first pope. Meanwhile, the early scientists sought for God in natural consequences and turned further and further from the path laid out for them by the representationalist church. Martin Luther encouraged these scientists to sin and sin boldly. The Gnostic occult became the esoteric aspect the inner order of the sects, cults, and orders of the greater social institutions, whose secret doctrine was the agenda controlling the world. Much of what influenced deism and the mechanical revolution was the abundance of South American codices brought back into Spain by the conquistadors, containing beautiful pictographs describing the heavenly cycles that were attempted to be translated into Kabbalah. This began with a rethinking of early Hebrew mythology, but would ultimately lead to John Dee's Enochian system as well. Most of these Mayan and Aztec codices were, like the Dead Sea Scrolls of today, remanded over to the Catholic Church for inventory and translation. The oldest form known of the Kabbalah is the Tree of Life diagram, and it is supposedly in this form that it was delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai. This depicts the ten sephirah, or attributes of God, 
which are equivalent to the ten renunciations of sin that constitute the law of man. Perhaps the Kabbalah is ultimately best meditated upon as upon a mountain, for it is a height of its own, and a mass of its own, and a measure that must already be known. The Kabbalah is much more than these concepts alone, and thus it is known of psychologically, just as two entities know one another. It is, like humanity, more than the sum of its parts, and its knowledge only represents a reflection of its light. Understanding it rightly, we are clear in the presence of this light, and perceive it as wisdom. So do we know that wisdom is perceiving us, and yet that we are clear light, and that this is, moreover, nothing. It has been said about the study of Kabbalah, that fools rush in where angels fear to tread, a warning similar to the description of the weather of the month of March, in like a lion, out like a lamb. This is simply to warn brave fools that Kabbalah might make them into messiah-like messenger alien angels. God may giveth one eye and taketh away another. Kabbalah in itself cannot kill, but it can be used to kill, and much of the black arts of magic, Thelemic Satanism, and voodoo describe how such techniques as astral projection and remote viewing can also be used to induce experience at target sites. These techniques are not necessarily harmful. However, during the Cold War, both the Soviet and United States militaries experimented at psychokinetic assassination. The experiences at the projected locations that can induce sensation in observers are merely lower-level reflections of the mental conditioning of the remote viewer or astral projections physical source in the mind of the body. Therefore, the effects that can be turned to harm are the same that must be overcome to acquire skill with the mental aspects of the Kabbalah. This is similar to the radiation-induced hallucinations caused by exposure to the stones of the ram that eventually, with conditioning, heighten mental sensitivity and increase perceptual awareness. One of the predominant energy cycles identified by the Kabbalah is the double helix of mind and matter, and here we again find the Klyphoth, as juxtaposed to the Kabbalah, considered to be negative mental aspects, or equivalent to negative numbers on the same number line as Kabbalah, upon which mental thoughts are positive numbers. Since all physical materiality in the continuum of the universe is made up of the quantum probability wells of the cliffotic shells, which themselves represent the phi over pi spiral of geometry, through the n-dimensional multiverse. This is considered the exoteric aspect of the Kabbalah, while the true nature of the way of Kabbalah remains concealed and has only been described anthropomorphically as the oral tradition of human history. The naturally occurring form of the Kabbalah is phi over pi, where this is given as the measure of a wavelength that approaches, circumnavigates, and escapes from the opposite side of a sphere, represented by a hypersphere, or as the measure of a torus. This metaform, or fourth spatial dimensional hypershape, is considered ideal, along with the hypercube and the platonic solids, which also all occur along the same line of mathematical extrapolation as the torus. Numerically, this is encoded into the multiplication tables of 8 and 9, and revealed when the numbers of their factors are summed. Since this is an inherent gnomon in the mathematical structure, it exists irrelevant of its discovery, 
reflected more or less in all the rest of its parts holographically. While the meaning such an abstracted concept as a transcendental or transfinite number might have to the average person is probably very small, the fact that such concepts exist at all and do actually occur in the measurements of natural phenomenon, particularly evident according to statistical averaging, has universal applicability. In this way, the secrets of heaven can lay about directly beneath the noses of us all, and many times we might go without noticing them, particularly since the fuzzy logic processing systems of our neural nets perceive natural patterns as digital static. The comparison between phi over pi, as I have described, has largely been in the form of national and personal histories, as well as the records of cyclical events in the heavens. This has led to the animism of the zodiac and the anthropomorphication of religions. Because phi over pi describes negative entropy, it is justified in its associations with living forms, since, according to our survival instinct, we evolve opposite the odds that define the rest of the natural world. However, since phi over pi is a mathematically ideal archetype in the fourth dimension, it also represents the revolutions of entropy, the essence of time. Thus, phi over pi is as the inversion between the perpetual active survival of life and the gradual passive encroachment of death. As I have said before, the number set of the gnomon containing pi also contains phi, and thus, on one level, these numbers may be thought of as equivalent. However, more than this, by ancient reckoning, the gematriacal sum of the Hebrew letters of Kabbalah, Kaf, Bet, Lamed, and He, was equal to the denominator of Phi over Pi. In this way, moreover, did Phi over Pi as the greatest common factor of the factor sums of the multiplication tables of 8 and 9 become Kabbalah, the lowest common denominator of all mystery school esotericism. As I have also said before, the graph of phi over pi is a geometrical spiral in three dimensions that looks very similar to the coils of DNA inside human genes or the banding of electromagnetic field lines around the sun. This can be depicted as the seven color fields banded together around the surface of a tube torus. It is also thought to be the measure of the histories of gravitational singularities that are baby universes. In so far as phi over pi is universally generalizable, that is, ubiquitous, Kabbalah was thought by ancient peoples to represent the body of the living universe. In the East, this was expressed using harmonic vibrational energy fields, called the Atman, or auras, and interconnecting, multidimensionally faceted, and leveled relationships, called the Qi of Feng Shui. In the West, these concepts were both humanized into the soul and the spirit, called by Egyptians the Ba and the Ak, and by the Hebrews, Ruach and Neshima, and Kabbalah associated with the measurement of the geometries underlying and governing these forces. It was attempted to humanize Kabbalah, as had been the auric field into the astral soul and the chi of Feng Shui into the free spirit, and the result of this was the myth of Adam Kadman or Kabbalistic representation of the universe. According to this mythology, Adam Kadman, whom the Sumerians called Enki, was the twin aspect of Adam Homo, whom the Sumerians called Enlil. 
In the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see Gilgamesh, representing Enlil, trying to restore the life of his friend Enkidu, representing Enki. Similarly, in the Bible, the story of Cain killing Abel immediately follows that of Adam and Eve, and Cain's son was named after Set. Here we see that it was Lilith that was the wife of Adam Cadman. According to the mythology, Lilith died and was buried, and Adam Homo was made from the Adama, or red clay, of the earth of her tomb. Eve was made from Adam Homo's rib, which follows a phi spiral, and was tempted by Cadman in the form of a snake. According to Christian mythology, it was Adam Cadman who would be reincarnated as Jesus Christ, and therefore his death would be taken to atone for all the intervening sins of humanity since the original sin of Eve's temptation and the banishment from Eden. Enki was Sargon, and Enlil was Imhotep, and they were all one. All of this was actually occurring at that time in Egyptian pharaonic succession and was described by the indigenous mystery cult religion in the myth of the death of Osiris at the hands of Set and resurrection at the hands of Isis, his wife. Eden was an actual ancient town in the Sinai Peninsula, and it was from here that the Hyksos immigrated into Lower Egypt until the reign of Akhenaten, after which they were expelled and entered Canaan. Other than the archetypes of the slender Nazarene king in the west and the corpulent, opulent, recumbent Hoti in the east, no more attempts have been made to anthropomorphize the primary archetype of solar deity mystery schools since they first began supplanting feminine lunar cycle cults of the late Neolithic age. Subsequently to this, the Kabbalah has taken on increasingly geometrical forms in the hands of Ottoman Muslims and the Jews of Spain they left behind after their occupation. The geometrical lattices that can be extrapolated from the Tree of Life have been expanded upon as tessellations, or tiled patterns, and these regular patterns produce regular frequencies of brain waves and induce regular emotions. Thus, they have come to replace anthropomorphication of deity for Muslims as the true visage of God. It is true that this lattice can be extrapolated into many different natural and ideal patterns. The placement of the ten sephira as corners on the geometrical lattice that can be extrapolated between them depicts a shape that may be thought of as representing a hypercube at antipode. This references all the other forms and shapes along the gnomon measured by the number set of phi over pi. In this regard, it may be thought of as similar to the lattices of quantum mechanics which depict quantum behavior predictability as occurring in relationships between coordinate pairs of variables. In ascending order, the ten sephira are Malkuth, the kingdom, Yesod, foundation, Hod, splendor, Netzach, severity, Tifereth, beauty, Gevara, victory, Chesed, mercy, Binah, understanding, Chakma, wisdom, and Kether, crown. There are also the non Sephiroth of Shekinah, the bride of God, and Death, the veil of the abyss, as well as the spheres beyond the tree of life. Ein Sof Or, Limitless Light, Ein Sof, Limitless Nothing, and Ein, Limitlessness. These are arranged as upon three pillars called Passive, 
active, and neutral, such that on the passive column, understanding is above victory, is above splendor. In the active column, wisdom is above mercy, is above severity. And in the middle, neutral column, the crown is above beauty, is above foundation, is above the kingdom. Have you ever bumped into a cup of liquid and observed how the surface might wobble as it settles down, or ripples flow inward from the sides of its volume? Why does it turn around in a circle as it fluctuates up and down? Where does the current of the inward flowing ripples go after it disappears from the surface at the center of the cup? Such is all occurring for our galaxy right now so slowly it would take many modern lifetimes for there to be a change in it that we could see. It is slowly pivoting around in a spiral wobble around the central black hole, and the gravity of each of the stars is feeding back the gravity of the black hole just enough to slow their fall into galactic core to where they are in orbit around it. This leads to the sunspot cycle of stars and the wormhole cycle of galactic black holes. It has long been believed that the study of Kabbalah is associated with the study of sorcery and magic, and it is the case that much of occult esoterica is steeped in obscure terminologies and the attributions to various characters of different kinds of above-average skills. However, much of the campaign to occlude the occult in such mythology and ritual has occurred only among Kabbalistic scholars of the 20th century, such as Fraser's Golden Bow, the writings of Aleister Crowley, and Jungian psychology. Before this time, at which also occurred the publication of the Necronomicon, little association was made between the dead and the jinn as priests were thought to be the earthly representatives of God. Supposedly, many of these esoteric occult documents are translated from very ancient source texts, such as Sumerian scrolls and tablets, Egyptian papyri and stelae, Hebrew, Coptic, Gnostic, and early Christian apocryphal scrolls, although many of them, the history of which can be traced through the scholasticism of the medieval ages, when monks transcribed and translated many various older documents, some very badly indeed, are more dubious than those archaeologists have only recently discovered, which can be carbon dated, or those which historians have the originals. What these modern occult writers describe of the ancient pagan rituals is their knowledge of a cause and effect correlation existing as an ambient energy field, and the use of referentials to represent interactivity within this field. This has been catalogued and categorized by various different scholars, beginning with J.G. Frazier, who traced the origin of this belief to ancient Neolithic seasonal rites at sacred sites, beginning at the time of the Agrarian Revolution. Crowley discussed the use of a wand, a weapon, a chalice, and a discus as being the components of magic ritual representing the four elements, and the altar as representing the Kabbalah, particularly that of the four directional Enochian watchtowers, the four elements, and cosmos. He also draws relativity between the sacraments of Abramelin and the penances of Buddhism. According to this system, which is preferably practiced out in the wilderness such as the desert, or in a closed room which can afterwards be tokenly cleansed, the magician draws a magical circle around themselves to seal themselves off in the astral, magical world. Inside of this they draw a pentagram which seals their minds from all other minds, so it is thought. Outside of the circle they trace out a triangle. They stand within the circle and summon Koran's own into the triangle. 
Here they have discourse with the spirit realm. In the end, the triangle of Koranzon, the circle of the aura, and the pentacle of man are all swept away and the winds cleanse. It is claimed by modern scholars that this is the oldest form of ritual system and that it predates the beginning of the belief in the jinn in the Middle East. The difference between this and scrying is about the same as the difference between a Ouija board and a seance. Suffice it to say that scrying tends towards gematria, while ceremonial ritual tends more toward astrology. Sumerian astrology may date as far back as to the time of a great flood of the Tigris and Euphrates River and Nile River valleys as long ago as some 10 to 8,000 years. That may also have been the time when the Nile River changed the direction of its flow from east to west, emptying into the Atlantic, to south to north, emptying into the Mediterranean. It is possible the Nazca line stayed back even farther. Much worship of bulls predominated in the Middle East at that time, such as the Apis of Egypt and the bull hoppers of Minoan Crete. The zodiac could be used to measure the precession of the spring equinoxes, or the constellation along the ecliptic at sunrise, when the Earth was at northern hemisphere perigee to the sun. According to this cycle, the sun rises in a new sign about every 2,000 years. We are currently entering the age of Gemini. The age of Taurus is coming to a close. The time of Christ ended the age of Aries about 2,000 years ago. King Solomon's temple marked the ending of the age of Pisces about 4,000 years ago. The Great Pyramids marked the ending of Aquarius about 6,000 years ago. The birth of civilization began with the ending of the Age of Capricorn about 8,000 years ago. This marked the end of the last Northern Ice Age, and it was probably during this time that there had been flooding in the Middle East. Gematria is the ancient practice of assigning number sum numerals to letters. This was done to contribute to a language another layer of meaning. The number sums of words could be related to one another, and this would usually serve to accentuate the complementarity of the different words' meanings. As number sums, they could be arranged relative to one another in ways that could produce any type of mathematical relationship, and the use of magic number squares as token spells to ward off evil and accomplish one's goals dates back to the time even of Abraham. The form that this gives to the evolution of the Hebrew language is similar to the root words of Latin in the Romance languages, but on a more basic calculable level. During the 20th century, many esoteric documents were submitted to the French Bibliothèque Nationale. Many of these, all submitted by the same man, are purportedly documents of the modern esoteric priory of the Crusades-era Catholic Order of Zion that may have backed the Knights Templar. These give the names of many famous, less famous, moderately obscure, or completely unheard of people throughout history as the succession of heads of the order. The claim these documents themselves make to authority derives from several cipher documents containing crude geometric coding, allusions to deposed royalty, and sighting of a few sacred locations, one of which was supposed to have contained buried treasure. The Knights Templar probably discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls buried under the ruins of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, and, under the auspices of the King of Israel, transported them to the cave near Qumran, which would have been under the water level of the Dead Sea, 
at the time they had actually been written. It is possible that some of them may have been copied down and brought back with them to France, and that their persecution at the hands of the French monarchy and the papacy was the result of a search for any such copied documents. The Knights Templar that escaped fled to Scotland and established the 33 degrees of Scotch Rite Masonry, which would be shortened in the Anglican York Rite to exclude the degrees between 7 and 17 and between 18 and 33. It is thought that these initiatory rituals derive directly from the Gnosis brought back from the Holy Land by the Knights Templar. Some of the locations of sacred sites listed in the Priory documents include churches in Northern Europe which were early Masonic meeting sites, and these churches align with one another, often, in Masonic leyline geodesic geometry similar to that crudely represented in the cipher documents. The story of these documents describes the deposition of the Merovingian bloodline from the throne of aristocracy in France, and the list of heads of the order includes these deposed kings, and dates even further back than them, to the time and person of Christ. The documents do not make it clear if the list of heads of the order adheres to a bloodline-based, committee-selected, chosen, or initiated manner of succession. The root of the word Messiah the same as that of Moses, means both air and saved from water. This probably dates back to the earliest tribes of Africa and the first post-Diluvian civilizations of Mesopotamia and India. The Priory of Zion is, just as Judaism itself, Messianic. While in the West, this influence has been forced to remain veiled, esoteric, obscure, and occluded, it was embraced early on in the East with the creation of the social caste of the Vedics, or Brahmins and Lamas. In the West, the priests do not claim to possess enlightenment, only to be seeking it. The Order of the Golden Dawn an esoteric organization that arose early in the 20th century was the occult celebration of the ending of the dark night of civilization's youth and its coming-of-age ritual, the equinox of the gods. It was they who resurrected popular public interest in the arcane arts such as ESP. It should be worth noting to what lengths the world has gone subsequently to get itself electromagnetically interconnected. Recent archaeological discoveries in Chenoboskian of the Nag Hammadi Library and near Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea reveal a wealth of newly discovered apocrypha left out of the Bible from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. These include the treatises and stelae of Seth Apocalypses of Adam, Peter, and Paul, Apocrypha of James and John, Gospels of Marcion, Nicodemus, Matthew, Philip, Peter, Thomas, and Bartholomew, as well as Arab narratives of the Nativity, a Sophia of Jesus Christ, and the letters of Pontius Pilate. There have also been countless discoveries of ancient Sumerian tablets including hymns to and stories about Inanna and the lost books of Enki, which describe the same times as the Old Testament of the Bible and its Apocrypha, as well as the other existing written descriptions of the times of the New Testament, such as the writings of Pliny, Josephus, and the Muslim Quran. According to history, the oldest mystery school students were the Vedics of the Indus River Valley caste system civilization. These were all of the elderly who had devoted their entire lives to the community and were then exiled into the wilderness to seek the meaning of life. We see in tribal communities that continue to exist to this day in Africa and Australia 
that it is usually the elderly of the tribe that are the medicine men and healers, while the younger men and women are hunter-gatherers. The Vedic caste of the class system merely codified this and banished the wizened to outside of the populated towns and countrysides. They established small communes, often out in the wilderness far from society, and here the art and practice of meditation was born. It is believed that the idea of the third eye originates from this time, and it is an idea that continues to be propagated to this day. Supposedly, the first Vedics were a pale or blue-skinned race called the Aryans, who wrote the Rig Vedas and then migrated north to India into China, where several Anglo-Saxon, Celtic-looking bodies have been found ritually mummified. Thus it is believed that, long ago, perhaps at the time of Stonehenge was built, the Gallic, Gaelic, Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, Slavonic, and Cossack peoples immigrated westward across the Urals and Aryan Mountains into Europe from across the Siberian steppes and displaced the last of the Cro-Magnon culture of the late last Ice Age. At around the same time, there was a wave of Hyksos migration out of Sumeria into Egypt. Their series of leaders, Enki, Sargon, Imhotep, Khufu, Kefren, Akhenaten, are complemented by a series of Sumerian names, Enkidu, Scorpion Man, Humbaba or Hammurabi, Gilgamesh, Inanna, and Utnapishtim, a series of Hyksos names, Cadman, Satan, Abraham, David, Solomon, Jesus, as well as a series of Nubian names. Thoth under Shu and Tefnut, Set, Thoth under Isis and Nephthys, Osiris, Horus, and Ra. Later, the Hyksos would leave Egypt and settle in Canaan on the Gaza Strip. It is to these people that we owe all our early metaphysical legislation. The Vedic philosophy is known to have influenced early Egypt, where the belief in the third eye became associated with the Ajna serpent of the crown of Upper Egypt. To understand the significance of this sixth sense of 360 degree mental conceptual projective space is to realize that the thalamus in which mental holography occurs connecting multiple neurons simultaneously through individual neurons is what separates mammals from reptiles. Remember also the attribution by Hermes Trismegistus of Poimandres to Draco and that constellation's position as pole star above the heads of the dinosaurs. The pale races had obviously come from the continental shelf of India through the exposed lands of Oceania, known in mythology as Lemuria, while the Nubian pyramid builders of Africa had come out of South America, where their presence has been recorded in some 60-ton stone-carved Olmec heads, as well as the various jaguars of the Popol Vuh, along with later depictions of Quetzalcoatl, a Caucasoid bearded civilizer who also departs to the east, promising to return. It seems that the first race of Homo sapiens, who lived alongside Cro-Magnons, emigrated out of Africa along the coastline of Asia and Lemuria before the continental shelf of India had joined with Asia into Australia, then upwards through and populating the Mongolian Orient up to the Beringian land bridge where some crossed over into the Americas to settle, probably by simultaneous land crossing, becoming the sparsely populated North Americans, and following the shoreline in reed boats, becoming the vastly overpopulated South Americans, all then known as Atlanteans.
Hominids have been living in Africa longer than anywhere else in the world, followed closely by Australia. The indigenous life forms of these two continents have remained much the same over the long aeons of the millennia. They are tribal people who hunt and fish and trade between villages the game that they catch and the fruits and vegetables the women and children gather. The elders are stargazing shaman. In Australia, they are known as the watchers over or the keepers of dreamland. In Africa, the Dogon tribes people, who are thought to be history's eldest surviving astronomers, still preserve a ritual with a maypole thought to represent the sidereal rotation of the binary stars that comprise the Sirius system at the heel of Orion the Hunter. It is not known how their observations can be so exact. However, some of their ancient cave paintings preserve depictions of ellipses that seem to represent Sirius, as well as spirals and labyrinths, as are seen in many other Paleolithic cave painting and rock carving sites around the world. It is in Ethiopia, wherein is the Aswan Lake, that is the source of the Nile. Ethiopia, at the time of the end of the last ice age, as well as the entire Sahara, were fertile grassland and savanna, with thick, dark, rich soil that received ample seasonal floods that turned the grasslands gradually more and more awash. By the time of the building of the pyramids, the Nile had stopped flooding regularly, and the Sahara and the Giza Plateau dried up and turned into the sands of the desert. Now, more than 4,000 years later, Ethiopia is no longer receiving the amount of precipitation it once did, and the Aswan Lake has been dammed in order to produce electricity and form a water reserve to protect the people against their crops dying out, the soil turning to mud or sand or clay, and the children starving. In ancient Africa dwelt he who was known as Thoth, Enoch, or Utnapishtim. It is believed to be to this man that the art and craft, the tools and instruments of magic as they still exist to this day, can be credited as his creations. It was also, later, the biblical era home of the Queen of Sheba, believed to be a reincarnation of the hollow gnomonic archetype of Shiva of India, Inanna, Ishtar or Ashtarte of Sumer, and Isis of Egypt. According to the Keber Nagast, a sacred Ethiopian Old Testament apocrypha, she had a son with Solomon, the king of Israel and chief architect of the first temple to Yadevade. And when the Babylonians came to burn the temple, this son, named Menelik, rescued the Ark of the Covenant from the Holy of Holies and brought the sacred stone tablet of testimony to Ethiopia. This stone was stored in a secluded monastery near Lake Aswan until the end of the 20th century, when it was moved into a church within the surroundings of Aksum, a larger city. The ancient Vedics all shaved their heads and wore their skulls bald to the skin. The hair follicles are simply columns of dead skin cells that contain better traces of genetic material than fingernails, which contain keratin, though both continue to grow after death. Both pubic hair and fingernails grow flat and faster on one side than the other, such that they spiral and kink. Some people in ancient China and modern South America have grown their fingernails as long as almost half a mile, and such that they wrap together by never cutting them. It was also thought that the hair follicles falling before the eyes were like the filaments of galaxies, only a material distraction visible as an illusion of light. This practice seems to have been initiated with Siddhartha, just as the compulsive Muslim cleaning rituals and the ritual baptism were introduced among the Essenes around the time of Yeshua ben Padia. 
before these two teachers, who may have been reincarnations of the same hollow mnemonic archetype. The Hebrews and the Vedics wore their hair and beards long, and such marked the faces of Abraham and Moses, Lao Tse and Confucius. In the times when men wore beards, in the Oriental lands, a token game arose similar to the game from Sumeria that would come to be called chess. Both were based on the sum 64. The chessboard has 64 squares, and the I Ching has 64 hexagrams. These both represent the 64 codons of the genetic code. 64 times 6 gives the number of Tao rods or cheese sticks represented originally by yarrow spliffs of bamboo in the complete 64 hexagram King Wen sequence of the I Ching and this number 384 corresponds to the number of nights in a lunar cycle the time it takes for the moon to orbit around the earth and to rotate about itself the lunar cycle corresponds to the sunspot cycle as the moon goes around the earth while the earth goes around the sun such that the combined gravity of the earth the moon and the other planets generates more or less sunspots prominences and solar flares in the electromagnetic coiling on the surface of the sun this was marked along with certain other events such as the pentacular sidereal rotation of venus in accordance with various cycles, including the precession of the equinoxes. Many of the Semitic Muslims who had moved into Ottoman-occupied Spain during the late Middle Ages did not want to leave when the Christians reconquered Spain and reinstituted the Spanish monarchy. These people were forced to become Jews by the conquering Christians, since the two terms were interchangeable pagan concepts in their doctrinally indoctrinated minds. However, after the Christians retook Rome and the rest of Italy, they began waging pogroms on these anathema peoples who had chosen to remain behind, and who were, by then, also being joined by Gnostic Goths from across the Urals. During the short period between the end of Muslim occupation and the beginning of Christian pogroms, however, more study of Kabbalah was generated by a single group of people than any group of people since the ancient Egyptian mystery cult some 4,500 years before. Here we see the works of the various rabbis of biblical commentary compiled in the Zohar, or Book of Splendor. It is also thought to have been at this time that the Sefer Yetzirah, and commentary thereupon, was first written down, and this text had only been preserved as an oral tradition since before the time of Moses. These two books were considered to be the two key texts on the Kabbalah, and their understanding is great wisdom. It is thought to be this time period also that produced the work of Abra Malin, this period in history led to the beginning of the Catholic Order of Zion and the Renaissance, as well as the beginning of banking and finance rate monopolies by non-church officials or royal bloodlines. At the same time as the Knights Templar transported the Dead Sea Scrolls, in Europe they established an international banking and interest-bearing finance system similar to the taxation system of the governmental institutions and tithing systems of the edifice of the church. This was handled by the Order of Zion under the auspices of instituting the Gnosis of the Ishmaelis, and it rigorously recruited the former Muslims living in Spain, who had converted to Judaism, the Jews of France, and the Orthodox of Italy. Thus, when the Templars were persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and the French aristocracy, they were able to funnel their channels of currency through other countries and elude the full seizure of all of their assets. Then the remaining Templars of France sailed to Scotland and established masonry at Roslyn Chapel. Much of what constituted Templar riches and wealth 
was the Gnostic documents they had copied and translated from Qumran. These formed much of the basis for the symbolism of speculative initiatory masonry. This is the beginning of the additional, now lost, degrees of regular craft masonry. In these rituals, it states very specifically that the lodge must first be opened to conduct business of any of these levels of initiated degree before it can begin to do so, as well as that anyone who is caught discussing the contents of these degrees with non-masons should be killed. Simultaneously to the persecution of the Templars at the end of the Crusades and the success of the anti-royalist and anti-church banking system came a wave of migration into Europe from the east of fair-skinned, dark-haired Goths. These were usually gypsies, traveling merchants and traders who brought with them various souvenir items from the Silk Road, Persia, Turkey and Greece. It was thought to have been they that invented the card game and deck of playing cards of the Tarot. Although this was originally a 72 card set, the 22 trumps and the princess or knave cards have been omitted from the playing card decks of today. At the time this game was known to the French aristocracy and was popular in Italy. Characteristic attributes were assigned to the trumps, and they were used by gypsy soothsayers in fortune-telling, and endless varieties of games derived from the endless shuffling of the numbered cards of the deck. Such packs and decks would continue to be produced throughout the late Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Age of Reason, and the Enlightenment. Playing cards and profits are still popular today. The time of the Tarot's earliest appearance begins with the Gnostic documents and ends with the bringing back from America of the South American codices. It is unknown if it was thought at the time to be associated with Kabbalah. However, subsequent researchers, such as the Rosicrucian Order of the Golden Dawn or the Thelemic Order of Oriental Templars, have associated the Tarot Trumps with the 22 paths on the Tree of Life diagram, and with the attributions of letters and states of consciousness to these given in the Sefer Yetzera. The 72 cards of the Tarot, when each is assigned an attribute, form all of the deacons by day and by night over the three periods of ten that make up each of the twelve signs of the zodiac. So this number can be extrapolated from the ancient Egyptian annual calendar and represents the number of years in which the Earth's pole possesses one degree of 360, since there are exactly five times two times three of these per sign of the zodiac. Around the same time Christ was being crucified in the Middle East, the pyramids of Teotihuacan and the Yucatan Peninsula were being erected to the sun and moon, aligned with Osiris, and the way of the dead between them flooded with water. From this culture, which also produced Pakal Votan of Palanque, comes the great wheel of time called the Tzolkin, that is aligned to calculate for sidereal rotations of Venus, the precession of the Earth's pole as seen at the equinoxes, the lunar monthly calendar, and the solar 11-year sunspot cycle. This seems like an awful lot for a Neolithic culture and only agrarian civilization to have accomplished in such a short amount of time. However, remember that their equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls were the Ica Stones of Peru. The equivalent to the Stone of Ram was the perfectly carved crystal skulls ubiquitous to South America, and elongated human skulls of Nazca. Remember also that they followed the Olmec culture, who, it is thought, constructed the Nazca lines. There is little reason to doubt that Plato's Atlantis described the Altiplano in South America, the only place to find Orichalc in the known world, that lay far inland, but which was a grid of circular canals and square lots of ground 
with the channel leading all the way out into the Atlantic Ocean. Similarly, it is possible that this occurred at the same time as the flooding in the Tigris and Euphrates, Nile and Indus River valleys, and the submersion of cities off the coast of Japan, Spain, and Cuba at the end of the last Ice Age, and that the mythology of the subsequent cultures may reflect an earlier learning involving knowledge of precession. It is clear that some of the existing Neolithic sites with astral alignments were built before a change in the world's ocean levels, since they are only partially submerged. In any event, at the same time the Muslims were beginning Sufism, the Mayans were engaged in a rubber ball sport. Philosophy killed God, and magic consumed him. Beyond this, there is no trace of God. The heavenly spheres all function deistically, while mankind struggles with Gnosticism, attempting to obtain mathematical ideals. These are all only metaphors. In modern times, there is a great need to perpetuate karma, allowing it to flow through one without hindrance, clinging, or obstruction. This may only amount for some to the exchange of consumer goods and services, but it amounts in Ethiopia to starvation. The Kabbalah of the heavenly spheres proceeds as if indifferently. This is the reenactment on the deified archetypal level of the death and resurrection of the central solar deity reflected in the rise and fall of human civilization. This occurred first between Sargon and Enki, then between Imhotep and Tahotep, then between Khufu and Kephren, then between David and Solomon, and then between Buddha and Christ. After this, if it continued, it did so esoterically, as since this time Christian calendars have not reflected the procession of the zodiac. In modern times, the multiverse has become so congested with interdimensional traffic of information that it is difficult to discern the distracting from the inspiring. This is because the octagonal and orthogonal leg of this polarity, representing Thoth, is missing from the hexagonal representation of the Ichthos Christos cross with the Rex Yeorum crown. In the present mode, there is concentrated activity to construct and improve upon electromagnetic communications, and these extend as far as research involving synchronicity as an a-causal connecting principle that can be manifested disparately electromagnetically, such as the simultaneity of a phone call or a live broadcast on a television set. This permeates the airwaves of Earth and spreads far off into the distant cosmos. Beyond this, rays of photons communicate electromagnetic signals from distant ancient stars. Just as the clock of Earth's precession is measured by the movement of the entire galaxy of the Milky Way, so it is thought there are connecting fields between the electromagnetic bubbles of the galaxies in the filaments, walls, and voids. Traveling in a temporal singularity is as simple as measuring the time of a radioactive decay atomic clock on the ground or in orbit outside the atmosphere, for when these are compared they will be seen to have become different. When waves of electromagnetic information overlap, they form temporal wormholes and some information travels backward in time, even through the mediated communication system. While some wait for the coming of Wormwood as one big event, Earth has already become riddled with spiraling karmic centers, ley lines, and commercials. As I have described, Phi over pi is the measure of the histories of gravitational singularities unwinding 
outside of the universe into baby universes. The measure of the perpendicular wormholes through the multiverse inside the event horizons of black holes. The measure of the statistical average of electromagnetic to gravitational relationship between stars in spiral galaxies and the black holes at their cores. The measure of a star's electromagnetic polar field lines coiling around its differentially rotating gas surface as well as the measure of the Earth's polar precession. These comprise most of the processes we would define as the causes for entropic matter-energy interchange in the universe. It is reasoned that because the hypercube is one measure of phi over pi, this is why the ancients depicted Kabbalah as the hypercubic tree of life. Kabbalah as the hypercube of time can be thought of as a geometric lattice depicting the mathematical matrix for phi over pi, the vector of entropy. As I have described, the tree of life diagram is far from the only representation of this shape. The hypercube can be depicted as nested at perigee, as the tree of life at antipode, at apogee, as the octahalahedron, as well as as a regular cube. The same shape is represented by the singularity, line, plane, sphere, hypersphere, and tube torus, as well as by the cone, the tetrahedron, the hypertetrahedron, the tetrasosahalahedron, hypertetrahedron at antipode, as well as all the other platonic solids and their hyperspatial equivalents. Mathematically, it is represented by the sums of the digits of the factors of the multiple tables of 8 and 9. The ancient name for Neolithic petroglyphic sacred sites was Shems. Their builders were associated with the earliest civilizers, called the Nephilim in Sumeria and the Anunnaki by Enoch of Ethiopia. The beatific visions of the celestial cosmos of the earliest cultures rival the pictures of the Hubble Space Telescope today, and their understanding of the intricate workings of temporal relativity, often superior even to modern science. Their source of inspiration was only sacred stones, they say. Sites such as Stonehenge do lock in a temporal vector as the world turns and as it orbits around the sun. The amount of visitors to such sites, generating greater amounts of karmic energy, might determine how strong the signal is for that particular site at a particular position in its cycle, and, it is speculated, this might also bear some relationship to the position of the other planets as well as the stellar background. Such sacred stone shems often align with celestial events in the heavens at certain times, as if to mark the cycles of this karmic energy flow and link the lives of their visitors to the stars in the heavens. While the stone hinges in England and America Karnak in France, the pyramids in Corral and Marabeca, and the Nazca lines in South America are all believed to be prehistoric sites for which no histories of their creators still exists. The remainder of the world's monumental petroglyphs post-date this, and a history of their construction is recorded. While no mention is made of the construction of the Great Pyramids in the Hebrew Bible, the earliest reference made to such monumental petroglyphic construction is to the Tower of Babylon. While the Sumerians themselves record a history of the palatial hanging gardens of Babylon, they do not make reference to a tower, and so the tower is probably a metaphor for the ziggurat style that was adopted for the later pyramids of Egypt. The Sumerian history does record a war in the heavens that is not described in the Old Testament, though. The Nephilim, who had come through the Shems, 
descending to earth from above in flying ships, had brought with them and implemented all the elements of early Sumerian civilization, from agriculture and metallurgy to free trade and the law. They produced a ruling lineage that would also establish pharaonic kingship over unified Egypt and the far distant Indus River Valley. However, the Hyksos and Nubian Egyptians turned on the Sumerian Nephilim, saying, Let us build a Shem of our own, that we may go up and look into the heavens. And, with the building of the pyramids, broke from Sumerian and Akkadian influence, and this also ended all communication with the East until the time of Alexander the Great. Since this time, control of the stele of the Shems has been in the possession of the Sanhedrin. We are perpetually bombarded by subliminal suggestions, and these guide us through the definitions of what choices we have to make. It is thought to work essentially the same way for the universe as a whole, bombarded by gravity, which creates the curvature of space-time. The vector of entropy can be thought of as a tunnel reality, a wormhole through the multiverse. Our perception is primarily controlled by one thing, brain waves. The memory engrams we access, the fourth dimensional metaforms that trigger emotional cascades of neurotransmitters, and the difference between waking consciousness and unconscious dreaming are all functions of the electromagnetic waveform state of the neural kinetic energy field native to our brains. This single factor controls how we see the entire world, and it is itself entirely regulated by the thalamus. The thalamus sits just ahead of the hippocampus, and it is in the hippocampus that the electrical biorhythms that regulate the autonomic and peripheral nervous functions originate. However, the constant projection of energy into the hippocampus, where it is then pulsed, derives from the thalamus, which sits just before it in the interiormost portions of the brain. This system is self-regulating, such that the biorhythms of the hippocampus control the nerves and the heart and these send signals through the thalamus which contribute to the projection of energy into the hippocampus. Note that the flow of energy into the thalamus, out of the thalamus into other parts of the brain, and out of the hippocampus are all pulse regulated. However, the flow of energy from the thalamus to the hippocampus is a steady stream it is from this that our sense of time derives, and by light of which, in relation to time, that we define ourselves. The willpower also derives from the thalamus, as it is the holographic relay depot that mentally projects outside of the body. In this respect, it serves the function of the ajna, or the third eye of ancient mythology. It is by holographic projection through the thalamus that karma arises in our aura, and it is from this karma that we extrapolate to make choices. Thus, the history of karma comprising our aura can be thought of as such a tunnel reality, or wormhole through the multiverse. Two different groups of people describe the same conditions, for two separate forms of experience. One is UFO abductees. The other are victims of mind control abuse experiments. It is widely known that the memory is selective. We pick and choose what we want to remember when we want to remember it in as much as we are able to. It has also long been known that memory can, like the perceptual senses, fade with age, and one particular disease of the brain that can cause this that has been identified is Alzheimer's. Beyond all of these natural conditions or ailments, the memory occurs much like sense perception in the brain, 
with neuroelectrical activity triggering neurotransmitter cascades in different areas of the cerebrum, often coordinated through the thalamus. The only physical effect of memory is that neurotransmitters trigger reuptake inhibitors, opening gates for increased cathexis through axon dendrite gaps which exchange more neuroelectric activity and this causes neurons to grow together into the clusters that comprise the columns or pillars of cells in the cerebrum. The nerves function holographically, actually reproducing a small image from electrical impulses in the many millions of intricate neural connections. It is thought that cognitive dissonance triggers mental activity by the juxtaposing of two holographically projected ideas in the mind occurring simultaneously. Thus, it is also thought that the sudden resolution of two contradictory views can trigger a euphoric state of transcendence and subsequent loss of focal concentration. If forced, this effect can trigger a sudden moment of memory loss. This is the concept behind brainwashing and the practice of memory recovery and erasure. By maintaining a state of placid, detached suspension of disbelief, one can enter a tranquilly flowing tunnel reality and drift away into obscurity and a life of moderation. This concept is based on the brainwave state of daydreaming, or waking trance, usually associated with cognitive dissonance produced by dividing one's attention between the external reality and the internal realm of imagination, dream, and memory. As I have described, the history of our auras can be thought of as tunnel realities, or wormholes through the multiverse, and our thalami as interactive choice-making mental projectors. I have also described how, in cognitive dissonance, internal and external stimuli can be processed by the brain simultaneously. In remote viewing, the mental projective space is attempted to be transported to a target site while the aura and the body remain in a fixed location. This can be simple, short-distance ESP of correspondences and acausal synchronicities, telepathy upon or between people, or it can be long-distance remote viewing of objects, people, or places. Just as it is possible for an autistic to consciously do large computations, it is possible we all do unconsciously, so some part in ESP and remote viewing might only be awareness of recurrent patterns and telepathy between people, only attention to context. This leads to the field of precognition, or the ability to foresee events before they occur. This often happens to people at random, and in these cases, which can come in the form of a dream, a recurring theme in their lives, or personal observations, or even simply a deep sense of foreboding, the premonist subject matter is usually a disaster. This has also been accomplished intentionally as the result of guided practice to focus the concentration. This sort of waveform of perception has a strong interactivity with the field of its awareness and can often produce negative emotions in those who have randomly foreseen disasters. Thus, it is thought to be the synchronicity of emotional energies between the receiver and the victims that causes the distortion of time in hyperspace connecting them. Telekinesis is the control of space-time matter energy by the conscious bending or warping of this thalamic mental projective temporal wormhole through the aura on the karma in the multiverse. The thalamic mental projective holographic space is a two-way circuit as information flows in and out through the thalamus. This perceptual space sees in three dimensions and 360 degrees in all directions. 
It has long been associated with the Ajna, or the all-seeing eye. The concepts of right thought and right action have been held as virtues by Buddhists since the times of the ancient Vedics. As I have described, their goal was to create an entire class of holy and enlightened seers and seekers of truth. In the ancient Middle East, the Hebrews believed that a prophet came among each generation to interpret the teachings of the Lord. As time progressed, these two beliefs grew closer and closer together, until the time of Christ, when Messiahism was at its historical height. There were countless members of the generations claiming to be prophets, visionaries, illuminated seers, cult leaders, and messiahs. Few of these people are remembered, and besides the name Jesus, the name Marcion means next to nothing to the common person. The belief in the Messiah is the belief in a chosen one, an anointed representative of the age of man. The goal of producing one has existed among the people since the first bloodlines arose as conquerors. The elect is the king of the masses, and held by them as a king over all the other kings. This practice predominates even though the entity may only exist as an ideal archetype. The Order of Zion, who had funded the Templar expedition to and archaeological excavations at the ruins of the Second Temple, may have had some interest in the messianic breeding program of the Hebrews. Much work had been done during the Middle Ages by alchemists attempting to recreate the conditions of conception for various different kinds of homunculi, from the metal and the mineral to the vegetable and animal. The order may have adopted a position of sympathy for the Hebrew conception agenda as part of a campaign to preserve medieval alchemical manuscripts. While the Catholic Order of Zion would eventually become, according to the documents, the Priory of Zion, a more detached body of the Catholic Church, or even a separate sect altogether, they are thought to have remained the secret chiefs of the inner order of the Freemasons after the first lodge was formed by the last Templars. This has allowed the agenda of the Messianic breeding program to continue without the Catholic Church's direct assent or even, necessarily, awareness. It has been one of the primary occult currents throughout Masonry as it has grown internationally and has influenced many new religions which have arisen since then including the polygamy of Mormonism and the descriptions of UFO abductees. The result of this has been the upswing on the asymptote of population growth that has occurred in the past couple centuries. Many people emigrated from old world countries to the new world, redistributing the world's population, and since then many third world nations' populations have been expanding due to lack of contraceptive technologies. Here we see that populations grow where the food is, but follow where the wealth goes, and that a lifestyle of leisure and philosophical repose is considered by the first world bourgeoisie, the class created by Masonic Jacobins, to be more ideal, and this is in keeping with the ideals described throughout history. Many people in the Western world follow the Gregorian calendar, which is based on the estimated birth date of Christ as around the year zero, and divided such that the dates before Christ are counted backward from year zero, and those Anno Domini, after death, counted forwards. This calendar, unlike the Buddhist, Hebrew, Muslim, Ethiopian and Mayan calendars marks a specific event in the cosmic cycle of time for which the other calendars give dates of the beginning and intermittent endings. The Buddhist calendar is based on the Hindu conception of the yugas or ages that are the cosmic cycles of the universe's beginning and ending given by the beginning of Buddhism. 
The Hebrew calendar is based on the date of the fall of man and beginning of the generations recorded in the Torah. The Muslim calendar's dates revolve around the Battle of Masada, recorded as being prophesied at an earlier date as the fall of the rebel angels. These Enochian angels actually describe the divisions of the processional cycle of Earth's poles, and this the Ethiopian calendar measures by the twin star system's revolution in Sirius. The Mayan calendar measures the precession of the electromagnetic poles of the Sun by calculating concurrently the sidereal rotations of Venus, the 13 lunar monthly phases of the Moon over 384 days, and the 11-year sunspot cycle. The Gregorian calendar only calculates figures for the cyclical patterns of orbital alignments that occurred during the variable year zero. The calendar is based on the beginning of man, the beginning of Vedic Buddhism, or a battle in the Jewish revolt. Do not make predictions about the future. While those based on astronomical events such as planetary alignments, sidereal rotations, or electromagnetic cycles of the sun or of the planets do. The path of man is phi bound, while the path of the heavenly spheres is bound to pi. Phi is tangential, pi is regular. In this way, humanity is the measure of the heavens, and the heavens the measure of humanity. Those systems that do account for predictions of humanity's future according to the heavens can only do so as a superimposition of both types of calendrical system. 15,000 years ago, mammoths were flash frozen in Siberia while eating tropical vegetation. 12,000 years ago, Egypt was a fertile savanna. 6,000 years ago, Sumeria and India were lush gardens. 500 years ago, Ethiopia was fed by the flooding of the Aswan Lake and Nile River. And it is due to the gradual precession of the electromagnetic and gravitational poles that environmental conditions in these regions have changed. The fossil record indicates that there are no lands on Earth that were not settled by Homo sapiens shortly after the end of the last ice age, as well as populations of Cro-Magnons in America and Europe, and even earlier than the last ice age, as much so by Paleolithic, Australopithecine, and Neanderthal hominids. The Shems stand to testimony to the fact that earlier humanity made measure of the celestial events in the heavens and the existing calendars of the world remain today produced from many such observations. There is no reason to doubt that such calendars can be used to predict future celestial events in the heavens. These calendars predict that, as solar precession continues, one hemisphere of the Earth will gradually be moved toward the Sun at one time of Earth's annual orbit such as at perihelion or aphelion. This is the effect that causes the seasons. As the hemispheres of the Earth are moved around the precessing pole, as it tilts toward or away from the Sun per half Earth's orbit, the seasonal conditions of the two polar hemispheres gradually reverse. Thus, when it is summer in one hemisphere, it is winter in the other. As the pole gradually processes around, a different hemisphere will eventually come to be exposed to the sun at the same place in its annual orbit. This process takes about 26,000 years and is measured by sunrise in the spring equinoctical sign of the ecliptic zodiac. For about 12,500 years or so, summer and winter conditions gradually increase in each of the two polar hemispheres, such that, as the summer of one lasts longer, the winter of the other lasts longer. This is thought to be 
in accord with the sunspot cycle. For about one-third of this time, there are ice age conditions in one hemisphere or the other. We are currently in the middle of northern hemisphere summer and the beginning of autumn, while the southern hemisphere is at the end of its winter, entering spring. As spring becomes summer in the southern hemisphere, autumn will become winter in the northern hemisphere. Since the end of the last ice age, people have believed that the world will end. Since this means different things to different people, just as we are perpetually passing through predicted dates for the world to end, so is the root emotion of these beliefs the fear that the world is already ending. The ancient hominids practiced ritual burial, perhaps with the foresight that their buried remains might one day be discovered and brought back to life. This practice would eventually lead also to ancient mummification, which may have begun with the discovery of the peoples of the late last ice age when freezing conditions preserved bodies. The belief that the world will end dates back to the Rig Vedas, in which Vishnu is described as controlling the tug of war over a giant serpent, as depicted in the temple of Angor Wat, which is aligned with Draco, the constellation that surrounds the North Polar Star. The Vedic calendar gives the ages of the Creator, the Maintainer, and the Destroyer, and, like the later Mayan calendar, records the destruction of the world by the different elements at various times before. Astrology, or the recording of the alignments of the planets with the twelve signs of the zodiac, began concurrently in ancient Sumeria, and it was thoroughly recorded openly by Muslims and in secret by Catholics before being brought to the European nobility during the Crusades and subsequently strongly influencing Masonic Jacobins as a motif for design elements in architecture. Some apocalypses are actually included in the canonized Bible, though they are usually misinterpreted as literal descriptions rather than as depictions of heavenly cycles or, later, holonomonic archetypes associated with them. The descendants and inheritors of the same people that included these revelations, and not others, even more orderly and detailed, have based their apocalyptic dates on various gematriacal interpretations of the text, relative other biblical prophecies, and on the Gregorian calendar. Different apocalyptic cults have formed over the intervening years since Christ that have given different dates all of which have come and gone. Some of these cults have disbanded, but others were willing to give up their lives for, to their belief. The most recent such cult was the UFO called Heaven's Gate, who sacrificed themselves to the comet Hale Bop. It is probably because of the need to preserve law and order that the truth of procession is not known more commonly. It has been thought, based on Spartacus alone, since the time of Marx, that the masses would rise to revolution if they discovered that religion was only a concealment of a global environmental fact. More than being a revelation and vehicle for the transmission of this fact, religion offers one a glimpse at the gateway to escaping procession forever. This, it alleges, only appears physically to be a humble life of moderation and contemplation. As I have described, churches are centers of karma. They have existed longer than sports arenas and are considered archetypal rather than stereotypical. The worship in a church differs little from independent worship on one's own, except that it allows for fellowship among the parishioners. In this way, it differs from the theatrical experience of the stage or film. 
All of these things are merely the displacement in mental projective space of superfluous karma, or a cognitive dissonance triggering a mental electrical engram, and the free will to invert this into mental clarity. The Shems were the original karmic centers, and they are often positioned near or above underground rivers. At some intermittent point, the distances between them were measured as geodesics on the surface of the earth, and these lines of connection called ley lines. The alignment of later abbeys, churches, and cathedrals in Europe all describe exact geodesics relative to one another also. Some of these are even based on latitudes and longitudes that existed during previous positions of the poles. Since 1000 AD Gregorian, people have believed in the imminent return of Christ as foretold in the apocalyptic scripture. At this time, the devout followers believed that they will vanish from the surface of the earth and be taken directly up to heaven. This belief, called the rapture, was espoused by Joseph Smith and is a central precept of his religion, Mormonism. After his predicted dates for the rapture had lapsed, some members of his cult still remained to establish the Church of Latter-day Saints of today. This corresponds to the belief in wormwood, described by the prophet John of Patmos as a portion of the heavens falling to earth. This is simply good apocalyptic literature, since it can be interpreted in a million different ways. For the dinosaurs, it had a very literal meaning, since we think it to have been an asteroid that resulted in their extinction. For the later cavemen and early Sumerians, this may have meant the correspondence between the representational zodiac and the constellations in the ecliptic. For Enoch, this meant the fall of the rebel angels. For Solomon, the summoning of the Goetia to raise the temple. For Buddha, Christ, and Muhammad, their teachings. For all of these have followed in the messianic current of coming to stand for or represent the meaning of their time. The return of Christ is based on the zodiacal predictions for the astrological events that occurred during Jesus' life from around 0 to 33 AD. These are simply part of a recurring cycle that marks the spring equinox's entry into a new constellation in the ecliptic zodiac. At the time of Christ, the age of Aries was just ending, and the age of Taurus just beginning. Insofar as Shems are karmic centers, they can serve as calibrating vectors for time-space teleportation such as can be accomplished by expanding open a wormhole. Doing so accesses the multiverse, the n-dimensional gravitational warping of geometry comprising hyperspace, or the sum over histories of all possible dimensional extrapolations upon our universe that comprises the exterior surface of time-space, the interior of which is the surface of space-time comprised by the speed of photons that occurs as the infinite potential for random quantum fluctuation producing probability wells that is the essence of the universal continuum. In hyperspace, the laws of physics are distorted such that mental projection, such as occurs for the thalamus, instantaneously manifests. There is no other force to induce cause and effect, and therefore no such thing as real karma, since the manifestations are only hollow mnemonic reflections of the light of the self, extensions of the free will, and therefore none of these projected reflections continue existing beyond their sight, and cannot therefore correspond with one another to form a webwork of synchronous a-causal consequence. 
This experience is equivalent to the dream reality one would experience inside the event horizon of a black hole as one asymptotically approached the singularity. The stele of the Shem have come to be seen as keys unlocking the gateway of the knowledge of procession. What lies beyond is the multiverse. As I have described, the only difference between perception of the universe and perception of the multiverse is the perception of time. In the universe, entropy measures time linearly, from the past through the present to the future. In the multiverse, time is relative to measurements of space, and insofar as the one can be distorted, so may the other. This means that zero, one, and infinity are all simultaneously measures of the sum over histories, and that space, in substance and essence, is only one polarized concept about which we do not need to revolve our entire lives. Here we find Kabbalah extending upward as the spiraling histories of gravitational singularities that unwind wormholes between one another, comprising the dimensions of the multiverse contained within the event horizon of black holes. Here we see that the wormholes open perpendicularly to one another, and that therefore the only way to get through the singularity outside of the universe is to go perpendicularly through them. This produces the phi over pi spiral helix lattice of Kabbalah. Here the projection of what is called the mind, the soul or the spirit, only exists in the form of a baby universe, the body of which is wormholes. This is equivalent to evolution of life on Earth, since when the photons now reaching us left the most ancient galaxies our solar system was only a nebulous gas cloud. As these galaxies were consumed by black holes, a supernova fused the nebulae and formed the sun, the planets, and the asteroids. As the wave of the informational ending of photons by supermassive black holes approached us, life formed on Earth and processed over the ages, the sun falling into tempo with the rhythms and patterns of the surrounding spiral galaxy, the Milky Way, as it slowly approaches the Andromeda Galaxy. The sort of entity such life describes might best be termed a reincarnating hollow mnemonic archetype. When describing various types of more advanced, evolved, or enlightened entities, there have been widely varying experiences recorded throughout history. The first of these to be recorded were those of Enoch, describing the wars in heaven and the fall of the rebel angels. After this are the Sumerian accounts of the history of humanity in relation to the jinn, or the discorporeal form of these entities, which they thought remained bound to earth and associated with the Shem. The Egyptians structured hierarchically various levels of gods, demigods, natural forces, and calendrical influences as associated with the spirit realm, that the disincarnate soul passes through in the underworld of the dead. Shintoists of early Asia and modern Japan associate the jinn with nature spirits. Siddhartha associated the karma in his aura with negative attributes of the self and slew these in his mind. Hebrew Gnostics described the soul in Kabbalistic terms and the times as apocalyptic. The Catholic Church structured various orders of angels and seraphim, as well as of demons and the damned, all of which ruled the realms of the afterlife that a soul could enter at death. Muslims reiterate the descriptions of the wars in heaven and the fall of the rebel angels. Masons reiterate the jinn in their elemental and calendrical form. As I have described, the baby universe, sum over histories of gravitational singularities, 
in supermassive black holes beyond the projection of photons at the speed of light, unwind in a phi over pi spiral through the wormholes connecting the black holes in the multiverse. And this connection underlies the quantum information exchange between photons within the universe, such that the same information projected by the photons has been consumed by the black holes and is contained in the wormholes expressed as the history of the gravitational singularity. This is the same pattern of life described by the double helix of DNA. The knowing of the higher self as above the influence of the distracting karma that accumulates in one's aura has long been considered a more ideal state of achievement associated with enlightenment. Whether one knows the higher self as God, a higher power, their own spirit or guardian angel, as their soul or astral body, or even only the temple of the physique. These have all been encouraged by Vedic and Gnostic doctrines. One technique for this is the inversion of distraction into inspiration, such that one is drawing superfluous energy off of their surrounding environment. Insofar as this energy is more often redirected and channeled into creative expression, it creates an alternating entropic circuit generating regular brain waves. This does not cause the negative consequential effects of distraction that perpetuate both internal suffering of the individual and external suffering of the environment. Thus, the entropic circuit is considered more stable than the simple outflux of entropic waves into the environment. It is associated with time and considered an anchor in a trance or meditative environment. As I have said, this manifests as a stable energy flow between the thalamus and the hippocampus and functions as the internal perception of time. As one gradually releases the clinging to this as the center of the self, one will become more and more free of the karma in their auras. If one expands upon this, as the teachings encourage earlier aspirants, one will cleanse the aura of its karma the free will permeating all depths of mental projective space, clear light projected out all around. However, for later aspirants, it is necessary to remember that the thalamus, the root of the spiritual experience of free will in the biological organism, is not the only center of free will in the universe, and that one can, by extending their free will, travel in mental projective space through all the dimensions of the multiverse at all the centers of the universe. The path of the mendicant is to seek enlightenment. The path of the enlightened seer is to watch over the sacred. For the monk, this first condition may mean tithing alms while for the master, this latter condition often involves the steli of the shem or the jinn of procession. As I have described, the soul and the spirit have been described in various ways, but it is thought that the mind of the mendicant monk is more like the soul, and that of the enlightened master more like the spirit. It is also thought that the soul is more like the body, while the spirit is more like the mind. Thus, the freeing of the ethereal spirit from the karma of the aura is like the freeing of the mind from the body, and is a matter of the relativity of time, as much as perception makes use of the external senses, dependent on the vessel's death, only in so far as the circuit of entropy is 
centralized and associated with the ego. As the soul is thought to inhabit the body, so the aura tends to create a tonal reality of socialized routine. This is for the soul what the steady stream of brain waves in the thalamus is to the brain. In so far as this circuit is associated with ego, the measure of its activity in the brain is considered the biological organism's lifeline or history. So, similarly, is the tonal reality of the aura the lifeline of the soul. The soul would see its tonal reality as the seat of the spark of the free will or the spirit as the body would see the thalamus as the seat of the spark of life or the soul. Therefore, just as in order for the mind to be free of the body, it must unseat itself from the association of the ego with the neuroelectrical activity in the thalamus, so for the will of the spirit to be free of karma, it must unseat itself from the association of the soul with the routine tunnel reality of mundane existence. The primary entropic circuit of the aura functions on binary inspiration over distraction, where distraction creates cognitive dissonance, burning off external entropy, and where inspiration creates a solution in a closed inner circuit. Notice that this occurs in a phi over pi spiral where phi is the trajectory of interiorization and exteriorization of karma through mental projection, and pi is the circuit of the stable state exterior referentials and the spherical probability well of active consciousness. Leaving behind the interactive karma of the external environment of the body and the mental projective tonal reality aura of the soul means identifying the self with this geometry for this is the form of the free spirit at this point in meditative trance one has awareness of all other beings and objective things as mnemonic reflections of this the highest gnosis then can be applied to the most fundamental, natural gnomon. The epiche of I am not that which I am can be interpolated upon the underlying fundamental geometric pattern of the structure of our DNA and the filaments, walls, and voids. There is no self. There is no not. There is no will, but that which we project. Phi over pi can stand for all these things, and still more. To say that it is these and yet is not anything at all, in substance or in essence, is to say that there is no phi over pi that none of the ratios in nature are exactly or perfectly precise, and that it would only be by such an exact measure that we could think the universe capable of conscious communication within itself, such as between or among people. This is what it means to say there is no center or no self, many researchers of consciousness have associated trance states with ego death or with dissociation. This is not a necessary requisite any more than any of the ways of inducing trance consciousness exclusively cause the nature of personal transcendental experiences which can also be seen to occur at random. Disassociation ultimately requires the incapacitation of the physique the more one enters another realm of thought than their perceptions are accustomed to, they often must adjust themselves in relative proportion to it, in the same way the living distinguish between themselves and the new. 
This is in no way a condition or necessary symptom of trance states of consciousness. Neither is delusion to the sense perceptions, for such karma is not relevant to the trance consciousness, which is the entropic impossible loop that is and is not at the center of ego or self, a mnemonic singularity that is the seat of the soul and the root of the free will. As I have said, ego death and dissociation are not conditional components of trans consciousness any more than the auric soul or the most elegant geometry necessary components of the free will. There are a great deal of Zen cones written about Yalem, Qi, the Tao, and the binary yin and yang. All of these agree, ultimately, with nihilism. That is because the primary clear light, the energy forces of the universe, the similarities between manifestations, and the duality of matter-energy, are all invisible characteristics of nature. Thus, many common people simply choose not to believe in them. From the 1930s until the 1950s, the U.S. military experimented with scalar wave technology weather balloons. These balloons, elliptical cylinders with technological equipment attached to the undercarriages, were supposedly used only to test atmospheric conditions, however could also allegedly control the weather by orientation of orgum energy to the ionosphere. They are thought to have been equipped with technology similar to that developed by Nikola Tesla involving regular interference patterns of pulsed field currents. These balloons match the description of late 19th century lighter-than-air ships that were the first reported UFOs. It is possible that the zero-point energy null field created by the pulsed scalar waves inside the devices, which can also be thought of as the first inner atmospherical satellites, caused the zero-time orientation field they generated around the machines to become deresonated from the Earth's 40 megahertz electromagnetic field and thus for the balloons to slip out of phase with the fourth dimensional entropic flow of time yet remain in the Earth's electromagnetic gravitational well. Nikola Tesla, who also invented broadcast radio, claimed to have made contact with off-world sources much of later stealth technology is suspected to have been reverse engineered from flying saucers crashed by using the early weather balloon technology and later satellite and radio technology as a net disruption effect to the electromagnetic field between the ionosphere and the Van Allen belts and plasma sheet. This is the age of space travel in solid fuel rocket propulsion technology, such as the space shuttle, and time travel in the form of faster than sound flight at varying atmospheric altitudes that would actually measure different times on atomic clocks from those that remained below on the ground. It is possible that outside of gravity wells, such as that of the Earth, the dimension of time is asymptotically distorted toward a null field. The Church has long legislated the roles of the heavenly bodies in the daily lives of the people, in opposition to those astrologers and gypsies that have claimed the movements of the celestial cycles govern the daily behaviors of the mind. It is evident that such processes as the procession of the poles affect such cycles as the seasons. However, beyond this, it is unlikely that the positions of the planets relative to the zodiac bear any ultimate relevance to the meaning of a person's life. It is possible to warp space-time into hyperspace 
through wormholes and travel freely through the multiverse using null field scalar wave zero point energy. And this kind of technology can be contained in even handheld sized devices such as the Orgone gun of Wilhelm Reich. Similar in appearance to the implements held by stone carved Olmec and Mayan figures in South America, or which may have been Brown's gas welding torches, capable of producing the over 6,000 degrees Celsius heat needed to fuse the metal alloys of the eye-shaped clamps that held their massive stone masonry in place. It is thought to be this type of null time technology, possessed by UFOs, that allows them to bend the fabric of the continuum and travel relatively instantaneously across vast distances of space. When you are working, you can only think back or ahead to being on vacation. When you are on vacation, you can only think back or ahead to being at work. The natural process of entropy inverts binary opposite states such as these in its regular functioning. When you are at work, you know you will eventually be on vacation. When you are on vacation, you know that you will eventually be back at work. The longer these conditions continue to invert, the more faded away their divisions become and they become blended together. This is only the tunnel reality. In order to find your way from here, you must go perpendicularly. There are not two selves. The ghost of the second self is Koran's own, an ancient name for consciousness. All the while the body survives, this is the self. In sleep and in some meditative trance states, this inverts and becomes the dreams of the subconscious, while the consciousness is unconscious. When the self is not the consciousness of the body, it is believed to be consciousness still. This consciousness, it is thought, either finds refuge in an incarnation or enters the heavens of the multiverse. Just as when it is cloaked in the flesh, it knows itself by the flesh, so when it is brought before the Lord God, must it shed its highest definition of self to be one with the Creator, and that is only the consciousness. There are not two selves, because you do not stand beside your own consciousness. There is not one self, because there is you besides consciousness. There is no self, because there is no consciousness. Koran Zone was first in the age of the ancient Egyptians, associated with the Jinn of the Heavens and the Deacons of the Zodiac. He came to represent the disincarnate, discorporeal, underworld, summoned by magicians, and the concept he represented came to be suppressed along with the other arcane arts of metaphysics by the subsequent solar central masculine cults that have become modern religions. The deified ideal that replaced him in mainstream terminology was the Holy Ghost. When people lift their spirits up with the Holy Ghost, they are expanding their consciousnesses. Just as the Holy Ghost is only part of the deified trinity of God the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the maternal Holy Ghost, so was Koran's own called the disincarnate spirit of the original head of the Egyptian occult, who first held the title yad heh vod -Heh. It is thought to have been Koran's own that Siddhartha conquered in the form of his inner demons, clearing his consciousness to teach the way to the light. 
The Holy Ghost represents the idea of the conscious universe, derived from the Hindu belief that we are all the dream in the mind of God. In this capacity, then, the angel scroll of Yeshua ben Padia may be thought of as a list of mentations in the mind of God. This has been part of the cyclical process of procession, all of mankind's contribution. As much as the ritual of sacrifice that makes a martyr out of the scapegoat, the occult orders have always spoken for the processional cycle. It has only been since the time of Christ that the prodigal son cults have had younger and more public representatives, thus ending the age of the father and initiating the age of the crowned and conquering child. This age is marked by the fool or jester archetype of Koran Zone, representing Orion in the Tarot deck, because it has been marked by rapid cultural change and technological progress. It has long been theorized that to understand the Most High, you must think of the inversion of the Most Low, and, as I have described in Kabbalah, the former greatest common factor inverts to become the new least common denominator. Thus, whatever God was or has been, Satan becomes. This works similarly to the river of Thales, representing the flow of consciousness or of time. That which God was, Satan is. God is within the moment, and what is past for him is Satan. God also is seen as the light of humanity's future. Thus, what is the future for man is the present of God and the past for Satan. In this way, the lowest is that which is shed by the Most High, that is, its sense of self.
To understand the Clifoth, we must begin with the oldest and now known component of its many fractured parts. This immediately delves us deeply into ancient Hebrew magic lore as the premises for the Goetia, or Lesser Key of King Solomon, date, at the very least, back to the era of the Essene scribes of Qumran some 2,000 years ago, and, if they are to be believed as authentic and not later antedated, they may indeed trace back to the construction of the first temple under King Solomon, son of King David, around some 3,000 years ago. The Goetia being a list of names, physical descriptions, and sigils for summoning 72 demonic influences may even predate the Exodus some 3,500 years before our modern Aeon. In the ancient reckoning of a year, as being 360 days plus four seasonal holidays and one New Year holiday. The 360 days were divided up into 12 months, three per each of the four seasons. In each of these 12 months of 30 days apiece could be divided up into three weeks each of 10 days apiece. The result is an annual total of 36 weeks. If each week of 10 days is given a day and a night aspect, and thus doubled, then each week of 10 days on the ancient calendar would correspond to one pair of demonic influences from the 72 names given in the Goetia. Since the middle 1500s, at least, grimoires, including material ranging widely from plant medicine and natural philosophy, such as physics, astronomy, and chemistry, to theurgy, demonology, and the study of the dark arts of ritual magic, have been a source of inspiration for aspirants and students of the craft. Studying these copiously, cross-referencing, taking notes, and compiling these notes into one's own grimoires have long been hobbies of ritualists and scholars of magic alike. The so-called Goetia, or Lesser Key of Solomon, was one of the earliest to proliferate during the Renaissance, and it was translated into many different European languages. It was usually paired with the so-called Greater Key of King Solomon, a treatise on magic involving the seven planets and including instructions on how to construct talismans for 36 symbolic seals. Other grimoire systems that flourished at this time were the grimoire of Pope Honorius, the Arbitel and Armadel, the system of Abramelin, and, of course, the theurgic Enochian works of John Dee and Edward Kelly. In the Goetia, uniquely, there are physical descriptions of the entities meant to be conjured. In the planetary magic grimoires, they are simply to be identified as archangels and the demons of Abramelin and angels of D and Kelly give little or no physical characteristics for most of the characters they describe. The Goetia provides, thus, not only seals or sigils by which to summon certain intelligences for whatever one's goal, as well as purposes for which to summon each, suggested tasks at which they specialize, etc., but also 72 names with physical descriptions of their characters, so that you may know them when, or if, 
they manifest and appear as conjured. What we can learn about the demonic influences accessible via the Goetia may be best expressed by the 20th century ritual magician Aleister Crowley. From the introduction to the English translation of the Goetia he published, edited by S. L. McGregor Mathers. In this essay, entitled An Initiated Interpretation of Ceremonial Magic, Crowley states in no uncertain terms that the spirits of the Goetia are portions of the human brain and that control over one specific portion of the brain was equivalent to calling up the name of the spirit that represented it. To this end, the grimoire called the Goetia was basically like a telephone book or list of names and how to contact them. Each of the 72 characters came to this end with its own meditative sigil seal. Here, each sigil seal is numbered to correspond to the preceding list of names, and, just so, I have added their corresponding place in the annual round indicating month by astrological zodiac sign and week by A, S, and C, ascendant, succedent, and cadent. The significance of the exactly 72 demonic influences listed in the Goetia Grimoire, as well as that of the 36 seals in the Greater Key of Solomon, stems from the Shimham Farash, the 216 letter long Baal Shem, or Name of God. The Shimham Farash has supposedly been used in Hebrew ritual magic since the era of the Exodus, when, it is said, Moses used it to part the Red Sea. It has long been associated, as such, with the three lines of 72 letters apiece in the Hebrew Torah Book of Exodus describing that event. 3 times 72 equals 216. The exact unscrambling of the single correct Baal Shem from the letters of this verse, however, appears to have thus far proven elusive and, for the last 2,000 years, Hebrew ritual magic has seemingly been unsuccessful at summoning Jehovah. While the 216-letter Shem Ham Farash, Baal Shem, was considered holy, the 72 demonic influences of the Goetia were not, but were seen from very early on in this manuscript's now known history as blasphemous and a sacrilege against the dictates of almost all the dominant religions since the era of Sumer. Therefore, to reconcile the temptation toward practice of the dark arts such grimoires posed during the Reformation era, the stance in Western faith on Solomon was altered, and he gradually came to be seen as having been led astray to worship foreign devils. However, this was not the tale told prior to this era. Until the age of the Ottoman Turks, the Levant region monotheists preserved the tradition of King Solomon as a great magus and as loyal lifelong to the one true God. Traditions regarding King Solomon were long preserved even in Axum, Ethiopia, near Lake Tana, Kirkus, at the headwater of the Nile River in Africa, by a group of pre-Christian African Hebrews called the Sakura. It was legend among this people that they descended from the heirs of King Menelik, 
a bastard prince, conceived on the Queen of Sheba by King Solomon himself. Manalak had, according to this people, stolen the stones of testimony from inside the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies of the First Temple, while it was still under construction. Modern rites of Freemasonry also tell more about this period, recounting the murder of the Grand Architect Hiram Abith by three Master Masons, Jubela, Jubalum, and Jubello. Next, to continue understanding the Cliffoth by comprehending its constituent components, we must skip ahead historically to the 20th century and return to the ritual magician Aleister Crowley. In his work Liber Arcanorum, numbered 231 in his series, Crowley depicted a set of 44 cells in two graphs, showing, in one, stylized representations of the imagery of the 22 tarot trumps, each associated with the Hebrew letter, and, in the other, a set of 22 images under the heading of Cliffoth, each with its own Hebrew letter as well. And between these twin charts, he gave an alphabetic cipher to compare one letter from one chart with a different letter from the other. In the diagrams that will soon follow, these 22 pseudo-sigils are used to signify 22 paths on the St. Simon arrangement, or the array of adverse attribute traits on the reverse side of the usual Jacob's Ladder lattice shape. In these arrangements, they will be placed onto these paths according to the manner prescribed by Crowley, assigning each path a Hebrew letter, then comparing one letter on the obverse side to another letter on the reverse side, then placing the corresponding pseudo-sigil there. Thus, these sigils, such as they are, for the Cliffoth, provided by Crowley, will be seen to correspond to other names occupying the same places on the St. Simon array. The final contribution of Aleister Crowley's we will be dealing with directly here comes from his work Liber Fel Ararita, numbered alternately 570 or 813 in his collected works. In Ararita, chapter 2nd Raish, Crowley spells out descriptions of the ten demon kings who reign in hell quite eloquently. Here we can see the names of these ten demon kings placed onto the ten emanations of a usual modern Tree of Life diagram on the left side of the page, and the poem by Crowley from Ararita, Second Resh, on the right side of the page. To understand this component of the Cliffoth, we must now analyze both Crowley's model for a tree of death and his description for the ten demon kings who occupy the cortexes or shells on the opposite side from the emanations of the Sephirot on the Tree of Life diagram. Here we can see the ten demon kings can also be corresponded to the seven hells of the Arabs, both as given from Crowley's Liber 777. Thus, the three supernal cliffoth, or shells, are lumped together into the chief hell of Sheol, meaning simply, a grave. The centralmost five reverse sephirot are each double-labeled with a demonic king and a hell realm 
it rules over the final lowest two anti-emanations occupied by demon queens are likewise lumped into the lowest form of hell called Gehenna, referring to the ever smoldering waste pit dumped outside the wall of ancient Jerusalem. We will return to placing these attribute traits onto models based on the tree of life of Kabbalah in a moment. However, again, they will be inside the St. Simon array based on the Jacob's Ladder model's design. It should also be noted now that the ten demon kings may also be corresponded to any other base ten group of attributes, including ten orders of demons, the seven hells in ten places of the Arabs, as well as the ten commandments. All of these traits will be featured on the St. Simon array in its simplest form. From Liberara Rita, we learn that the chief demon king, called Satan and Moloch, is twin-headed and ever arguing against itself. Beelzebub, sometimes called Lord of the Flies, Crowley described as like black apes chattering vile nonsense. The Prince of Hell, Lucifuge Rofocal. Crowley compared to devouring mothers that eat up their children, etc., such that Astaroth is like a harpy. Asmodeus rules the burning ones giant-like volcanoes. Belphegor is petty, selfish, and quarrelsome, like men. Adramalek corresponds to the ravens of death. Baal rules the lying spirits like frogs. Lilith is the queen of the obscene who appear like minotaurs. And finally, Nehema is queen of the underworld, who appears from the head to the navel a woman, but from the navel to the feet a man. Last of the components of the Cliffhoth, one must understand before combining them all into the model of the St. Simon Array, is the postmodern grimoire called the Necronomicon, meaning Book of Dead Names, and inspired by claims of such having once been owned by John Dee. These claims about the 16th century Elizabethan scholar having been made by early 20th century Gothic fiction author H.P. Lovecraft. The Simon Necronomicon was an attempt by a small group of mid-20th century scholars of ritual magic and grimoires to produce, in our present era, a new system of rituals meant to sound prehistoric in their terms and texts. Thus, the Fifty Names of Marduk, given in the Enuma Elish, or Babylonian creation epic, were chosen as the dead names, and each was given a sigil. In summoning these elder gods, we are given their names, a word for their calling, and a brief description of their attribute traits, including their particular skills, etc., Little physical description is usually given. In ritual magic, using the tools given in the usual grimoire genre book, one is encouraged to surround themselves with a magic circle of self-protection and outside of this establish a magic triangle for summoning into it the influence or intelligence one wishes to visualize, project, realize and make manifest. 
in using the Simon Necronomicon material in this or a similar manner, one would repeat one from among the fifty listed dead names as a mantra in one's mind while intoning the call word aloud, likewise over and over, all while meditating on the sigil correspondent to that dead name and its call word. However contrived, the modern Simon Necronomicon provides a complete and self-contained system of ritual magic presented in the usual grimoire genre format, and, so long as the present shift among practitioners of ritual magic continues being towards seeking results, then this grimoire will be seen as no more nonsensical than Anton Zandor LaVey's use, also from the postmodern era, of the name Satan, inserted into an invocation for one of John Dee's Enochian heirs, and certainly is more scholarly. The Simon Necronomicon's value as a grimoire has not been tried and tested for as long as many others. However, it should be seen as no less authentically a grimoire in the same tradition as these other works, and as potentially useful in gaining ritual magical result. Nevertheless, again, it should be ardently cautioned against attempting any such feats without group guidance, proper preparation, and or at least some significant intent. It is cautioned in most grimoires that summoning the intelligences and influences they allow you to call up, if you lack sincere and serious motive in doing so, can provoke them to mistrust and abuse you both during and, if you're not careful, after the ritual as well. When tinkering with such ritual magic, one does well to remember that no results may be highly preferable to bad results, depending on which phantom one wishes to entertain. It is wise, if one does go fooling about with ritual magic, for one to know and practice often as many ritual banishing techniques as one can learn. After all, ritual magic is founded on superstitious, obsessive-compulsive disorder. Banishing evil and psychic self-defense must become like a second nature to someone actively practicing this craft, if only to protect themselves against their own imaginary ghosts. The sigils attached to the Simon Necronomicon's list of 50 dead names of Marduk were invented in the 20th century, but their recency should not be predicted to dull their efficacy in meditative trance states and ritual magical workings. Here we see a square of 7 by 7 equals 49 circled sigils with the fiftieth and last subtended at the bottom. These are the Simon Necronomicon's fifty sigils equivalent to the fifty dead names and calls. Each one is numbered to correspond to the name and call given in the preceding list. Unlike other sigils dating from this era, the Simon Necronomicon sigils do not appear to be unicursal tracings from one location to another on a lettered layman that is then removed. On the contrary to being literal or epistemological in any way, the Simon Necronomicon sigils appear to be abstractions, the creation of free association on the part of their authors. The sigils of the fifty dead names of the Simon Necronomicon may be thought of best as being merely a placeholder symbolizing these fifty names of Marduk in a shorthand notation. Similarly, 
the 22 Cliffoth pseudo sigils of Aleister Crowley may be seen as shorthand notation for the 22 paths on a reversed tree of life diagram. Likewise, as we are about to begin exploring, these 50 dead names and 22 Cliffoth paths may be combined onto the single model of the St. Simon array of a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice. As such, a St. Simon style model may be constructed by using both the 50 Necronomicon sigils and 22 Cliffoth pseudo sigils, as well as by using only the 72 Goetic sigils. If one combines both of these models together, one will have reached the maximum capacity of 144 attribute traits on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. From my own book, The Tree of Death and the Cliffoth, we see here the St. Simon arrangement of wholly adverse attribute traits to the combined Tree of Life and Tree of Death diagram called, in turn, the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. Now, though the Saint Simon is described in my book, it is there depicted only in its Hebrew form, as seen here. However, in my book it was necessary to give an equal amount of study to both the attribute traits on the Saint Simon array and the other version presented in the book of a similar arrangement, all in English, called the Blind Dragon Array. While the Saint Simon gives the names of ten demon kings, ten orders of demons, twelve curses, seven hells in ten places, and the letters attributed to the twenty-two paths of the Cliffoth, all in Hebrew, the Blind Dragon gives ten orders of demons, ten commandments, seven hells in ten places, seven venal sins, twelve curses, and twenty-two illnesses, all in English. In addition to these traits, both the Saint Simon and Blind Dragon arrangements are crowned above by a triangle of six traits and adorned below by a pentagram of ten. In this initial model of the St. Simon array, both the terms labeling the upper triangle and the letters labeling the lower pentagram are Hebrew. The terms inside the upper triangle describe the conditions of existence prior to the creation of our present reality as chaos and void, or rather, in Hebrew, as tohu and bohu, respectively. Just so, chasek, or darkness, was on the face of the deep, the letters surrounding the lower pentagram spell three names counterclockwise around it. These names are spelled, starting from outside the lowest tip of the pentagram, Shin, Aleph, Dao, Aleph, Nun, pronounced Satan. Starting from the rightmost corner, Beth, Peh, Ayin, Mem, Dao, pronounced Baphomet, and starting from inside the lowest tip of the pentagram, Yod, He, Shin, Vav, He, pronounced Yeshua, being the Tetragrammaton, four-letter name of God with the mother letter Shin inserted in the center. We will return to the St. Simon arrangement to translate its Hebrew attribute traits into English in a moment, but before we do so we must momentarily devote some time 
to the blind dragon arrangement as well. Here we will begin to see the translations of some of the St. Simon's Hebrew traits, but also the addition of others not included later on. On the blind dragon arrangement, we may find all the traits are color-coded. The Ten Commandments, Seven Venal Sins, Six Traits of the Upper Triangle, and Five of the Lower Pentagram are all in black. The Ten Orders of Demons and Twenty-Two Illnesses associated respectively with the cortexes and paths on the reverse tree of life part of the diagram, are all color-coded blue. The seven hells in ten places and twelve curses associated respectively with the cortexes and paths of the tree of death part of the diagram are color-coded red along with the uppermost triangle and lowermost pentagram shapes as well. These color codings make it easier to discern between the Tree of Life and the Tree of Death portions of the combined Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice. However, in our subsequent studies here for now, we will not be returning to them again. They remain a unique aspect of this particular depiction of the blind dragon array. However, it may be useful to remember these color codings in examining the upcoming diagrams, simply in order to keep straight what attribute trait goes in place where. On this blind dragon model, we may quite clearly see the 22 paths and 10 emanations of the Tree of Life in blue and the twelve paths and seven shells of the Tree of Death in red. However, in later models, showing essentially the same attribute traits, we may not be able to discern which rank and file is associated to which of these twin conjoined systems so easily then. What we must remember at this point is that the Blind Dragon and St. Simon arrays are both based on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold Lattice, and therefore are simply some amounts of attribute traits, whether in Hebrew or in English, that may be distilled from this diagrammatic setting and simply set out in lists as such. What we should remember at this point also is that these attribute traits being diagrammed or listed are meant to be adverse and opposite to the most holy traits of Kabbalah. They are lists of the worst types of things, such as places in hell and types of curses, and types of beings, the demon kings and orders of demons, in existence, and as such, are liable to cause anxiety and discomfort even when only consumed subliminally as in passing by. To study these in continuity requires constitutional rectitude. Now, let us continue. Here we see the ten demon kings in the lower right as they appear on the ten cortexes on the reverse sides of the ten emanations on the tree of life. Satan and Moloch are reverse Kether, Beelzebub is reverse Chakma, Belphegor reverse Binah, Lucifer reverse Tifereth, and so forth down to Lilith over opposite Yesod, and Nehema over opposite Malkuth. Above this, in the upper right corner, we see these traits listed on the by now familiar Tetractus layout where Satan and Moloch are now the one king, Nehema and Lilith, the two queens, etc. Beside these attribute traits to the left, we find the, also hopefully by now familiar, 
22 traits attributed to the paths on the reverse of the Tree of Life. These are given as names of the Clifoth pseudo-sigils and various types of historically common illnesses. Finally, the far left lists 40 attribute traits in Hebrew name and English translation as four lists assigned to the four terrestrial elements comprised of ten traits each. In the upper leftmost is water. In the lower leftmost is air. In the upper rightmost is fire. And in the lower rightmost the element earth. 40 plus 22 plus 10 equals 72 traits once again being expressed in this model. Now let us return to the St. Simon arrangement and examine its traits again only this time in English. Here we find the English transliterations of all the terms labeled and related by the first St. Simon manifold lattice presented there in Hebrew. So we see Tohu and Bohu ruling over all, Malach Satan ruling Thaumiel, Beelzebub ruling Chagiel, Belphegor over Satariel, Lucifer over Tagagrim, etc. All these terms appear on the preceding arrangement of lists, and all may be cross-referenced in this way to be translated from these transliterations into their correspondent English terms. For example, Kemetiel means literally a crowd of gods, or, as I put it here, a pantheon. Likewise, we may see that just as Moloch Satan, the demon king, rules the order of demons called Thaumael, meaning twins, so too does the demon queen Lilith rule the order of demons called Samael, meaning the blind. In the lowest cortex on this manifold lattice arrangement, we find Nehema, the demon queen ruling the order of demons called the Lilin, harpy-like night hags who stole away unwatched babies. Around the lower pentagram in this depiction of the St. Simon array, we find the five kingdoms of Edom and the five types of Canaanite who dwelt there prior to the invasion of the Holy Lands by the Hebrew diaspora at the end of their Exodus era. Again, however, all we are seeing with the St. Simon and Blind Dragon arrangements of adverse attribute traits onto the Jacob's Ladder format diagram are exactly 72 traits that, in addition to being charted on the Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice, may be listed simply and outright in five sets of 10 apiece and one set of 22. While categorizing these evil names in this by now extremely mundane manner may seem to be empowering of the practitioner over this work, take heed and beware that when staring long into the abyss, the abyss stares long back into you, so you should not by fighting a monster, become a monster yourself. Bear in mind also, these traits are the most concentrated form of pure evil known to the minds of humans. So concentrate, focus, and be aware. Here we see, again, the listed format of the transliterated traits on the St. Simon Array. Satan and Moloch are the one king, Nehema and Lilith the two queens, etc., as in past listings. 
while the twenty-two trumps are those demons who rule over various illnesses. Each of the remaining forty traits may be assigned to an intersection of a row of numerals with a column of terrestrial element, and thus be assigned to a pipped card, one through ten, in one of four suits in a deck. These forty traits include the five kingdoms of Edom from the lower pentagram, and the six traits, including Tohu, Bohu, Chasek, and Kemetiel, of the upper triangle. However, the location of these traits on the Jacob's Ladder Manifold lattice, and the order in which they appear in this listed format, instead, may be drastically unlike one another. Thus, the five kingdoms of Edom and six traits of the upper triangle are spread about throughout the lesser forty, such that the order of their assignations appears arbitrary and scrambled, and such that, thus, each trait may be shuffled up into any other order equally as well. Although each placement is carefully weighed and balanced, thought through and analyzed, experimented with and removed, only to be tested again, their overall assignations seem randomized and without pattern to underscore the facts that all these attribute traits may be rearranged and that there is, ultimately, no universally agreeable, single, right, and correct order for them all. As the sums of variables attributed to this model increase, the manner of categorizing and cataloging them all must, necessarily, become more complex to keep pace. This brings us back to the method for categorizing 144 attribute traits onto the Jacob's Ladder Manifold lattice, and the listing of each location by a simple number sum. The arrangement of attribute traits we see here is the same as the listing for the St. Simon's transliterations we saw last. However, here, the locations of each trait are marked by numerals instead of names. The reason we return now to this method of encryption is to plot the locations of the sigils of the Goetia, the Necronomicon, and Crowley's Cliffoth Sui Generis on the Jacob's Ladder diagram. These diagrams, which I will show you in a moment, are parallel systems to the St. Simon and Blind Dragon arrays, while the traits assigned onto the St. Simon are Hebrew names transliterated into English, and those of the Blind Dragon the translations of many of these terms into their counterpart terms in English. The Jacob's Ladder diagrams depicting the Goetic and Necronomicon sigils and Cliffoth pseudo-sigils are each an authentically separate set of 72 symbols, and thus, only by relative counting number sums, can they both be shown on one list or on a single Jacob's Ladder diagram. Again, however, the importance of disguising the models I am about to show you behind this veil of cryptography using number sums to substitute for the shorthand sigils themselves is not solely for convenience in categorizing the large amount of variable attribute traits alone. The purpose in concealing the diagrams in this banal methodology of ordering by rank and file each attribute trait with a coordinate pair of number sums also serves to shelter the student from the sort of fear that can, rightly, accompany being suddenly exposed to something from so deep in the dark arts of ritual magic. If, for example, one wished to lay out across a desk some of the schematics I am about to show, it would trigger, at the least, unwanted curiosity from any passerby and likely prove to be much more trouble than it would be worth to even try. 
So one reason numbers are here substituted for signals in this listing and key to the following diagrams is that numbers are a far more familiar shape than the signals and will cause less of a stir if seen. So we see again that the 72 traits of the goetic shimham for ash are labeled by a number sum followed by a parenthesis, while the 50 dead names of Marduk from the Simon Necronomicon are labeled by a number sum followed by a period. Thus, the first sigil from the Necronomicon appears in the cortex of reverse Kether, while the first sigil from the Goetia appears on the path leading vertically into this cortex from below, etc. As we shall see, fitting these sigils onto this manifold lattice is a matter of some scale of difficulty simply given the constraints of its geometric proportions, etc. Thus, again, to list all 144 attribute traits onto a single Jacob's Ladder model, it is convenient to use numeral sums for shorthand. As we may see here, the placement of the 50th sigil from the Necronomicon and that of the 50th sigil from the Goetia both correspond to the same location on the model, that being reverse Malkuth, while the 47th sigil from the Necronomicon corresponds to the 72nd and final sigil from the Goetia, at the lowest tip of the lower pentagram. So these attribute traits have their correspondences from the St. Simon array as well. Here, then, is a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice with a subtended pentagram and topped by a triangle. Onto it have been drawn the 50 sigils of the Necronomicon and the 22 pseudo-sigils of Crowley's Cliffoth, such that each space on the manifold lattice has at least one attribute trait assigned to it, while 13 places on the manifold being the ten cortexes opposite the ten emanations on the tree of life, and the six traits assigned to the upper triangular halo. Express double traits. By this point, I should hope it would be crystal clear that, although these attribute trait sigils may look haphazard, random, and chaotic at first glance, their exact placement on the manifold lattice is actually the product of an enormous amount of calculation of correspondences to reach a determination of what goes where. Nevertheless, these attribute traits placement is, ultimately, arbitrary, and, again, no absolutely right order might truly even exist. On this model, it may be seen that Crowley's 22 Cliffoth pseudo-sigils are placed, accordingly, onto the 22 paths of the Tree of Life component of the Jacob's Ladder geometry. All the rest of the sigils are from the Simon Necronomicon, including where the sigils double up on the 10 cortexes and the supernal triangle. As described, the purpose of placing these sigils as attribute traits onto a Jacob's Ladder arrangement diagram is as a shorthand notation for referencing the 50 dead names and 22 Cliffoth sui generis. The geometric relationships these 72 traits form on the Jacob's Ladder lattice, though indicative, remain incidental because the traits may all still be shuffled up like playing cards in a deck. The placement of one such sigil relative to another such sigil on the lattice is merely a mnemonic meant to assist the memory. Think of each sigil as like a key code that fits into and unlocks a gateway or portal to a linear path or tunnel and thus through this sickle pattern, 
while it is being meditated upon and thus the circuit gate is open may be evoked some sensibility certainly from beyond the mundane mind to say that these sigils can induce inspiration and spark the imagination would be merely a conceited understatement however to go so far as to label them actually discorporeal entities existing autonomously as minds in the ether poses certain ethical questions about the civil rights of ghosts the arrangement shown here lists the 50 sigils of the Simon Necronomicon on the left and the 22 pseudo sigils of Crowley's Cliffoth Sui Generis on the right here we see again that Marduk is the one king over the Tetractus of ten royal attribute traits and that as before the four elemental suits are labeled from left to right water air fire earth each of these 50 sigils has its own place on the Jacob's Ladder array alongside the 22 sigils of Crowley's Cliffoth and so each has their order in the lists shown here lastly here then is a Jacob's Ladder manifold lattice with a subtended pentagram and topped by a triangle. Onto it have been drawn the 72 sigils of the Goetic Shamhamfarash, such that each space on the manifold lattice has at least one attribute trait assigned to it. The same ten cortexes and the supernal triangle have doubled traits depicted here as in the previous diagram showing the 50 dead names and 22 Cliffoth. So we may see this manifold lattice as a framework upon which are drawn the 72 sigils of the Goetia. We may further see, if we so choose to, that these Goetic sigils may each act like a key code, such as a passphrase and secret grip establishing contact between an onlooker and, in this case, a very much older system for ritual magic. The goetic intelligences, or demonic influences, that may be accessed and activated by the study and practice of this system of ritual magic are all here nakedly displayed on this manifold lattice, like a four-dimensional phone book. You simply draw out one of the sigils from this shape and summon it forth as a servitor. But here is posed a dilemma of conscience. Being faced with such a device, how would you use it? Pandora's box contains Schrodinger's cat, and should we choose to open it, we may not like what we find. Likewise, wishing to attain clearer, more focused, and more accurate thinking may be a noble enough cause, however seeking to use goetic ritual magic as simply personal brain stimulation may not yield the desired effect. It is wise to heed the warning calls of the elder generations whose errors we should learn from to not repeat. It may have been the error of the makers of the Goetic system to believe in it being possessed of supernatural powers. However, this should not discount the genius of the mind behind the mind that invented this particular grimoire. Whatever force inspired the designer of such sigil-based systems as the Goetia, grimoires like it, remain a magnificent testimony to superstitious ritual magic. Thus, whether the fifty dead names of the Simon Necronomicon and the twenty-two Cliffoth Sui Generis, both hailing from the twentieth century, or the seventy-two demonic influences of the Goetic Shimham Farash, dating back ostensibly to no later than the 1500s AD, 
sigil-based grimoires of superstitious ritual magic impute importance onto, essentially, gobbledygook sigils, usually originally free-form or automatic art. In order to deter unwanted inquiries from onlookers and to protect themselves from all unwanted inquisition, this layer of encryption is usually enough to ward off most evil eyes. However, it is usually also best to hold this layer back, to hedge your bets, and to present any onlookers with the numerically encrypted double blind model first. So, given that the Saint Simon, in Hebrew and English, the blind dragon, color-coded in English, the Simon Necronomicon and Crowley's Cliffoth in one model, and the 72 Goetic Shemhamfarash in another, all complement the original Jacob's Ladder design and can each, also, produce an arrangement of their attribute traits as a list of them all, etc. Then it stands to reason that if one is stacking up such base 72 systems, one will eventually get to 144 to 216, and even to 360 attribute traits. Once one has filled one's head with this many averse attributes and evil traits, it may be safest to resort to a banishing ritual after it all, simply to ward off one's own gullibility and being prone to any residual superstitious obsessive compulsion 